The lecture tonight will give you a bird's eye view of how I got into the health and rehabilitation work because I'm sure that this was something never intended for me. I certainly would have never dreamed I was going to do this 20 years ago. And in retrospect, when I look back upon it, it looks as if I've been preparing for this all of my life, as if by some predetermined force I knew I was going to do. When I was 13 years old, my interest in human body was such that I learned the names of all 206 bones in the body. I thought if I was so interested in the mechanism, I ought to know what the parts were. And I studied what I could in those days by reading publications like science newsletters and the other lay publications you got in those days. But I never took it seriously. It was sort of a hobby of mine. When I entered University of Chicago, towards the end of my second year, even though I had a scholarship in the university, which helped me, of course, for tuition, I had to give up before the second year ended because I couldn't raise the $5 a week for room and board by the end of the second year. So I went out then into the job market. In 1935, jobs were quite scarce. And they were so scarce, at least for me, that I never became employed. Uh, I've sort of given up hope of trying to get a job now. It's a little bit late. But in those days, I decided then to go into research and development. Research and development is a very polite term <coughs> that means that if you succeed at a project that you take for a company, they'll pay you. If you don't succeed, you do it on your own. So in effect, no one paid me for anything unless I succeeded. But it took me a couple of years before I learned how to do research projects to be successful. And in the beginning of World War II, I got a research project from the Air Force. And this entitled me to all the secret information that came from the various secret services and so on that they had going around the world gathering information. <clears throat> now, I was very interested <clears throat> in certain parts of the secret information where the Air Force had to offer. And that was in the death rates and the disease rates in the food ration countries in Europe. I was so certain that the death rates <clears throat> were going to rise so considerably because I was told then, and many people believed and still believe today, that stress is the principal reason for heart disease. And so I was looking for the deaths from heart disease to double because the stress was terrible in those food ration countries in Europe, England, France, Holland, and so on the fire bombing, the problems in the air raid shelters where they'd be burned alive when the fire bomb would come in, throw a hot streak of gas, bring the temperature up so high they would suffocate in the chambers there. It was really a very terrible war. The population never knew when their children were going to come, come home from alive from school. A lot of stress. And yet, 1944, in one of the most stressful years of the war, death rates from heart disease dropped to one half of pre-war levels. It was astounding. And it was that way in all the countries under food rationing. In countries not under food rationing, like the United States, death rates from heart disease continued to rise and never showed a drop. And when the war was just starting to be over and the concentration camps were opened up by our soldiers, it was amazing to find that those who had been in concentration camps for the full four years, <clears throat> who had been diagnosed by the German doctors, who incidentally were very thorough, even though they were very cruel, perhaps, they were very thorough in diagnosing diseases. Those who had heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, four years after that kind of tremendous stress, they had none of these diseases. So even under the tremendous stress of concentration camps, the diseases disappeared. Well, it wasn't long after the war when I began to realize what well, the true story was, because when the food rationing was lifted, it only took a year or two after food rationing was lifted for death rates to rise and exceed pre-war levels. In fact, in Austria in 1957, there were 700% more deaths from heart disease than in Austria in 1944 when, the, when Hitler was walking all over the country. Well, after the war, when I no longer had access to free information, I was forced to subscribe to medical journals to get the second chapter, to trace these 
histories of the problems of heart disease. Now, during this time, I had graduated now to a full-fledged research and development investigator, and I started to accumulate patents. And through the years, I've got a couple dozen patents or so in this country and patents around the world. And some of the companies that license my patents, and they're principally in chemistry, physics, and electronics. Some of the countries, companies are Corning Glass Companies, licensed sea of mine, General Electric Company, General Precision Company, Bendix Aviation Corporation, the Honeywell Incorporated, the very large companies that can afford my sort of follies so that I no longer was dependent upon the problems of competitive business. I was able then to work without any supervision. And in doing this, I probably devoted a fourth to a third of all my working hours reading medical literature, corresponding with medical investigators. And my secretary, for example, used to have a larger file on my correspondence with medical investigators than she had on my business dealings. And when I would plan to go to various parts of the country to seek out development contracts, I would first see where the medical conferences were going to be. And if I found a good conference, then I'd visit some companies in that area. If there wasn't a good conference, I wouldn't bother. I'd do my work over the telephone. So I, through the years then, worked principally, I guess, my greatest interest was in the work of the diseases, of what comprises good health, what nutrition's all about. And I managed to earn a living through other many years with the developments from the various large companies I used to solicit. Now, I lived in Chicago. I was born in Chicago. And in 1955, I was watching Dr. Lester Morrison study from Los Angeles. He had taken the diet from World War II in the food ration countries and given it to 50 of his patients who had heart attacks. And the other 50 patients, he gave the regular American diet that had been recommended for heart disease. That was started in 1948. Well, it didn't take long. By 1955, you, you could see that those on the American diet were all going to die off very fast. Well, those on the diet of the food ration countries, very few of these were dying. Now, the food rationed country diet was reduced greatly in fat and greatly in cholesterol because these were too expensive during World War II to furnish to the people. Instead of 40 to 45 percent fat, it was down to 20 percent. Instead of so much cholesterol, it was down a third. Well, I called Dr. Morrison. I asked if he would mind if I could come out and visit him and would he spend an hour or so with me to discuss his study and discuss the significance of his study and what he thinks about various cholesterol diets and so on. He said it would be fine be glad to see me. My wife and I planned a vacation then around Los Angeles, went out, and I remember the night before I was to visit Dr. Morrison, we were sitting in a hotel eating our dinner, and I ordered a hot fudge sundae. I said, after I see Dr. Morrison, this will probably be the last Sunday I'll have, so I might as well enjoy it now. Well, I saw Dr. Morrison. We discussed his study and discussed the problems about high and low cholesterol levels and so on. And he said that in his study, the average cholesterol level of the patients before they started was 320. And after they'd been on his diet for a while, the food ration diet, it came down to about 220. And he thought 220 years, so 230 cholesterol level was a very good cholesterol level. Of course, in those days, we don't have, didn't have as much information as we had now. And he said, by the way, what is your cholesterol level? And I said, I don't know. I've never had it taken. He said, you can't investigate heart disease without knowing your own cholesterol level. And so he <coughs> called his nurse. Before I knew it, her needle was in my arm, and she was drawing blood. And she says, we do it right in the office because we do so many. And in about an hour or so, she came back and said, your cholesterol level is about 300. And I said, 300 sounds awfully high to me. And he says, it's in the high normal range. He says, uh, maybe you ought to get it down a little lower, but it's not bad. And he says, and how is your stress test? And I said, I've never had a stress test. All my electrocardiograms have been done at rest. He says, you don't live on your back. You've got to have an electrocardiogram while you're walking. So he said, we have the operators in the office. Why don't you do it here? And they had in those days the master two-step test. You walk up and down on a little step, 20 times, 40 times, and then they do an electrocardiogram. My heart got up to about 110 or 120 a minute. 
And he looked at it, was sort of puzzled, and he says, it isn't quite normal, but perhaps it's not abnormal. It may be in the upper range. He says, why don't you have a cardiologist redo it sometimes when you get around to it? Well, that was about all that I, what we talked about. I left Dr. Morrison, and I was very busy. That was 1955. And I finally, after trying to get my affairs in order, California is a very nice country, I decided to move from Chicago to California in 1957 to Santa Barbara, and we've been there ever since. Well, the first thing that I did in Santa Barbara was to seek out a cardiologist and check out the tracings that Dr. Morrison left for me. And I went to Sanson Clinic, which was the very large clinic in Santa Barbara, and the chief of cardiology at Sanson Clinic was a man just fresh from Mayo Clinic, a Dr. Clay Keg. And I went to Dr. Clay Keg and I said, I had a stress test done, and here are the results. I don't know if it's normal or not. I don't know how to read the tracings. And uh, what do you recommend? He said, well, we'll do it over because my conditions are a little different than the others. And he did the test, and he said, you have coronary insufficiency. He said, you have posterior wall myocardial ischemia. He said, and you have to immediately stop all activity. I said, all activity? He said, you cannot walk upstairs anymore. You've got to nap every day after lunch. And you've got to limit your walking to no more than about four or five blocks a day for the entire day. He said, and if you're going to drive your car more than 100 feet away from where you're going to go, have someone else park it for you. I said, I can't be that sick. I don't seem to have any symptoms. I don't feel anything. He says, you better do as I tell you. You're going to find yourself on the sidewalk laying down one day, and you won't get up. And he started me off on a medication. Well, the medication made my pupils open up. I had to wear sunglasses in the daytime, and it made me worse. So it, I did that for a month, and I finally decided that wasn't going to work for me. I stopped taking medication, and I didn't do anything. A year later, I remember it was February 1958, I got another blood value, and it was a very bad blood value. And I decided I really was waiting too long. I've got to do something to change my high cholesterol level. I couldn't figure out a way, though, to substitute my pint of ice cream I ate every night. I tried to figure out how to make it with corn oil and so on, but it never worked out. So finally, I decided I couldn't wait. I decided to change my diet. But how do you change your diet? I asked the various physicians I was in consultation with, and none of them could tell me what to do. They said, they don't know if your cholesterol can be changed. They said they thought that was hereditary. And I said, well, I better go down to a school of nutrition and find out. So I went down to UCLA, and I saw someone in the nutrition department and said, I want to hire a graduate nutritionist. I want to change my diet, and I need someone to give me guidance. Well, they said that we'd be glad to give you a graduate nutritionist. They're looking for work. What do you want to do with your diet? I said, I want to lower my cholesterol level. Well, they said, you can't lower your cholesterol level by diet because first you'd have to cut out some of the foods high in cholesterol, and they're the best foods that the body must have. They're the eggs, they're the cheeses, and so on. He said, you've got to have those foods. And I said, well, I, the animal studies tell me that if you delete these foods high in cholesterol, your cholesterol level will drop. He said, first of all, it wouldn't make any difference. What you eat doesn't determine your cholesterol, that's determined by hereditary reasons, and if you want to lower your cholesterol that way, we can't help you. It'd be too dangerous. You might kill yourself. I said, you mean it's okay for me to do it myself without your help and kill myself, but with your help you won't do it? Well, no, they wouldn't do that. They said it's something we would not attempt because it wouldn't be natural for me. I went to another university and tried the same, with the same answer. When they found out what I wanted to do, they said they couldn't take responsibilities for anything as abnormal as trying to change your cholesterol level. Well, I decided then to do it myself, but I was very fearful because I thought I'd go into various deficiencies. They warned me about all the deficiencies I was going to go into, and I really was worried. So I went to my friendly physician in Santa Barbara. He was my internist, and I told him that I wanted to change my diet. I thought my cholesterol level 300 was too high, and he said, well, it's only in the high normal range. He says he sees a lot of people like me. I said, that's fine, but I want to change it, except I want permission from you to permit me to take blood tests at the local laboratory whenever I want to and have them give me the results. It would take me too long before you write out a prescription and I have to go there and then they send the results to you before I can make my changes. Well, I had to convince him that I would be able to interpret the blood values and finally he gave me an open note. 
I went to our large laboratory, the Blanchard Dixon Laboratory in Santa Barbara, talked to Dr. Blanchard, and said, I have my note from my friendly physician, and I'd like to take a blood test. And he said, well, fine, let's take a blood test. What do you want? And I gave him my list of 90 blood tests I wanted. He says, what are you taking all these blood tests for? We only take 12 blood tests. And I said, well, I have to know what my minerals are. I have to know what my vitamins are. I have to know what my other values are because I'm going to change my diet, and I don't want to run into any deficiencies. I have to know where I'm starting from. Well, it took him about an hour to figure out how much blood he needed. Finally, he says, I think I can do it all with about four or five ounces of blood. I said, all right, well, let's take the syringe. He says, you can't use a syringe for this. You have to use a transfusion needle. <laughs> we can't get that much in the syringe. And so he took his transfusion needle, put it in my arm, attached a rubber hose to it, and the blood just dripped into a bottle. Well, the sight of my own blood coming out in such volume, I nearly fainted on the chair. And we noticed that I sort of turned white and was closing my eyes. He says, look, he said, don't worry about it. As long as you're sitting down, you can't hurt yourself. <laughs> And uh, I finally was over. He pulled his needle out. And I got my test. And then I started to change my diet. And it was really not that complicated. After a couple of months, I realized that I was no different than any of the animal studies. The same way that animals drop their cholesterol level, so do humans. And I never did run into deficiency on any of the problems at all. And I was just frightened unnecessarily. But it took me a lot of blood tests and a lot of worry before I finish with my experimental work. I remember the first blood test I took cost me $300, and that was back in 1958. So it took me a year and a half to bring my cholesterol from 300 down to 160, and another year on the same kind of diet that you're on to bring it from 160 down to 100. And it stayed pretty much from 100 to 120 these last 18 years. Well, now after two and a half years, this was 1961 already, I finally solved my problem with my blood. Now, what do I do with my coronary arteries? That was the next problem. My physician did not permit me to do any exercise. But all the animal studies taught me that the only way you can grow new circulation is through exercise. So I was really perplexed. I went through the various studies, and I found one study of dogs that had walked on treadmills and another set of dogs that were sedentary. Those dogs that walked on treadmills had 50% more blood vessels in their legs than the ones that did not walk on treadmills. Well, that showed me that you can grow new blood vessels if you'll exercise. So I decided to find a capillary expert, a blood vessel expert that can advise me. And I looked around, and I found one in Los Angeles, one in San Francisco, and I was very fortunate to find that there was one expert in Santa Barbara. He was at the Environmental Stress Institute at the University of Santa Barbara. And I went to see him and told him that I wanted to grow new capillaries. What do I have to do to grow new capillaries? And he said, you can't grow new capillaries. You only have what you're born with. I said, but I have this study, and I showed him the study. It was in the original German. I had a translation made. He said, first of all, this is about dogs, not humans. And second, is this the only study you have? I said, it's the only study I could find yet. So he points to his wall. His wall had a bookcase from floor to ceiling, about 16 feet long, thousands of books. And he said, that will tell you you can't grow capillaries. <laughs> well, I couldn't fight his thousands of books against my one little study. So I said, isn't there any way to gain new circulation? He says, no. He says, you have to be born with it. I says, but how about when people have heart attack? Right in the coronary care ward, they grow collaterals. He says, that's the only exception. When the body is ready to die, It'll grow small collaterals to try and protect itself. But other than that, there's no way to do it. Well, that was very discouraging. And I went home trying to figure out what to do. When I decided to do more research on I came up with two other studies. But they're all animal studies, and they told me all the same thing. I decided I was going to then try it myself, with or without expert advice. But I was very frightened because my cardiologist made it so clear that if I overdid myself, I was just going to drop dead. And uh, I started then to plan an exercise program. But before I did, I had to have a way to test myself. I went back to my friendly internist. And I said, look how well I did on my blood tests. My cholesterol is down now to about 100. I need to do the same thing for my coronary arteries. He says, what are you going to do? I said, I want to try an exercise program. He says, well, you know, your cardiologist said you can't do it. 
I says, but if it doesn't hurt me, I'll test myself. I'll take little stress tests every week or two, and if I find I'm getting worse, I'll stop. If I'm getting better, I can continue. And I said, I've learned how to read electrocardiograms now. I can read the tracings. And what I'd like to do is have the authority from you to go to our cottage hospital, have them do a step test, and let me interpret the tracings whenever I want to go. Well, he said, that's pretty dangerous. Something happens to you, it's my responsibility. But we went to the hospital together, and we did the test, and I read the tracings, and they were to a satisfaction, so he authorized the nurse then to let me come whenever I wanted to. Now I was ready to stop my exercise program. And my whole exercise program consisted, instead of walking four blocks a day in four walks, I now walked six blocks a day. <laughs> and I did that for a week or so, and I, then the next week I walked eight blocks, and the next week I walked 10 blocks. Can you imagine 10 blocks in four divided walks? It's amazing how frightened you can be when your doctor tells you you're going to drop dead. Well, I then went back and had a stress test, and I noticed I got no worse. And then I continued. I was walking further and further. I got to walk a mile. Then I would walk a half a mile at one time without stopping. And I found that after another month or so, my test began getting better. The abnormality was starting to disappear and the insufficiency in the coronary arteries was starting to disappear. Well, this encouraged me considerably, but it took me a whole year doing that before I got up to walking four miles for the entire day. Well, I was walking about a mile, a mile and a half per walk, and only at a moderate pace. Well, by this time, the stress test, the little stress test, was getting almost normal, but I could only get my heartbeat up to about 110 or 115 or so a minute. I decided then to start to run, say 10 or 20 feet at a time. And I gradually got faster and faster until I now was running a quarter of a mile without stopping. When my right knee gave way. So I went to my friendly orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Burgess, who's still practicing in Santa Barbara now. He took care of all my children's problems and I said, my right knee has become lame. I can't walk with it. And he says, well, you're probably playing football with your children. I said, no, we don't play football. He says, well, what were you doing? I said, I am starting to run. And I ran a quarter of a mile, and something happened. I had to stop. He said, well, you can't run. You're wearing on all the cartilage in your leg. Your knees will just wear out. You have nothing left by the time you're 50. You'll be with a cane. He said, after 40, you've got to swim. <laughs> I said, but swimming is no good for me. I'm not going to develop any collateral swimming. He said, what are you talking about developing collaterals? I realized I didn't have a sympathetic gear, so I didn't try to explain it. And I said, there must be some way I could run. Maybe I can change my shoes or change my gait, or maybe one foot is shorter than the other. He says, no, people over 40 can't run, and that's all there is to it. Well, that was coming right from the authority, and I decided that I'd have to take his advice. I waited a couple weeks, and my knee finally healed. And I just, as a last time, I thought I would just have the last experience of running while I had some conditioning. And I went out to the grassy field, threw my shoes off, and ran to my stocking feet. And I was amazed. I ran for a quarter of a mile with no pain. And I continued, and I ran another quarter of a mile without pain. At that time, I realized that you can't run in street shoes. I used to wear hush puppies then. <laughs> and I realized they, they, they were my problem for my bad knee. I had a pair of shoes made because in those days, running shoes were not like you have today. All they had are some very strange looking shoes they used to use for sprinters and there's practically nothing else available. Well, the pair of shoes I had made worked fine. I never had a knee problem again. Well, I gradually developed more and more running skill and I got up to running four miles without stopping. And I finally got to the point where I was running seven or so miles without stopping. Now, this took a long, long time. You won't believe how slowly I did this. It was 1966 before I got up to seven miles without stopping. That was five, mile, five years after I started. Five years. Uh, if I had to do it all over again, I'm sure I could do the whole thing in about six or nine months. But I was being very, very cautious. I thought I was going to drop dead. I thought all kinds of things would happen. Tested myself very frequently, and it really concerned me. I thought it was time now for a real stress test. So I went back to UCSB, our Santa Barbara University, to back to the Institute of Environmental Stress, to the same doctor that gave me my capillary advice. 
And I said, you have a stress, you have a treadmill here. And I'd like to have a stress test on a treadmill. I need to get to my highest heartbeat to see if I have any coronary insufficiency. He said, sure, I'll be glad to do it for you. We have an experimental treadmill. It's given to us by the Air Force. And he showed it to me. It looked like they tested cows on it. It was three feet wide by about 10 feet long. Very elaborate equipment. He says, if you can get yourself a cardiologist, I'll be glad to test you, because we can't take the responsibility if you should drop dead. So I said, that'd be fine. And I got myself a cardiologist. He came down, and we're all ready to go. I took my shirt off. I said, I'm all ready for electrodes. And he said, are you going to run in those long pants? I said, I always run in long pants. He says, but it's different here. You're going to be standing still while you're running, and you won't have any breeze that you create. You know, outside, when you run, you move forward and get a breeze. Here, you're going to stand still, only the treadmill moves. So I said, fine. And he gave me a pair of shorts, and I put them on. And he said, well, we're practically ready. And I said, well, I'm all set. And so I got on the treadmill, and he says, no, no, we're not that ready yet. He says, you've got to have your preliminary tests. I said, what tests? I just want to run on the treadmill. He said, this is a scientific laboratory. First, we have to take your temperature. I said, why do you have to take my temperature? He says, because you're going to gain some temperature, and we have to see how, much, how many degrees you gain. I said, fine. All right. So I open my mouth. His nurse comes. And she says, we don't take temperatures that way. It's not accurate enough. <laughs> so she said, bend over. <laughs> well, I thought, for the sake of science. <laughs> and so I bent over, took my temperature. She said, it's 99 and a half. She says, you know, rectal temperature is one point higher than oral. I said, thank you. I'm very glad to know about that. <laughs> and so I said, I think I'm ready now for the treadmill. He says, no, no, we have to weigh you. I said, why do you have to weigh me? He says, because you're going to lose weight. You're going to lose water. We've got to know how much you lose. So she weighed me, and I said, I hope everything's all right. And I said, I hope I'm ready for the treadmill now. <laughs> and she says, yes, you're all set. But, uh, you know, right after the treadmill, we have to quickly do this all over again before things change. And I thanked her. So I got on the treadmill, and the doctor asked me what protocol I want. That is, what, what do you want? How do you want us to set up the treadmill? And fortunately, I had such good equipment, the wires were not directly connected to the recording device. There was a little radio transmitter that sent the signal 10 feet away to his recorder. And he could record my tracing in slow motion. Instead of one inch a second like we do it here, he was able to do it two inches a second. It gave him much easier tracing to read. And I said, what I'd like to do is run on the treadmill at eight and a half miles an hour. That's a mile and seven minutes, and I want to run for 20 minutes because that's what I'm accustomed to doing. So I want to run three miles in the treadmill, and I'd like to run the tape continuously so I have a record of every heartbeat. Every heartbeat. He said, all right, he can do that. So we get started, and the treadmill starts to go at a walking pace, and then starts to go a little faster, and I have to start running a little bit. Finally, I'm up to eight and a half miles an hour, and I was very glad that they had me put the shorts on because even though you're running, you're standing still. There's no wind at all. And the sweat came down me in such a fury that my socks were getting wet. <laughs> well, when the 20 minutes were up, the treadmill started to slow down gradually. I was very, very happy. I can't tell you how happy I was for that treadmill to slow down. Finally stopped. I was trying to catch my breath when the nurse says, bend over. <laughs> <laughs> and then she says, your temperature rose two degrees. I said, it'll cool down later. <laughs> and then I'm trying to catch my breath. She says, we have to weigh you immediately. I says, can't it wait? I said, I'd like to see the tracing. She says, no, we have to do it already. She says, you lost two and a half pounds. I said, I'll drink it back. It's only water. <laughs> so meanwhile, the good doctor is looking over the tracing, just like a broker in a stock market office where the ticker tape is all over the floor. <laughs> so meanwhile, the good doctor is looking over the tracing just like a broker in a stock market office where the ticker tape is all over the floor. Look in the tracing, and I'm looking over his shoulder. And I said, do you find any coronary insufficiency? He says, not yet. But he looks and looks. He did the whole thing, and I said, well, let's do it over again. So he started to do it backwards and went over, went over every heartbeat. We couldn't find one beat with coronary insufficiency. The heart rate got up to about 177 beats a minute after about eight minutes and stayed there the whole time. And I said, 
why don't we find any corneal insufficiency? I said, the only way that could happen is if I must have more blood. He said, well, you probably have more blood. I said, where do you think it came from? I said, is it possible I could have developed collateral circulation? Well, by this time, it was five years later, and the evidence was coming so strong that activity gives you collateral circulation. He finally broke down and said, well, it's possible. <laughs> but it didn't make any difference where the blood came from. I knew that I no longer had corneal insufficiency at the highest rate that I could run, and I felt that finally, from 1958 to 1966, an eight-year effort, that I was finished with my health problem. Well, I can't tell you how elated I was. And immediately I tried to convert everybody in the world to a new way of living. And I remember the first man I tried to convert was at a party. He was telling everybody he's, he's discovered he had corneal insufficiency, he was having some chest pressure, and it was worrying him as doctor put him on certain medication. So I said, how would I like to cure your corneal insufficiency? He says, fine. He says, are you a doctor? I said, no. He says, well, don't bother me then. I got a doctor and he's taking care of me. <laughs> I realized that my advice really wasn't wanted because I had no credibility. Well, from that point on, I didn't say much. But the doctors in town, Santa Barbara's a small town, knew I was very interested in nutrition, used to refer me a patient every now and then to give him a nutritional prescription. They thought I'd give him a vitamin or two and keep the patient happy. Well, when I get a patient who had high blood pressure, I used to, in a very short time, get rid of his high blood pressure. That was the last time I got a referral from that physician. <laughs> it got so that the only physicians that referred patients to me were the psychiatrists. <laughs> they never lose a patient. <laughs> and one of the psychiatrists used to refer patients to me, invited me to attend a medical meeting with him. And I noticed that he had a little lunch basket with him. But I didn't say anything because people are entitled to bring their lunch to a medical meeting. We sat in back, and we were there about 10 minutes when he opened up his lunch basket and took out a chicken leg and started to chew on the chicken leg. I said, you obviously like chicken legs. He says, I hate chicken legs. <laughs> I says, but you got about 10 chicken legs in your basket. <laughs> he says, that's because I've got hypoglycemia. I have to eat chicken eggs. I said, don't tell me you're on that high-protein diet. He says, of course I'm on a high-protein diet. It's the only diet there is for hypoglycemia. He says, I've had it for 10 years. And I said, and you'll have it for the rest of your life because that's the wrong diet. You've got to be on a high-carbohydrate diet. He says, no, he says, that's what causes hypoglycemia. You've got to be on a high-protein diet. I says, that's guaranteed to have hypoglycemia for the rest of your life. I said, why not try a little different approach? Well, he says, look, I got my diet from an expert. Someone who's been treating this for 25 years. I've been around the country. All the advice is more or less the same, and you just don't know what you're talking about. Well, it took me a couple of months before I convinced him to go into the studies with me. Uh, he, came, he used to come over to my house, <clears throat> and we went over hundreds of studies. And finally, I convinced him to at least to try this new approach. And he was really worried about it. And he decided to try it. Ten days after he was on the diet, he called me up, very worried, and he says, I'm having lots of trouble. I said, what's wrong? He says, I can't take my afternoon nap. I said, why not? He says, I can't fall asleep. I said, you're cured. Go out and play tennis. <laughs> Every day, this poor guy was taking an afternoon nap. He was absolutely exhausted by noon. It interfered with his medical practice, but he couldn't help it. He was always fatigued. Well, this was such a sensation to him. He called up his physician in Pasadena, that was the hypoglycemic expert, and told him all about the diet and told him all about the whole medical approach. Well, the physician could hardly believe it. He's been treating cases like this for all these many years, and this diet was completely 180 degrees away from where he's been treating. So the physician called me up and says, my patient tells me that you put him on a strange diet, a high carbohydrate diet yet, and that his hypoglycemia seems to be better. He says, how can you scientifically justify such a diet? He says, I'd like to have you come to my, to my office Wednesday's my day off, we'll spend an hour or so, and you give me your evidence why you do this. Well, that worried me because no one had ever cross-examined me who was a physician, and it worried me considerably. So I prepared for it by getting about 600 studies together. I brought them in a little folder, a little filing cabinet, cardboard filing cabinet, brought them down to Pasadena. And I met the physician at his club for lunch. We were there six hours. I went through the many, many studies, when I was finished, he was so convinced that this was the way to go. He says, you know, I can't believe it, but I'm so convinced I'm going to change my whole practice to suit your nutritional approach. 
and I want you to help me. I says, how will I help you? He says, I want you to come down and act as my consultant for a couple of days till I get used to the whole idea. So I didn't quite know what he meant by that, but I came down and he says, well, we're ready to see a patient. I says, what do I do? He says, first you put this white coat on. <laughs> so I put the white coat on and I say, what do I do? He says, you're my consultant. You go down and just listen to what the patient has to say. We'll both go together. And then you would listen to what the patient says. You think about what diet you want to advise. We'll walk out of the room, tell me what the diet is, and I'll go back and tell the patient. <laughs> so we walk in the room and we listen to the patient's problems. And then we find out what diet she's on, and it's a terrible diet. <laughs> And so we walk out, and I says, no wonder she's sick. This is what she's eating. She's got to eat this, this, and this. We walk back, and he tells the patient, well, you have to eat this, this, and this. And the patient says, well, how much should I eat of this, this, and this? And we walk out, and I say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is how much she should eat of each one, and so on. And we walk back. Well, but he was very bright, and he caught on very fast. And it just took a couple of days of consultation <laughs> before he was doing it himself. <laughs> well, during this time, I had been treating one or two or three other people who took it seriously. One of them was Mrs. Eula Weaver, who at that time <coughs> was a woman who at 81 had congestive heart failure and all her problems, and a couple of years later she ran her first mile. Well, the doctor in Pasadena <coughs> called me up one day. He says, I'm the president of a medical society, <coughs> and we're going to have our annual meeting in Florida. How about coming out and giving a lecture to our group? I said, how many people you have? He said, oh, several hundred. I said, what will the audience be made of? He said, there'll be physicians and scientific investigators. I said, where will they come from? He said, all over the world. I said, well, who's on your program? He said, well, we'll have various physicians lecturing. And I says, only physicians? He said, I might have a PhD or two. I says, but who will you have that has no credentials like myself? He says, you'll be the only one. He says, but that's all right. He says, we need to shake them up a little bit. <laughs> well, this really sounded like a threat, but I thought I might as well do it. I've never appeared before more than one physician at the time, and he was the physician I appeared before. And my wife and I prepared this for two months. For two months, we did nothing but prepare for this one-hour talk. We typed it over eight times, I think. We had hundreds of studies supporting what we said. And we went down then to Florida, and we had two suitcases. One weighed 80 pounds, that was our references, <laughs> and the other was a small one for our clothes. <laughs> we went to the hotel, and got all our references out in order so I can immediately get to them if anyone challenged me at any point. And it was my turn finally to give my talk. I got up, gave my talk, and I never saw such a bunch of people that had glum looks in their face. I could see that they were not taking seriously what I said, that is, it didn't look like anyone was even listening to me. And after my talk, when they asked for questions and answers, nobody asked a single question. Well, I knew then that I was really not wanted, and I told my wife, I think we ought to leave. We certainly are not wanted because they didn't ask a single question. So I went to see the doctor, who was president of the group. I said, I think we're going to leave. I know your meeting's another day or two, but it doesn't look like the talk was really accepted. And uh, I must have hurt some people's feelings because what I told them was exactly the opposite of what they believed in. He says, no, he says, would you stay another day? I'd like you to give a workshop. So I said, what's a workshop? He says, well, you sit around a table and half a dozen physicians come and ask you questions and you answer the questions. It's a very informal meeting. I said, all right, we'll give a workshop then. Next day, I'm ready for my workshop and I go to the secretary and ask what room it's in. She says, it's in room so-and-so. I walk in room so-and-so, and I open the door. The room is filled with about 150 people. There weren't enough chairs, so many of them were standing against the wall. I opened the door, and I closed it within five seconds, walked right out. And I went back to the secretary, and I said, you gave me the wrong room. <laughs> I said, I'm supposed to give a workshop. Half a dozen people around a small table. He said, there's only two workshops, yours and someone else's, <laughs> and that's your room. Well. I walked into the room, and I had a crowd against the wall and the people standing up. I got to the other end of the long table, and I sat down, and I didn't know what to do. And the physician next to me introduced himself, and I said, what do I do? He said, stand up and ask for questions. So I stood up and asked for questions, and about 20 people raised their hands and asked questions. <laughs> and then I realized what was wrong the day before. 
the kind of nutrition I was talking about was so different from anything they'd ever heard, they didn't know what questions to ask me. And now the questions came out just like a torrent. And I realized that physicians, at least this group of physicians, were completely oblivious to the nutritional factors that cause degenerative diseases. They understood vitamins and minerals as far as prescribing. They knew about low salt diets and the American Heart Association diet, American Diabetic Association diet, but they didn't have the slightest idea what the relationship was to disease. Well, at the end of that, about 16 physicians asked if I would give them special diets to put their patients on. And that many were willing to join a study. Each was willing to put 25 patients on a diet. Well, that was a nice study, 25 times 16, that's 400 patients on a diet. Told my wife about it, she said, that'd be terrific. It'd be a nice study. We would write manuals for the patients and a manual for the physicians, and it sounds like it'd be fine. So that went very well, and a man came up to me and he says, I'm a cardiologist, I'm having president of a meeting, cardiology meeting that's going to follow this one. I'm here a day early for the arrangements. Would you talk to our group? I said, sure, be glad to. He says, now since we, you're unscheduled, you'll come on as the last speaker. You'll come on at 9 o'clock in the evening. I said, that's fine. Well, I gave the same talk, 9 o'clock in the evening. They asked for questions. Again, there were no questions. So I said to the moderator, I said, why don't you say I'll be around the table and back, and if anyone wants to ask me a question, I'll be there after the meeting. So I sat down after the meeting, and people then surrounded the table about four deep. There was such interest in the whole concept that nutrition can cause heart disease. And I picked up another 10 physicians who wanted to put 25 people on a diet. Well, now I was getting a fair-sized study. We had about 600 patients who were going to go on this sort of diet. Well, the American Medical Association heard about it, and they said, how about us printing a notice in our journal of the American Medical Association inviting our readers to join your study? Sounds like an interesting study. So I said, that's fine. I didn't realize how many physicians they reached to that journal, American Medical Association, until the letters came in. A thousand physicians wanted to join our study from all over the world. I didn't realize they sent it out to a couple hundred thousand physicians. Well, that, of course, overwhelmed us. We just couldn't handle it. This is a study my wife and I would finance, and it wasn't possible to handle that. So we stopped at 60 physicians in 22 states, 2,000 people. And it cost my wife and I about $25,000 to do the study, but it was well worth it. It was a 12-month study. We had to print all the manuals for the patients and the physicians and the forms, and all the blood went to bioscience laboratories. A very interesting study. Well, meanwhile, we got a letter from a physician at the Long Beach Veterans Hospital. It's the largest VA hospital in the world. And the letter said, I'd like to invite you to do a study. It'll be on patients at our hospital and those with serious heart disease. And we'd like to see the effect of diet on heart disease to see if it affects them or not. And we're going to do angiograms before and after the study. Well, angiograms, that's something I always hoped I'd be able to get on a study for an x-ray of the inside of the arteries to see what effect the diet might have on the arteries. I called him right away and said, how soon are we going to start the study? <laughs> and he told me what it was. He came over to my house. We gave him a sample meal. He said, that's fine. He said, we'll select about 40 people. And what we'll do is take 20 of them, put them on your diet, 20 of the American Heart Association diet. We'll select them for claudication, not enough blood flow in the legs, so we can test them on a treadmill to see how well they do. Well, that was fine. And we're ready to start the study, he said, about September 1974. Well, it came the time to start the study, and he calls me up and says, the hospital is loading so many responsibilities to me, I don't have time to select the cases. Can you come down and help me? I says, be glad to. Came down, and I said, where are the ones you selected? He says, I haven't selected them yet, but here's the pile of cases to go through. Well, I was there for three days. I went through many, many cases, and I finally found two people willing to enter the study. I said, at that rate, I'm not going to get very far. I had a son, Robert, who was 23 at the time, working as a diabetic investigator for a, an Eastern Diabetic Foundation. He was at Stanford investigating their diabetic work. I said, Robert, you have to come down for a couple weekends for me. He came down. We went over cases. It took us eight weeks, three-day weekends, to go and get our 38 patients. We went through 800 case histories to get them. Because when you get your cases, you have to match your two groups of 19 have to be matched for diseases, length of time they had diseases, severity of disease, wasn't easy. 
We finally finished it. We sent the men in for their blood tests. They did their treadmill tests. All the examinations were done. Finally ready for their angiograms. Well, at that time, unfortunately, the Long Beach VA had a problem. The chief of cardiology apparently had run into problems doing coronary angiograms, and there were some deaths, as I understood it. So they cut off all experimental work on angiograms. And they said, well, if you want to have angiograms, you'll have to apply for a, as an approved study, and apply for a grant to get the funds to do the angiogram. I said, well, how long does it take? And they said, well, you can probably get approval in nine months. I said, nine months? Our patients are dying at the rate of about once every three weeks. We won't have any left in nine months. Well, they said, that's the best we can do for you. He says, why don't you buy them on the outside if you need them that badly? I said, how much are angiograms? And they said, $1,200 a piece. <laughs> well, I, I knew I couldn't afford that. So I decided then to talk to many hospitals, many investigative groups, universities. I finally got Loma Linda University interested. And they said, if you're willing to do it, we'll do the angiograms for you because we like the diet that you're planning. But We'll, we'll charge the insurance policies of the patients with the price of the angiogram. Whatever they don't pay, you'll have to pay yourself. Well, I was willing to do that because that was a lesser amount of money, and I then took that on. Finally got all the angiograms done, and I said, well, let's get started right away now. Let's get the diet started with your dietitian. He said, fine, let's go to the chief dietitian. I go to the chief dietitian, and I give her my diet. She said, no, don't bother me with the details. Is it a low-salt diet? I says, no. She says, it's an American Heart Association diet. I says, no, it's a special diet. And I finally go through the diet, and she says, we can't do it here. I says, why can't you do it? She says, let me show you my kitchen. I walk into the kitchen. It's a very, very large room. The smallest pot is four feet in diameter. And she says, we can't make a specialized meal like this for only 18 men. And I says, well, do it in your experimental kitchen. She says, we have no experimental kitchen. I says, it can't be in a hospital this size, the largest VA hospital in the world. You don't have another kitchen but this one. She says, well, if you find one, you can prepare the food there. Well, I went to the hospital. I was there for two days. I tramped every floor of that place, 20 acres of area. There wasn't even a hot plate around. Well, that was very bad because now I'm ready to do the study. We're at the angiograms. The men are very sick, and I can't feed them. Well, I decided I was going to feed them at my own expense. I rented a house in Long Beach, two miles from the hospital outfitted a kitchen, prepared to buy all the food for five months, but I realized when I figured out what my expenses were that I didn't have enough money. It, it was going to cost about $35,000 for me to do it, but I needed $10,000 for a coordinator who would live there and run the study for me. And all my wife and I could see what we can have coming in the next five months was about $25,000 we could spare. So this was bad. I was going east, and I stopped by the National Institute of Aging in Washington because I had met Dr. Schock, who runs the, who was head at that time, some time ago, and I told him about this marvelous study with angiograms, we're going to prove whether or not heart disease has any effect by diet. And I said, but I need $10,000. He says, terrific. Just apply for it. Go see Dr. Butler, who's in charge of our funding. And I thought this is marvelous. I called Dr. Butler, who incidentally today is director of the National Institute of Aging, and he says, terrific, apply for a grant. I said, the grant? How long does it take? He says, maybe we can get a decision in nine months. I said, I can't wait nine months. Don't you have emergency money? He says, yes, once you get a grant, you can get emergency money. <laughs> well, I contacted 50 of the largest health foundations in the country by phone. They said, are you connected with a medical university? I said, no. They said, are you an MD? I said, no. They said, what are you bothering this for? <laughs> I said, but this was a marvelous study. There's a physician at Long Beach VA is going to run it, and it's an uh, angiographic study. They said, well, we can't help it. You don't seem to be qualified. Well, I was finally at my wit's end, and I thought upon one tactic. I called up my son Robert's employer, who is a cardiologist in New York, and I told him about the study. He says, well, when are you going to start your study? He says, I'm anxious to know what's going to happen to the angiograms. I said, we may never start it. He says, why not? I says, because I haven't raised $10,000 to hire a coordinator to run the study. He says, well, you know we can't help you for that. We're a diabetic foundation. I says, I'm not asking you for cash. I just want you to let me have Robert for six months on your salary. <laughs> he says, well, that's a little different. I don't know. Maybe we can do it. I'll talk to our benefactor. He talked to his benefactor, and they approved it. 
The study started. I told Robert, Robert, you're going to live in Long Beach for six months, and you're going to be babysitter for 19 men who are 60 years old. as an average. We set up the place, started the study, and the study went along very well. <laughs> I can't tell you all the problems. One example of what my first son, Robert, had to put up with. The men just couldn't get along with each other. If I've ever seen men act like children, it was in this study. Two of the men in their 60s, one with congestive heart failure, the other with serious angina, got in a fist fight. <laughs> they got in a fist fight, and they both were, they were beating on each other, and they put their arms around each other because they're both having such tremendous pain they couldn't move another arm, <laughs> and they were hanging on to each other for dear life because of their tremendous angina. <laughs> My son was trying to separate them, but they were so gasping for breath and so on that he could hardly get them apart. <laughs> They were supporting each other. <laughs> well, he got them apart, and they both lay down on the floor. <laughs> I thought one of them was going to die. Well, the problems he had really were tremendous. Uh, some of the men despised each other because there's all levels of, of uh, educational uh, background. We had some who had, had only a third-year grammar school education. Others were college graduates, and each one scoffed at the other. He had a real tough time for a 23-year-old. He did a terrific job. And then the problem at the VA hospital, I can't start to tell you. They didn't like the idea of the study. So when I send 12 in, men in to have a blood test, they take their blood. But if they were busy, they didn't bother processing it until 5 o'clock. And at 5 o'clock, if they didn't process it yet, they throw it away. When I found that out, really, I was fit to be tied, but I couldn't do much about it. So I used to sneak my men in one at a time so they wouldn't know they belonged to my study. They were entitled to have their blood drawn. Well, it got so bad they wouldn't even let us do our treadmill testing. They made our physician do the treadmill testing only on his own time, evenings and weekends. It was a real tough time there, but we finally finished the study. The five months were over. I sent the men back to Loma Linda University, and Dr. Smith did the angiograms, and Dr. Smith called me up and he said, remember that truck driver that had that 80% closure in his left iliac artery? I said, I can't forget that artery. He says, there's only 30% closed now. I said, 80 to 30%? It's not possible. He says, come and look for yourself. Well, I made that 60 miles from Long Beach to Loma Linda in Riverside. In such time, I never thought I'd get there alive myself. And I got there, I rushed into the radiation, radi or radiological laboratory, and there on the uh, light boxes were the original, tread original angiogram and the after angiogram. And the, you couldn't mistake the artery opening. It was so clear from an 80% to 30%, it's unmistakable. And then he said, here's another spot to be interested in. Here's another spot. And we had about eight nice places in two patients that showed substantial closure and then opening. Well, that was remarkable. So I was very happy about that. And my physicians were very happy in the study. And they said, we've got to tell everybody about this new therapy. We're able to take hypertensive patients, get them off the medication. Angina patients, get them off their problem. People on insulin, get them off insulin. We've got to tell people about this. I said, so what should we do? They said, well, what you do is send it in to medical society meetings, and they print an abstract. That's a small paragraph or so telling what you've done, and then that gives people a right to ask for it to get more information. Then they usually let you talk about it at the medical meetings. And I said, what medical meetings do you want to go to? They said, well, the American Heart Association is having their meeting November 75. I said, well, on that meeting, the physicians ought to be the senior authors because they'll present the paper. They said, fine. And they said, well, there's a meeting out in Chicago. You can be the senior author. And it was a meeting of the American Academy of Physical Medicine Rehabilitation. I said, it sounds very good. I said, fine. So the American Heart Association turned the physicians down with a routine form letter, saying we're not really too interested. But in that year, they printed a 1,000 abstracts, and one of them was the amount of cholesterol in the guinea pig's liver, <laughs> much more important than our study, that was how to reverse hypertension, the 75% of hypertension was on medication. <laughs> the American Heart Association is not going to live that down. But the group out in Chicago stepped to my paper and asked me to give it. And I went out to Chicago. The meeting was Atlanta. I gave my paper in Atlanta. And it was unusual in that nobody had ever heard of this before, that Artery disease can be reversed. Their science editor, the Atlanta paper, wrote it up. The news services took it on. And in two days' time, 
I had a couple thousand inquiries back in Santa Barbara. Where is this nutritional therapy possible? And I said, <coughs> there's no place <coughs> in the country where it's obtainable now. <coughs> and I happen to think this would be an ideal time to put it in practice. If I wait for the medical community, it'll be 200 years. I better do it myself. And in a week's time, I made up my mind. <coughs> in January 6th, 1976, our center opened with nine patients and six spouses. Well, since then, it's enlarged a little bit. We've had over 3,000 people through our center. And we've had a lot of people investigate us. <coughs> when McGovern wanted to hold his hearings last year, he first sent his chief of staff out to us in 1976 to investigate us. And the report came back that what we're doing is actually what we claim. So Senator Proxmire sent his investigative physician out to check us out. He came out and he said, well, I may need a couple of days to go through your case histories. Will you let me see everything you're doing? I says, all of our files are open to you. He stayed three weeks. He looked through every case we had. And he said, I was expecting, hopefully, to find 10% cures. I'm finding 70% cures. I can't believe it. He wrote a 180-page text for Senator Proxmire, and that was the basis of the McGovern hearings, 1977. And our, in the McGovern hearings, when they grilled Dr. Levy, director of the National Heart and Lung of National Institute of Health, there's 80 pages in the congressional record about that hearing. I've never been in a congressional record before, and suddenly now we have 80 pages. Well, the credibility that we've had, and I should say that in the beginning we had zero credibility, but it's completely different now. We have so much credibility now, and so many physicians are accepting what we're doing, I find it hard to believe. We probably have 10 or 15 physicians every day writing in for technical information about our studies and how to refer patients and so on. And now many people don't realize how much research we do. In 1977, we had about 20 people as an average on our research group. And we support medical research in various universities. UCLA, Loma Linda University, we have five studies going at the same time. University of Kentucky Medical Center, we've been supporting Dr. James Anderson for three years now. And we have other studies around the world. University of Alabama Medical School, we're doing a study. Dr. Burke and England, we're doing a study. We're doing a breast cancer study with Dr. Ernst Winder, American Health Foundation. We're doing a coronary angiogram study. We're going to have testing people having or coronary angiograms on our diet. We're doing a tremendous amount of research. And I had never had envisioned that this thing would grow into what it is and the tremendous amount of research we're doing. And there's one thing I'm sort of thankful for, that perhaps I never had a boss and never had to worry about how to spend my own money doing research. Thank you. I'd like to give you a short course in nutrition. This will involve the composition of foods and also involve nutritional recommendations. The American diet is hardly believed by many to cause any problems whatsoever. After all, isn't it the diet that your mother taught you to eat? Isn't it the diet that food manufacturers tell us are good for you? Isn't it the diet that the National Dairy Council said you have to have at least 12 gallons of milk a day in order to make you healthy and have your bones get strong? Now, the American diet is sort of a disaster, and I'll tell you why. First of all, it's very high in fat. Almost half the total calories are in fat on the American diet, and simple sugar is one-fifth of your total calories. In fact, if we take the fat and sugar together, that's almost two-thirds of all your calories. And yet fat and sugar have no vitamins, no minerals, no dietary fiber, that is no roughage, and they're really a disaster for you. In fact, the average American eats six ounces of sugar and six ounces of fat a day. Well, that's 1,500 calories, and it's only 12 ounces. If you had 12 ounces of salad, that would only be 80 calories. That's why the average American inevitably has to become overweight, because when you're eating six ounces, and it's uh, fat and six ounces of sugar, that's 1,500 calories. That's usually all you need all day long, and yet you eat that in one meal. Because the stomach 
is not too considerate as to what you put in it. The stomach is concerned about filling it mechanically, just putting so much material in before it satisfies its hunger. And the stomach doesn't really know if you're putting in 12 ounces worth of salad or if you're putting in 12 ounces of very high calorie foods, simple sugars and fats. It just wants to be filled mechanically. So it's very easy and it's almost impossible not to put too many calories in your stomach because the food is refined. It's just the pure calories without the bulk uh, that uh, uh, in which food was intended originally and formed to be eaten. So Americans, about a third of Americans after they're adults, weigh too much, and it's not their fault. It's because the simple refined foods force too many calories with too little bulk into their stomachs and force them then to become overweight. Not only do you have problems with sugar and fat, but white flour, which is the other 15 or 20 percent of what people eat, is without vitamins, minerals, dietary fiber, except for a few they might put back. And so that 80 or 85 percent of everything you eat is highly worth eating. There are artificial foods. The only thing that saves Americans that about 10 percent of their calories are fruits and vegetables. That's the only real food they eat. So the American diet is unforgivable, plus the third of an ounce of salt the average American eats. This forces him to hold so much water in his tissues that he starts to lose his circulation, develop arthritis, raise his blood pressure, and do all kinds of wrong things. Now, there's other things wrong with the American diet, uh, such as the amount of chemicals in the diet. It's hard for you to believe, but since World War II, there's a thousand percent more food colorings in your foods. Now, did you ask for all the food colorings? No, the food manufacturers decided that if they put it in, maybe you'll buy their products. They think you'd love to have these pretty colors from coal tires and so on. Now, these are a disaster for you. And unfortunately, some of the food colors have been turned out to be carcinogenic. But that's all right. We can change them and give you other food colors that we don't know really what's going to happen until another five or ten years. And then when we find out they're bad, we'll change those. The idea is to sell the food, not to make it healthier. How about the high-protein diet that every American eats? You know, the average American eats three times as much protein as his body requires. And that's a disaster for the person eating it because a high-protein diet leads to many problems. It cuts your endurance way down. It gives you constant fatigue because of the waste products that protein accumulate in your blood. It can give you kidney damage. It forces minerals out of your bones and out of your blood, giving you mineral depletion. And in general, it's a real problem for the body. I'm going to talk about more of those things. Before I do, I'd like to give you some idea of what foods I'm made of, because you don't think about it fats, sugars, carbohydrates, and so on. You think of an apple, you think of an orange, you think of apple pie, you think of foods. So let's talk about foods. Well, first, people have a mistaken conception of what foods are made of. Just to tell you again, we're going to talk about proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. Now, all of these are found in foods together. They're not separate. When you talk about a protein food, you really don't mean it unless you're talking about the white of egg. That's pure protein. But when you talk about cheese, for example, many people think of cheese as a protein food. It is not. Cheese has only a, as much protein as beans or peas. It's a fat food. Over 70% of the total calories of cheese is in fat. Butter is only 82% fat. So when you eat cheese, you're essentially eating butter. In fact, cheese has more fat and cholesterol than steak. So if you think you're doing yourself a favor eating cheese, you better eat steak. Now, as far as fruits are concerned, fruits are all quite low in fats. They're usually less than 10% fat. They're high in carbohydrates, usually over 80%, and they're relatively low in protein. For example, a banana has about 2% of its total calories in fat. And yet many people believe that bananas are fattening. How can they be fattening with so little fat? And they have a lot of bulk for the amount of calories they have. No, bananas aren't fattening. Now, how about potatoes? People think potatoes are fattening. Well, potatoes have less than 1% of the total calories in fat. A potato doesn't have any more calories than an apple or a pear. How can that be fattening? Well, if you take a 100-calorie potato and you put 300 calories of butter on it, that can be fattening. But the potato itself, we consider a medium-calorie food. It's not high-calorie. In fact, if you want to go on a diet 
of just potatoes and bananas and stuff yourself all you can for 30 days, you'll have a tough time maintaining your weight. You'll probably lose weight because you couldn't eat enough to have excess calories. These are natural foods, and that would probably be the reason. Now, most vegetables are fine, and we don't have any problems with them. They're usually relatively low in fat, high in carbohydrates, and moderate in protein. Lettuce, for example, is 9% total calories and fat, 17% protein. It's an excellent food, a lot of minerals and vitamins, and the 9% fat are mostly polyunsaturated fats, which is just what the American Heart Association would like you to have, except we'd like to have you eat it in food, not by adding corn oil to your food. Now, there's a few restrictions in food, and that is avocado and olives are very high in fat. Avocado is 82% total calories and fat. It's exactly the same as butter. I'm afraid you can't do much with avocado, and we can't recommend it. How about olives? 89% total calories and fat. Well, but we don't restrict you in olives. If you like to, you can have one a day. Now, as far as the grains, the grains are your principal caloric source. Uh, if you take a look at uh, rice, uh, wheat, uh, barley, millet, and so on, you'll find that they're all relatively low in fat. They're usually below 10% of their total calories and fat. Remember, the American diet is 43% total calories and fat, so they're quite low in fat. And grains are reasonable in protein. They run for about 7 to 15% total calories and protein. Studies have indicated that the human only needs about 6% of its total calories and protein. That means if you're on a 2,000 calorie diet, you'd only need about 120 calories of protein to take care of all your needs, 6% of total calories. The diet I prescribe is about 13% total calories and protein. So you're gonna get twice as much as you require on the diet I prescribe. There's no chance in the world to get into a protein deficiency. You get far more than you require. And as far as the various grains and so on, they are all low to moderate in protein. It'll keep your kidneys from getting into trouble, and it will give you all the advantages of low-protein diets I'm going to go into in a moment. Now, as far as beans and peas, beans and peas generally run about 20 or 25 percent total calories in protein. They're low in fat, and they are about 60 to 70 percent or so carbohydrates. Uh, so beans and peas are a good source uh, of calories, and they're a, it gives you some changes in your diet. But we do recommend that you don't eat them three times a day because you'll eat too much protein. Uh, once a day in small portions or three times a week, uh, beans or peas are fine. As far as potatoes, you can eat all you like. As I mentioned, they're low in calories, moderate in calories. They're low in fat, very low in fat. They're good in protein, and they have a lot of good things in them. So as far as the vegetable foods, the foods grown from the ground, you can just about have any variety you like. And we do recommend, of course, the fruits and vegetables, the whole grains, beans and peas and potatoes as your basic source of calories. On our diet, we do permit you to have a certain amount of animal protein, fish and fowl, uh, but we have to be careful about animal protein because of cholesterol. Cholesterol is a real problem. We're going to discuss that on heart disease. But I should tell you this, that if you eat more cholesterol than you lose through your body every day, the excess will pile up in your tissues, your organs, in your arteries, all over your body and destroy you. As it piles up in your arteries, you know what happens there. You grow sort of a cholesterol boil that we call a plaque. And as this boil grows inside your arteries, especially your coronary arteries that lead to your heart, the more the boil grows, the less room there is for blood to flow. And gradually it chokes up your blood supply and you can die of what we call heart disease. Now heart disease is a bad name because you people might think that there's something wrong with your heart. Well, there's nothing wrong with your heart unless you've had a heart attack. The problem with heart disease is not the heart. It's the coronary arteries, the little vessels that are meant to feed the heart is blood. Because the heart is only a muscle, like the calf muscle or your arm muscle. And what it requires is blood to do its work. And if you don't have enough blood flowing through your coronary arteries, the heart can't work, and it cries out in great pain. We call that angina. So that 
heart disease is the narrowing or closing of your arteries with these cholesterol boils that come from eating too much cholesterol. Now, how much cholesterol is there in food, and where do you find it? The only foods that have cholesterol are those that we call the animal protein foods. Animal protein or animal foods uh, uh, comprise any foods that do not have roots. Uh, if it doesn't grow on the ground, it's an animal protein. Animal protein ranges from cows, lambs, cockroaches, house flies, anything that doesn't have roots is an animal protein. And the amount of cholesterol varies in these. Now, the most amount of cholesterol that you can eat is no more than what you lose every day. Now, the major use for cholesterol in the body is to make bile. Bile is digestive juice that's used to help digest fat in the body. And probably 70% of the production of cholesterol is used to make bile. Now, it's so hard to make it that the bile, as it goes through the small intestine, is recaptured at the end of the small intestine and it's re brought back to the liver where it's reused. But the body isn't completely efficient, so about 5 or 10% of the bile gets, doesn't recapture and goes on through the large intestine and out with the bowel movement. This bile that goes out is the only way you can lose cholesterol. And the amount of loss you have every day is equivalent to amount of cholesterol in about a pound or a pound and a half of fish or fowl a week. If you eat more than that, it stores in your body and creates these terrible problems like gallstones, uh, cholesterol boils in your arteries that we call plaques, and all other kinds of consequences of too much cholesterol. So that we have to limit cholesterol to no more than you lose every day. To give you an idea now of which animal products create problems, egg yolks are very, very rich in cholesterol. Therefore, we cannot use them in our diet. One egg yolk has as much cholesterol as a half a pound of steak. So if you eat a three-egg omelet, you're eating a pound and a half of steak in cholesterol. And as far as various organ meats and so on, chicken liver has 10 times more cholesterol per ounce than chicken, than white of chicken, white meat of chicken. So you certainly don't want to eat the organ meats because they'll just overwhelm your body <clears throat> with cholesterol. Perhaps the highest amount of cholesterol content that's commonly eating, uh, eaten is in the brain. The, uh, animals' brains have 25 times more cholesterol than white meat of chicken or white meat of turkey. So you can't have that. The best thing to do is to stay away from all organ meats. Stay with the white meat of chicken, white meat of turkey, and you can have uh, many fishes. The white meat of turkey and chicken are about 20% of the total calories and fat, about 80% protein. And if you add two to three ounces a day as an average for a week, that's about the maximum you can have. As far as fish is concerned, most fish is all right. Most fish is rather low in fat. Uh, tuna, for example, is only 6% total calories and fat. That's if it's water-packed. But if you have oil-packed tuna, it's 10 times more in fat than water-packed tuna. And you can't wash the oil off of oil-packed tuna. So your best bet is just to get water packed and give up the idea of oil packed tuna. As far as the other normal fishes, codfish, many other fishes are fine. Now, one fish that we use, salmon, is about 50% of its total calories and fat. But it has such a strong flavor, we're able to use it anyway. Because even a quarter ounce of salmon can make up one salmon patty. It has such a strong flavor, it carries through the whole patty. And so we use it in our recipes. So fish is fine, fowl is fine, and you have to be careful of the fatty meats like feedlot beef. Regular steaks, beef cuts, and so on, unfortunately are artificially fattened. In the feedlot process, they force feed these animals, giving them special chemicals to make them grow more fat between their muscle tissues, and it's a, uh, an unfortunate uh, event then for those who eat it. Because the average beef animal, if permitted to range feed or grass feed, they only have one-fifth as much fat in their body as a feedlot animal. And you can't get the fat out of the 
uh, meat in the feedlot animal. You may think you're cutting it out around the steaks and so on, but the fat is in the marbling. In between the muscle fibers, you see those streaks of fat. You can't take that out. That's there to stay. And if you broil it and you say, well, it disappeared during broiling, it didn't disappear. It melted. You can't see it. Let it cool in your plate, and it'll all come back when it solidifies. Now you're eating a tremendous amount of fat. In a good club steak and so on, you're eating 80% of the total calories and fat. If you want to get a really good filet, you could be eating 85, 87% of the total calories and fat, only 12% protein. A slice of bread has more protein than a good filet. So that don't look upon it as a protein dish. Look upon it as a fat dish with as much fat as butter has, 82% total calories and fat. So as far as animal protein is concerned, most modern animal protein is just distorted to fill it with fat. It's like the old days when a goose was force-fed to give it a fatty liver. That was considered a delicacy. Well, we understand now that it is a unfortunate occurrence because it makes man sick. Now, many nutritionists have felt that animal protein is the ideal protein for man. How did all that start? Back in the early 1900s, Osborne and Mendel, early investigators, were working with rats, and they wanted to see what foods make rats grow best and grow fastest. And they found very soon that cheeses, dairy foods, eggs, and so on were very good for rats, but vegetable proteins didn't do too well. And so they started what they call a PER system, protein efficiency ratio. And they rated the foods. For example, egg was 94%. Well, that's almost 100% efficient. Cheeses, dairy products, meats and fish were very high, 90 or 100%. Potatoes, only 67%. Beans and peas, only 42%. And in the early 1920s, as the investigations proceeded, the investigators said there must be something wrong with vegetable foods. There must be something incomplete compared to animal foods because they don't let rats grow too well. And the term incomplete has been widely misunderstood by present-day nutritionists and dietitians. Present-day nutritionists and dietitians seem to think that the word incomplete means not all their amino acids. It's not a complete protein. Well, that's completely untrue because when the term was first used, we didn't even know how to analyze for all the amino acids. When they said incomplete, they meant that there's something mysteriously missing because they don't make rats grow as fast as the animal proteins. And that, unfortunately, has stayed in the literature, the nutritional and dietetic literature, and so that many nutritionists, many dietitians, are treating their patients like rats. They're referring them and recommending the rat diets instead of giving them human diets. Because when we find, when we talk about human diets, it's much different than the rat diets. For example, when we first started testing with humans to see the difference between vegetable and animal proteins, we get rather surprised. Dr. Knapp, for example, in this Corpus Christi hospital, treated young infants, five to 14 months old, uh, on two different diets. One was a diet primarily vegetable proteins, and the other was primarily uh, milk, a milk diet. And he found it didn't make any difference to these infants. They all both grew just as well as each other as long as they got the same amount of calories. In fact, not only was there no difference in what we call nitrogen retention, that is the amount of protein retained for growth and so on, and no difference in growth rates, but the children actually did better on the vegetable proteins compared to the milk proteins. These children were studied in India by Dr. Reddy. These children were two to five years old, and he was worried about giving them wheat because in animal studies, wheat it has a different amino acid composition and percentage than egg. And since egg is considered as the ideal protein by many because it works well with rats, that we try to model all foods after the pattern of egg. And if the amino acid composition of other foods are not similar to egg, we think that it's inferior. Now, one amino acid called lysine is only half the quantity, half the percentage in wheat as it is in egg. So what Dr. Reddy did was to double the lysine 
uh, content by adding it to the wheat diets to make it the equivalent to egg to see if that helps children grow because it does help animals grow. And after experimenting with these children two to five years old, he found no difference at all in growth as long as they had enough calories. So that didn't work out. Now if you feed rats rice, plain rice, they hardly grow at all. But if you feed them rice and just add one percent chicken, the rats do pretty well. So Dr. Lee at Purdue University decided to take 20-year-old young men and see what happens to humans when you feed them rice diets. And he fed one group 100% rice, and the other group had 15% chicken and 85% rice. Let's see what happened. After a period of many weeks, when he checked them out again, he found that those on the rice alone retained about 20% more protein than those on the rice and 15% chicken. That was a real surprise. And yet the amount of rice that was used is only about 6 or 7% of total calories, one-third of what the average American eats. And that was plenty for these 20-year-old young active people. And more than that, the rice wasn't even worth eating. It was plain white starchy rice, all the minerals taken out, all the vitamins taken out, and all the dietary fiber taken out. Hardly worth eating, and yet the protein of rice was superior to that in rice and chicken. Now humans are somewhat different than rats, although some people think there's no difference between the species, at least nutritionally, there is a difference between the species. Now Crofani tried another test. He took men and put them on eggs as a principal source of calories and principal source of protein. And he found that the men required 9% of the total calories and protein when they're eating eggs to just balance out even. That means that they needed at least 9% to just get the protein they needed, and they had no excess of 9%. Now when he changed their diet to make it two-thirds potatoes and one-third eggs, he found that they needed 30% less protein than they needed on eggs alone. The potatoes made the diet much more efficient for man than the eggs alone, so that when we talk about potatoes being inferior to eggs, that certainly doesn't seem to be true with man. So we learn quite a bit about the question of how humans react on vegetable proteins and animal proteins. There are other problems with high protein diets I ought to discuss. For example, Dr. Linksweiler of the University of Wisconsin has been doing studies on 20-year-old young men, and she feeds them diets of different protein amounts. For example, she did a study where they were on a diet of 8% protein, 16% protein, and 24% protein. And she found on the 8% protein diet, when they had calcium in the amounts from 5 to 1,400 milligrams a day, that's equivalent to about a half a quart of milk to about a quart and a half of milk a day, that at all these levels, at 8% protein, at all these levels, the, these young people absorbed more calcium into their bodies and into their bones than they poured out through the urine. But when they got to 16% total calories and protein, and remember the average American eats 20% of their total calories and protein, at 16% they absorbed nothing from the milk. More calcium went out through the urine than they took in with up to a quart and a half of milk a day. And when they got to 24% total calories and protein, not any of them could maintain what we call a positive calcium balance. Everyone lost tremendous amounts of calcium through the urine compared to what they took in with up to a quart and a half of milk a day. The high protein diets force the body to take calcium out of its bones if you don't have enough calcium in your diet to neutralize the problems of the high protein diet. That's why I believe osteoporosis or weakened bones are so much an epidemic in this country. Because nutritionists tell us and food manufacturers encourage us to eat a high protein diet. This forces calcium out of your bones unless you're drinking five quarts of milk a day and you then develop weak and porous bones. Now these are 20 year old young men who are active because if you're not as active as these young men, you're going to lose calcium out of your bones just from inactivity. So the high protein diet is absolutely the wrong thing for man. The average American having 20% of the total calories and protein, it should be absolutely no more than 
I diet would recommend 13%. And even if you're an experienced dietitian, you'd have a very difficult time figuring out a diet of natural foods that's less than 10% or 9% of total calories and protein. And yet, you can get down as far as 6 or 7% and not be deficient. So that as far as protein deficiency, it's almost impossible to reach that uh, level. That's the least thing we have to worry about in our country is protein deficiency. The big thing we have to worry about is protein excess because not only does the body chase out calcium through the urine, but it chases out magnesium, zinc, iron, phosphorus uh, through the urine too. It minerally depletes you to be on a high protein diet. And not only do you lose the minerals, but you also lose bone structure. Now, Dr. Ralph Nelson, who is Associate Professor of Nutrition at Mayo University, Mayo Medical School, uh, and he works with the dialysis group at Mayo Clinic, tells us that he's seen 20-year-olds that have been on these high-protein diets, a steak for breakfast and so on, already with kidney damage. Athletes, 20-year-old athletes, sort of a tragedy that the high-protein diet has been so misunderstood as to damage kidneys already at 20 years old with our athletes. Now, a high-protein diet has nothing to say good for it, and yet think of all the weight reduction diets. These are high-protein diets. The Atkins diet, the Stillman diet, the Scarsdale diet, and a good reason for these diets uh, is that they do lose weight. And how do they lose weight? Well, they do it very simply. The high-protein diet is only about 75% efficient as far as becoming, going into calories. Almost one-fourth of the protein goes into waste products. We call these ammonia products. It's the same ammonia as you have in smelling salts. If you've ever smelled ammonium smelling salt, you know that it's a pretty, uh, pretty strong material. Well, I can tell you that the ammonia is poisonous to your body cells too. So the first thing that the body does is convert that ammonia byproduct from protein breakdown into what we call urea nitrogen and uric acid. And these now have to be gotten out uh, of the body so the body doesn't become poisonous. And that's the principal constituent of urine. Uh, that's where the term comes from, from the urea nitrogens and the nitrogen waste products from protein waste. Now, on a high protein diet, the problem is that the problems, again, are so toxic to the body, the body must dilute them with a lot of water to reduce their poisonous effect. It takes seven times as much water to dilute the problems of protein uh, digestive breakdown per calorie than it does of carbohydrates or fat. So that with that much water required, and if you're on a high protein diet, you can lose five pounds of weight in 24 hours. How do you do that? Well, you lose four and a half pounds of water to wash out all those poisonous products and maybe a half a pound of tissue weight. So that's why those in high protein diets have almost an immediate weight loss in 24 hours. They've dehydrated themselves. Now, this is sort of a tragedy that children had. It used to be that infants, and especially premature infants, had these high protein milk formulas like soy milk and so on fed to them. And these infants would die in two or three weeks of dehydration until they found out what the problem was. So that you certainly don't want to, for all the many reasons, be on a high protein diet. Now you may say, well, if I can't be on a high protein diet and I can't be on the high fat diet that I'm accustomed to and I can't have all that sugar in my prepared foods, incidentally, people say, well, how can I have so much sugar in my foods? I don't see the sugar. Well, you know, Jell-O has 85% of its calories in table sugar. Uh, the tomato sauce on a pizza you, that some of you had a week or two ago, the tomato sauce has 50% of its total calories in table sugar. There's table sugar in peanut butter. There's table sugar all over. It's all hidden in prepared foods. Now, there's no question about the amount of sugar eaten in our country in fat. Now, you might say, well, you've given me a number of examples of various experiments and so on, on uh, vegetable protein diets and low-fat diets and so on. But uh, these experiments uh, are not necessarily valid for populations. Where is there a population that's on your diet? And how well are they doing? What kind of endurance can you have if you're not permitted to have 
uh, animal protein at least twice a day to give you endurance and strength. That's a popular misconception that animal protein gives you endurance and strength. Well, there are many populations on this diet, and one of the populations that I like to talk about is the Tarahumara Indian population. The Tarahumara Indians are in northern Mexico, about 60,000 people, and they're the blood relatives of the Pima Indians in Phoenix, Arizona. They split off about 400 years ago. Now, the Pimas, as some of you know, in Phoenix, Arizona, eat probably more calories than most people in this country. Probably 2,000 calories a day are eaten in fat alone, mostly lard. Most people get along on 2,000 calories for the whole day's food. They just eat that much in fat. They probably eat 3,500, 4,000 calories a day. Well, most Pima Indians are a little bit obese, but the tragedy of the Pimas is that with their high fat, high cholesterol diet, they have more than their share of the degenerative diseases that Americans have. They have more diabetes than any other group in the country, more arthritis than any other group in the country, and as far as gallstones, it's an epidemic. If you're 25 years old and you're a Pima female, three out of four of the females already have gallstones. Can you believe that? 75% have gallstones when you're 25 years or age or more as a Pima female. In fact, I think that the principal industry in Phoenix area among the Pimas is taking out gallbladders. So it's sort of a tragedy that the Pima Indians are in such bad shape. But let's look at their blood relatives, the Tahamaras. The Tahamaras are on uh, the diet that I recommend to the percent, 13% total calories and protein. About 90% of it is vegetable protein, perhaps 10% is animal protein. They have animal protein two, three, four times a month, not too much, and their foods are very simple foods. Corn, peas, beans, squash, various native plants and fruits, and that's certainly not considered a gourmet diet by many. Well, let's see what sort of endurance these Taramara Indians have. Incidentally, there's no obesity with Taramara Indians. And also, out of the 60,000, they've yet to find the first case of heart disease. So as far as heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, and so on, they just don't happen. They're just not known you know, among the Taramara Indians. But yet, what kind of activities do they have? Well, for example, they love to play a kickball game. They have a wooden ball about the size of a large orange. And they have, let's say, two teams of three men. And each team kicks the wooden ball and runs at the same time. They kick it alternately. And these three men keep kicking this ball alternately. And the idea is to see which team gets to the goal post first with their ball. They run continuously while they do this. It doesn't sound too exciting. It doesn't sound like you require too much endurance for that except that the goalposts are 175 miles away. Now, it doesn't bother them. They simply run day and night for 48 hours until they get there. Now, the Tyramire women, they also have a kickball game, but they don't have time to fool around like the men. They have to take care of the house, raise the children. So when they play their game, they run for only uh, 50 miles. Now, if you get to the level of endurance that the Tyramire Indians have, and you feel like you'd like to have a diet change to increase your endurance, let me know and I'll make a diet recommendation. But if you want to have real endurance, you can certainly do it on this kind of a diet. I don't know of a group around the world that exceeds the Tyramire Indians in their endurance, their lack of diseases. In fact, in Tyramire country, the people there actually have an opportunity to die of old age. That's something very rare in this country. In this country, you die of some disease. Taramaras have been known to do other things. For example, they've been known to run 500 miles in five days. That's quite a trip. Uh, for example, they can actually carry a 100-pound pack in their back, and they only weigh about 125, 130 pounds. They can carry a 100-pound pack in their back, and they can travel over 100 miles in just two or three days with that tremendous pack. So that they're very, very energetic people. And we certainly would like you to be modeled after them. Now, there are populations around the world that we've studied. For example, the Eskimos. You know, the Eskimos are on the highest protein diet of any free-living population. They eat 25% to 30% of the total calories in protein. And as we would expect, 
the Eskimos have one of the highest rates of bone loss from the high protein diet. In fact, they have the highest rate of osteoporosis or weakened and porous bones in the world. And they get it quite early in life so that we can understand why. Now that's in spite of the tremendous calcium intake Eskimos have. They eat as much as 2,500 milligrams a day of calcium, which is like drinking three quarts of milk. But they lose more calcium than they take in with that tremendous amount of calcium intake. So it isn't going to help them. If they're going to be in that high protein diet, they're going to lose their bones. Now there are populations like the Bantus in Africa, on the other hand, that are on a very low protein diet, and they're also on a very low calcium diet. Now, the average Bantu woman who is breastfeeding is only, use, is only taking in about 350 milligrams a day of calcium. Let me tell you how much that is. The National Dairy Council and the uh, experts in our country say that anyone in our country has to have as a minimum 800 milligrams of calcium a day. That's equivalent to about three glasses of milk a day. Well, how can the Bantus be getting only 350 milligrams a day and getting by? In fact, a lactating female, one that, a woman that's breastfeeding in our country, is supposed to have at least a minimum of 1,200 milligrams of calcium a day. So how can the Bantus do it on 350 milligrams a day, almost one-fourth of what our requirement is? Well, first of all, in their low-protein diet, all the calcium they take in stays in the body. It isn't poured out through the urine. The second thing that happens is that the average Bantu woman has about nine children during her lifetime and she breastfeeds these children two years at a time. So she certainly is calling upon her calcium stores to take care of these, and yet they don't have osteoporosis, the children grow up well, the women have strong bones and strong teeth, in much comparison to the problems in our country. So you can find many, many populations on low calcium diets that don't have any problems at all. Well, you might even say to yourself, well, how did it all happen that, that the American standards are so high in calcium? Because after all, 800 milligrams a day is higher than is met in almost any country in the world. How is it that we have the highest requirement for calcium in the world? Uh, is there something wrong with the United States population that they need so much calcium and yet they have such weak bones? We have an epidemic of osteoporosis in our country. Weak bones as we get older in spite of all the tremendous calcium that we have. Well, of course, we can understand that now, that the weak bones come primarily from the very high protein diet that will kick the calcium out of your bones almost no matter how much you eat. But the big problem in our country, and the reason why we require so much calcium is very simple. We have an organization called the National Dairy Council in this country. And the National Dairy Council has only one purpose, and that's to encourage people to have dairy products. It's a pressure group by the dairy associations in this country. And they set the standards. Would you believe that the National Dairy Council provides the major source of nutritional information in the entire school system? Would you believe that the National Dairy Council, just a pressure group, provides more educational material on nutrition than the federal government, the state government, and the local governments in the school system? How is it that a pressure group happens to have a monopoly on nutritional information in our school system. That's why we require so much calcium, because the National Dairy Council said so. In fact, without the National Dairy Council, if you follow their teachings to the extreme, everybody better drink their couple gallons of milk a day or else they're going to fall on their face. No, man was never meant to have milk after their wane. How long, after all, do you think cattle has been domesticated, dairy cattle? Five, six, seven thousand years? That's all. How long do you think man has been evolving? Hundreds of thousands of years? What did man do 10, 15,000 years ago when the National Dairy Council wasn't around telling us we have to have milk? Man never had milk after his wean. There were no dairy animals to give it to him. There's no primate in the world today in the natural state that's ever had dairy products after the wean. That's not a natural part of man's life. In fact, there are many countries in the world that still have no dairy products after the wean. And there's a characteristic about humans and primates and that the enzyme to dig that digests milk disappears after you're four or five years old. We found out that the hard way because when we suddenly realized or thought there was a protein shortage some years ago among the poor people, that is among the Indians, uh, 
the uh, Africans, uh, those in Thailand, and so on. So we shipped hundreds of tons of milk powder to alleviate the so-called protein shortage. Well, later on, we found it wasn't a protein shortage. It was just a calorie shortage. But we had to learn, and this is what happened, for example, in Thailand. The Thailand children were given the dry milk powder uh, uh, made up into milk preparation. <coughs> they developed the diarrhea, and many of the children died from the diarrhea. Why did they develop a diarrhea? Well, they found out that 95% of these Thailand children, after they were four years old, no longer had lactase, the enzyme necessary to digest milk. They lost it. That's a natural state of man. Man was never expected by nature to continue drinking milk products, so the enzyme to digest milk disappears after you're four or five years old. In the United States, 25% of all whites don't have the enzyme to digest milk, 75% of all blacks. Now, dairy products are completely unnatural for man, and unfortunately, uh, the National Dairy Council doesn't know this. Now, there's other minerals and so on that we're told to have, and, uh, but I can tell you that if you just want to make a general statement, you're getting all the minerals you need from the natural foods that you have as recommended in my diet. If you'll eat your normal amount of vegetables and fruits, don't worry about minerals. You're getting all that you need. Now, as far as vitamins and so on, that's a big problem. The vitamin companies are pushing their wares just like it had to be, just like it really was needed. And I could talk about the many vitamins. Uh, I'll simply tell you that as far as vitamin A is concerned, uh, don't worry about vitamin A. If you'll eat a carrot or two a week, you get all the carotene you need. The carotene will convert in the body to vitamin A, and that'll take care of you. So if you eat any amount of green and yellow vegetables, you're getting all the vitamin A you need. As far as vitamin B, eat your whole grains. You get all the vitamin B that you need then. And incidentally, the whole grains all have vitamin E too, far more than you require. Now, as far as vitamin D is concerned, if you're outside, in daylight, it doesn't have to be sunlight, for at least a half hour a day, and you cover up your whole body except for one side of your face, your body will make all the vitamin D you need just by the daylight on your skin. Don't worry about vitamin D, unless you live in a cave and never go out. How about vitamin C? That's so controversial because of Dr. Linus Pauling. How much vitamin C do you actually need? Dr. Pauling says he takes 10,000 milligrams a day. Do you need that much? What do you need? If you had scurvy and you were bleeding in the mouth, in the eyes, in your gums, how much vitamin C do you think you need to cure yourself of scurvy? 1,000 milligrams a day? 10,000? No, all you need is five. Five milligrams a day will cure you in a month of scurvy, completely cure you. And if you had 22 milligrams a day, you would saturate all your tissues and more than 22 milligrams a day, the extra vitamin C would pour out through your urine. Now, one orange has 50 milligrams of vitamin C. So all you need is one orange a week if you had no other green and yellow vegetables. But vitamin C isn't everything. Vitamin C is in bananas, it's in potatoes, it's in practically everything that you're eating and as far as fruits and vegetables. So don't worry about having a shortage. I think that the only question about vitamin C is, since you only need half an orange a day for vitamin C. The question is, how much vitamin C do you want to take? You might put it another way. How expensive do you want your urine to be? Rich in vitamin C that the body can't use. Now, Dr. Pauline has said a lot of things about vitamin C. For example, he said it helps people with heart disease. Somehow it helps clean out their arteries. Well, you know, Stanford University got tired of hearing this. They decided to run a test. And so they took people with high cholesterol levels and high triglyceride or fat levels, and they gave them 4,000 milligrams of vitamin C a day for a couple of months. At the end of the study, there was no change whatsoever in their cholesterol or triglycerides, but they did find something. They found a lot of extra material around that's just the right kind of material to grow cholesterol plaques. So if you want to grow extra cholesterol plaques or boils in your arteries, vitamin C may be a good thing for you. How about the problem of colds? Dr. Pauling is always saying that it's going to help you prevent colds. Well, that's all right until you do what we call a double-blind study where no one knows who takes the vitamin C, so they can't 
uh, sort of guess the results in advance. And this is a study done with close to 900 Navajo children. And those, half those groups, got 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C a day. The other half got what we call placebo, just a, a capsule that looked just like the vitamin C capsule, but nothing in it at all. And they took it for several months. At the end of the period, they checked out how many colds they had and how long they lasted. They found out that the two groups had practically identical amounts of colds. But there was one thing that was strange, and that is those who took the vitamin C, their colds lasted almost twice as long. Well, why should a cold last almost twice as long if you take vitamin C? Well, the recent study has taught us as to why that happens. Because if you take high amounts of vitamin C, this study has taught us that it can paralyze the white blood cells that eat bacteria and viruses. And so we can understand now that if you want to paralyze your white blood cells that eat bacteria and viruses, then maybe it's a good idea to have high amounts of vitamin C. And that certainly would explain to us why those who were on the vitamin C group had a much longer time to cure their cold than those who were off it. Well, there's a lot of problems, and I might say this, I'll just end perhaps by telling you about Dr. Cooper, who was a physician at the 1972 Olympics. And all of his athletes were taking vitamins, and finally Dr. Cooper sort of discouraged, and he said this, quote, Vitamins need to be mentioned as another subject of the great drug myths. We must remember that vitamins act primarily as catalytic agents and are not metabolized, that is, are not used in the body. If a person eats a balanced diet of fresh, well-prepared food, he's getting all the vitamins his body can use. Americans excrete the most expensive urine in the world because it's loaded with so many vitamins. And, of course, then you have to decide how expensive you want your urine to be. So as far as food recommendations and dietary trends, let me say this. The concept of the fat reduction of diet uh, is now being advocated by many professionals. The McGovern Committee recommendations, the new American Heart Association recommendations, and many are now saying you should reduce the amount of fat and cholesterol in your diet. The National Cancer Institute has come in with latest recommendations saying you must reduce fat in your diet and eat more whole grains, fruits, and vegetables. The health professionals are coming more and more to our recommendations, and I think you can take the advantage of being there first. So I certainly would recommend that your diet should be this way. Primarily whole grains. By that I mean whole rolled oats, whole wheat, and when I say whole wheat, I mean not only whole wheat bread, but pizza, lasagna, spaghetti, made to our recipes, and you can eat all you like and never have to worry about gaining an excess weight. Brown rice, corn, barley, millet, the whole grains, these are your principal calorie sources. Fruits and vegetables, beans and peas, potatoes all day long if you like them, and limit your animal protein to a pound or pound and a half a week maximum. And We'd also all like to have you limit your animal protein so your cholesterol level stays below 160 milligram percent. That, the meaning of cholesterol, will be explained in the lecture on heart disease. That's your dietary recommendation. Stay with it, and now you'll be on the same kind of dietary plan that hundreds of millions of people have been on for hundreds of years. It's had a lot of experience, and the countries that have used this dietary approach the degenerative diseases like heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, breast cancer, colon cancer, and so on, are an insignificant part of the death rate compared to in our country where it's a major part of the death rate. Thank you. Heart disease uh, what we might call cardiovascular disease is a major cause of death in the developed countries like the United States, France, England, and those on the high-fat, high-cholesterol diets around the world. Now we have what we call a risk factor concept. That is, what are the risk factors that create the problem for heart disease? What are the major risks that create the greater incidence of heart disease? Well, we used to think about heredity being a major risk. We used to think about stress, inactivity, diet, smoking, high blood pressure, even pesticides and additives. 
Uh, some physicians tell us that if you're a male, you have a higher risk than a female. Well, just what is the evidence on the risk factors? In World War II, we learned quite a few things about heart disease. First of all, many investigators were looking forward to a high, much higher death rate in heart disease in World War II because of the tremendous stress in those companies under the stress of the war. And England and Wales, for example, were studied very closely because we certainly thought that heart disease deaths would increase in England and Wales during the war. And it was quite surprising to find that in 1944, one of the most stressful years of the war, when they had the fire bombing and all the other problems during the uh, peak of the war period, that heart disease deaths dropped to 50% of pre-war levels. And the surprising fact was that when the war was over and the very restricted diet they had during the war was given up and they had their normal diet, heart disease deaths increased and exceeded pre-war levels. In fact, in Austria in 1958, <coughs> uh, when everything was calm, there was no stress because everybody had a job, reconstruction of all the uh, buildings and so on had been finished, and there was strudel in all the Austrian bakeries, and yet heart disease deaths were 700% higher in 1958 than they were in 1944 when Hitler was walking all over the place causing great stress. No, there was another factor there that it was unrelated to stress. And it took a little while for investigators to figure it out. The investigators like Dr. Ansel Keys of the University of Minnesota went through post-war, War II uh, Europe, and others went through and they finally realized that only in those countries in Europe under the war that had restricted substantially their intake of fat and cholesterol foods were those countries where the rates of heart disease dropped. Countries that had no restriction had no drop at all. In the United States, for example, where there was no restriction of foods, there was an increase in heart disease death rate. So we began to see that diet was very greatly related with heart disease uh, in the World War II scene. Now, when World War II was over, the large studies started in our country, and we call them prospective studies, that is, we watch them as they went. And one of the studies was a Framingham study in Framingham, Massachusetts. Here, 5,200 people uh, volunteered to partake in what might be called the largest ongoing study ever done. It's been going on since 1948. And these 5,200 people were given no advice whatsoever. They were simply monitored every two years with a complete physical examination. And the idea was to see what relationships we could discover relating to their onset of diseases. What circumstances perhaps may precipitate their heart disease, or strokes, or diabetes, breast cancer, colon cancer, and so on. And for all these years, we've been monitoring the Framingham study. Another study started around the same time, the Minnesota study, the Albany study, and all of these studies seem to indicate the same relationship. That is that cholesterol level was the principal risk factor correlated with heart disease. And what these studies also found out is that the so-called normal cholesterol levels in our country were only normal for a very sick population, but they certainly were absolutely abnormal as far as cholesterol levels were concerned. For example, the Framingham study found out that if your cholesterol level was 260 milligrams per cent or higher, you had a 400 percent greater incidence of cardiovascular deaths than if it was below 200 milligrams per cent. Yet in our country, if your laboratory gives you out your cholesterol level, they'll have their what they call a normal range, and the normal range will say 160 to 300 or 160 to 330. Now. Many physicians interpret this as saying, if your cholesterol is 300, that's fine. You're in the high normal range. But yet the Framingham study tells us that that's not true. If your cholesterol is over 260, you're in a disastrous range. In fact, the average cholesterol level of the person who drops dead of heart disease is somewhere around 240. So certainly you don't want to be up in that range and still consider it as a normal range. You certainly want to get down below 200 to lessen your risk of heart disease, as the Framingham 
Minneapolis and the Albany studies all tell us. Now, as far as the stress theory, Framingham sort of put that to rest by their very large study on stress. They took 1,822 members of their study, and they started them in 1965 and typed them to what we call type A and type B behavior. This is a classification devised by the experts in the stress uh, heart disease theory, doctors Meyer, Friedman, and Ray Roseman. And they typed them and they found out and reported in 1978, 13 years later, and here's what they say. The Framingham type A behavioral pattern and other psychosocial measures were not related to the level of heart disease risks as determined by the Framingham study. So here we find that after 13 years that there was no relationship with stress in 1800 and 30 and 22 people. Now this is the largest population I believe ever analyzed for stress and it certainly is going to make it very hard for the stress advocates to show that stress is anything but a very small risk factor in heart disease. A little bit later Cleveland Clinic came up with their angiographic studies. Now an angiogram is an x-ray of the inside of your arteries and they were particularly interested in the coronary arteries. Cleveland Clinic is almost where uh, the art of angiography or x-rays of coronary arteries was discovered or first evolved. Dr. Mason Soans there uh, was the man that devised a particular catheter, or a hollow tube that goes up through your artery to inject the dye so that you can take the x-rays. So they've done thousands of those at Cleveland Clinic and they reported one large study of 17 to 39 year old men, 723 men. These all had coronary angiograms, and they, by analyzing this data, found out there was a very specific relationship between the amount of coronary artery closure and their cholesterol level. In fact, this was the most sp specific relationship. Now, if you remember, you have only three vessels feeding your heart. These are called the coronary vessels, and you have a right coronary artery, and then you have two left coronary arteries that are really branches of a short main coronary artery, but these two left coronary arteries then and the right are the three vessels and their branches that feed the entire heart muscle. And your these are rather small little arteries. They're probably the size of a pencil in diameter, but that's all that you get for all the exercise you have to do. So I think since they were small, nature intended for them never to close, but nature never having contended with the modern high-fat, high-cholesterol diet, uh, made them probably too small for modern days. But nevertheless, Cleveland Clinic found that the closure of the coronary arteries is directly related to the cholesterol level, and here's what they found. First of all, they defined it as a significant closure. That means more than 50% of the arteries closed. And they said these young men had significant closure. If their cholesterol level was less than 200, only 20% of the men had significant closure, more than 50%. If it's less than 200, but if their cholesterol level averaged 235, almost half the men had significant closure. What a jump, and 235 is considered very normal. In fact, President Carter's physician recently said, Jimmy's in perfect health, his cholesterol is 239. Well, that's certainly not a good number when you consider that when you get around 240, that's the average cholesterol that guy that drops dead of heart disease. And here among these men, 17 to 39, a cholesterol 235 means that half of them have at least 50% closure of all three of their coronary arteries. So cholesterol level turns out to be a very important indicator of artery closure. In fact, Cleveland Clinic did a double-blind test that means neither the patients coming in or the doctors who evaluated them initially ever met the patients uh, in the beginning. And what they did was this. Sixty patients coming into the Cleveland Clinic were involved in what we call a double-blind test then. And all that was taken was their age, their cholesterol level, and their triglyceride level. Triglycerides are a kind of fat in the bloodstream. And based on this, the doctors who had never had to see the patients went to their prediction tables because of all the many angiograms they'd done, they'd gotten now relationships between artery closure and cholesterol level. The age was important because it told them how long these men had been to that cholesterol level. 
and they made an analysis as to which of these men would have closed, significantly closed coronary arteries. And out of the 60 men, they made their predictions, wrote them down, and went to a sealed envelope. The men went into the catheterization laboratories, had their angiograms, and they were evaluated, and they were tabulated, and then they were compared with the original predictions. Out of the original 60 predictions, 59 out of 60 predictions were 100% accurate. That's a 98% degree of predictive accuracy. There's hardly a test in the world that's that accurate, and yet Cleveland Clinic did it just based on their cholesterol levels primarily to determine their artery closure. So if anyone tells you that total cholesterol is not predictive of artery closure, we can refer them to the Cleveland Clinic studies. Now, there is a great confusion over what is a normal cholesterol level, and I think perhaps the confusion is because cholesterol levels in our country are taken as an average. If we take a population 20 to 30 years old, 30 to 40, 40 to 50, and we take a population that doesn't have symptoms yet. They can be dying the next day of a heart attack, but today they still seem to be okay. We take this population, we take their various values, cholesterol level, triglycerides, glucose, and so on, and these are the normal range. All these people comprise a normal range. And in our country, the so-called normal range of cholesterol, as I mentioned, is 160 to 330, because that's what the average person has. But remember, the average person in our country is very sick of heart disease, but the symptoms haven't come yet. After all, when you have a nation where 52% of all the deaths are from heart disease, you know we're a very sick country. It's an epidemic. So certainly you wouldn't want these countries' levels as a normal level. You'd want to go to countries where heart disease is unknown. And when you have heart disease where it's unknown and go to those countries, you'll find that cholesterol levels do not exceed 160 milligrams per cent. And that should be our aim, to bring our cholesterol levels down below 160 if we want to avoid heart disease. Practically no exceptions have ever been found in countries under 160 that have any heart disease at all. There has been one exception, and that's the Maasai in Africa, who have cholesterol levels of 135, and yet they eat the same amount of cholesterol and fat as we do in our country. But Dr. George Mann of Vanderbilt University found out the reason for that. They eat a lot and drink a lot of milk products. It's soured milk, and it turns out that milk has a cholesterol-lowering effect. It depresses the cholesterol out of the blood, but obviously goes right into the arteries because in Dr. Mann's mass eyes that he examined, they have such massive plaques in their arteries that uh, it's far worse than American arteries. They, their plaque starts 15 years earlier than American arteries. So it's no great advantage for them to have a cholesterol 135 and depress it artificially. But if you're on a diet where you don't have artificial depressants like the high amount of milk or polyunsaturated fats, and then you can pretty much depend on your cholesterol level being a true indicator of the state of your arteries. Various authorities have told us that if you reduce cholesterol level, even though you have a high cholesterol level, down below 150, you have a good chance for even having your artery closure reverse. And that's something we're going to talk about because first I'd like to then talk to you about artery walls. What does an artery wall look like? Well, if you can picture a tire, because an artery wall has three principal layers. There's an inside layer called an intima, and then there's a middle layer called a media, and the media is made up of primarily muscle cells. That's the muscle layer. That's the uh, layer that squeezes the artery so that it can divert blood from one place to another so you can decide where you want the major part of your blood. After you want to eat your dinner, you like a lot of blood to your stomach to digest the food. And when you want to run, you want it to your legs. And so the arteries do that with the muscle layer. The outside layer of the artery is called the adventitia. It's the protective layer that keeps it all together. Now the adventitia has its own circulatory system that feeds all its little cells. <clears throat> But the media layer and the intima layer have no circulatory system. They have to depend upon the, uh, the oxygen and their food coming through the inside layer of the artery in order to be able to uh, get all the oxygen and the food they need. Now, the way that works is that the inside layer of the artery, called the intima, has a single cell lining called an endothelial layer. And this single cell lining acts like a filter 
to let all these food products and oxygen filter through into the two inside layers. And all the blood flows through the endothelial layer. Endothelial means inside skin, it's the inside skin of the artery. Now the problem with that is that as long as you have enough oxygen in the blood, you have no problems. But what if your blood is low in oxygen because you're a smoker and you're breathing carbon monoxide and the carbon monoxide paralyzes your red blood cells so the red blood cells can't pick up oxygen, so you'd have a low oxygen level there. What if you have a low oxygen level because you're on a normal American high-fat diet? The high-fat diet gets into the bloodstream and the fat acts like an adhesive, covers all the little cells with fat, and they start to stick together. When they stick together, they form clumps of cells, and the clumps of cells can act it through the blood vessels, and when a cell is clumped together, it can't pick up oxygen. So for these reasons, you could have a low oxygen level. And when that happens, and the blood level drops too low in oxygen, gets too much fat in the blood, there is not enough oxygen to get right up to the last little cells in the media that require it. So the media cries out some way we don't understand and tells the endothelial layer, that inside skin of the artery, to let more stuff come in. Say, so we're suffocating back here. Let more stuff come in. So what happens at the inside skin, the endothelial layer, becomes porous. It changes its permeability. It sort of develops pores. It opens up its spaces so more stuff can come in. And once it does this, that's a mistake because now certain particles traveling in the bloodstream made of fat and cholesterol can get through the endothelial layer inside the artery wall. In nature, this never happened before because never did it happen that man ever had low oxygen levels in his blood due to smoking and high fat diets. Uh, but now in modern times, that's one of the problems. And when this happens, these fat and cholesterol particles that are so high in the blood because we eat so much cholesterol, get inside the artery wall. And when they get inside, it's just like salt on an open wound. There's so much turmoil and so much confusion inside the artery wall when these cholesterol particles get inside that the media cells travel and they start to eat these intruders. Now, normally the media cells don't eat anything at all. They're just muscle cells. But the confusion and the problems and the turmoil that happens when these cholesterol particles called beta lipoprotein particles get inside the artery wall, the media cells go out to eat them. And they eat them, they start to bloat with them. And they eat and eat and eat until they're so swelled that they look like globs of fat. In fact, we call them foam cells because they look like fat. And one of the first signs of this problem is what we call a fatty streak. You can see it in an eight-year-old child. There's a streak when you open up their arteries, they're killed in some accident, and you open up their artery and you got about a half inch long streak, about a sixteenth of an inch high and a sixteenth of an inch wide. It looks like a fatty streak. It's not a fatty streak. It's right under the inside skin and it's filled, it's filled with fatty uh, laden media cells. Now, at this rate, if you cut down the fat in the blood, all that fat can reabsorb and disappear. All the cells are still alive. But if you permit high quantities of fat and cholesterol into the blood and permit this to, con to continue, what happens is that these media cells eat so much until they burst. Because in nature, there are no rules. They don't know what to do, and they just keep eating until they burst. And when they burst, they vomit their fat and cholesterol all over the other cells, and that starts to form a dead mass of fat, cholesterol, dead cells, and so on, right inside the artery wall. Now, more and more media cells come into the space, and as they do, the inside skin, that endothelial layer, starts to bulge. And as it bulges, it's like a little boil growing. And the greater the bulge, the less room there is for blood to flow, because as it bulges, it bulges right out into the area where blood is flowing. This bulge is called a plaque. Technically, it's called an atheroma. In Greek, the term atheroma means gruel, G-R-U-E-L, like cream of wheat. And the reason for that is that the, when you take one of these plaques and you open them up, the stuff inside looks just like cream of wheat. It looks like uh, uh, cornmeal. It's, uh, that's why we call it a gruel, because it's soft, mushy stuff. And that's what the inside of a plaque looks like. Now, it used to be they called this kind of problem arteriosclerosis. 
but that means hardening of the arteries. Well, that wasn't accurate. So they decided they'd better find another name for this. And that's why this term now, adapted from the Greek atheroma, meaning gruel, they call atherosclerosis, which means hardening of the arteries with a mushy deposit. It makes it consistent with the old term arterial sclerosis, but of course it doesn't make any sense because you don't harden arteries with a mushy deposit. But yet that's what atherosclerosis means. And the atheroma, or the plaque as we call it, is a boil, essentially, of cholesterol and cholesterol products and fat in it. Now, in some people, this boil, the cholesterol plaque, grows and gets very large. And sometimes it gets so large it covers 80 to 90 percent of the inside of that artery. That means only 10 percent of the space is left for blood to flow. Sometimes it closes up the artery completely. So it's sort of a tragedy. And the real tragedy is that the average 20-year-old in our country has at least a 20% closure of all his coronary arteries as an average at 20 years old. So you cannot say to a 20-year-old that you, when you get older you'll have heart disease. What you have to say to him is that you're 20 years old and you have heart disease. It just hasn't broken out in the symptoms yet. A lot of 20-year-olds have at least one of the three coronary arteries 100% closed already. You read every day in the papers about a 15-year-old boy dropping dead on a basketball court from a heart attack. 25-year-olds are getting very common. 35-year-olds, that's almost an epidemic, having them die of heart attacks. So artery disease is something that happens from the time you're in your teens and continues through your life, which is shorter than it should be because the artery disease kills you. Now, in primates monkeys, we learn quite a bit about artery disease. In fact, we learn how to produce artery disease by feeding them high-fat, high-cholesterol diets. One of the first studies was Dr. Mark Armstrong of the University of Iowa Medical School. Dr. Armstrong put his monkeys on two different diets. One, just a diet similar to what you might say would be grains, fruits, and vegetables, and the other, the same, except he added cholesterol. And it took a period of time for those monkeys to have artery changes. In 17 months when he evaluated his monkeys, he found that those on the cholesterol diet had their coronary arteries two-thirds closed. Those without the cholesterol had no closure at all. So he then took the cholesterol out of the diet of those who were on cholesterol, and after a period of several months, the two-thirds closure, 65% closure of the coronary arteries, now became only 16% closed. That was a reduction of almost 75% in the closure of the arteries. It was the first time on a scale like this it had ever been demonstrated that primates, and that's what man is, man is a primate, can close their arteries with too much cholesterol, and if you take the cholesterol away, can reopen them considerably. After the primate study, uh, people criticized that, well, the Dr. Armstrong gave them too much cholesterol, and their cholesterol level went up to 600 milligrams per cent. Uh, that wouldn't happen with man. Well, that can happen with man. Uh, Stephenson, the explorer, the Arctic explorer that some of you may have remembered some years ago, went on an all-meat diet under the auspices of the American Meat Institute, and his cholesterol went up above 600, and it went up almost to 700. So you certainly can get cholesterol levels up if you're going to eat enough meat and enough cholesterol. No, primates and humans act very much the same. Fortunately, uh, we now know that it's possible to reverse artery closure in humans. We have studies proven by coronary angiogram and other angiogram studies. We have demonstrated reversal in not only the coronary arteries, but that's been demonstrated by Dr. Henry Buckwell, University of Minnesota, medical school, uh, reversal of uh, kidney artery closure, demonstrated by Dr. Basta, who at that time was with the University of Iowa Medical School, femoral artery in the legs reversal, demonstrated by Dr. David Blankenhorn, also demonstrated by our own studies. We've also demonstrated reversal of iliac artery closure. So there's no question that narrowed or closed arteries can reverse themselves and reopen in humans. The question is, how do we get it to apply for the whole general population? Well, studies that have indicated how to lower cholesterol level, of course, are around, and there are certain population differences right in the United States. For example, 
you have the Seventh-day Adventists. Now, they're on three different kinds of diets. They're on the regular American diet. They're on a sort of uh, dairy products and vegetarian diet. They're on a sort of a pure vegetarian diet. And the, the Seventh-day Adventists are a good group because they're mixed with the whole population. And we find that in that population, those on the lowest cholesterol intake have the least amount of heart disease and also the least amount of breast cancer. Those on the highest cholesterol intake among the Seventh-day Adventists have the highest amount of artery disease and the highest amount of breast cancer. So it's a disaster for those on the regular American diet, and it's much better for those that have much less cholesterol. So there are population differences there. As far as lowering cholesterol level, Dr. Costelli has talked about his vegetarians in Boston who have cholesterol levels below 150 milligrams per cent and seem to do very well. Now, since we realize that cholesterol level is a principal risk factor, that's certainly been documented in the Framingham studies and in the Cleveland Clinic studies and in the many studies, efforts have been made to drop cholesterol level in our country. And in the early 1950s, the late 1940s, a number of investigators used a diet that was used in World War II in the food-restricted countries that restricted their fat and cholesterol very considerably. One of the earliest studies was done in 1948 by Dr. Morrison, Lester Morrison in Los Angeles, where he took 100 people, 100 people with heart disease, put half of them on the diet, the food-restricted diet of World War II, and the other half on their conventional diet. The average cholesterol level was about 312 when they started, and for those who did not change your diet, it stayed there. And for those who did change your diet to the lower fat, lower cholesterol diet of World War II, their cholesterol dropped from 312 to 220. And his study ran for 12 years. And after 12 years, all those on the regular American diet had died. But on the low fat, low cholesterol diet, almost half of them were still alive. It was the first time that it was ever demonstrated that if you'll change your diet, you have a chance to extend your life and improve your health, uh, even though you've had serious heart disease. Dr. John Goff and Dr. Lyon in San Francisco in 1952 uh, did a study where they had a number of people on the diet of World War II uh, and compared that to the conventional American diet. And again, there was a big difference. Uh, there was a 75% drop in death rate for those on the lower fat, lower cholesterol diet compared to those on the regular American diet. When you take all the low fat, low cholesterol diets that were done between 1948 and 1970, there's about a 50% drop in death rate compared to the conventional American diet. Now, the American Heart Association that was looking for some recommendation should have used those uh, experiences in giving their diet recommendations but they didn't do it. They were worried that Americans perhaps were not smart enough to want to change their diet, even if it meant saving their lives from heart disease. And they were looking for some easy way out that Americans would comply in. And so they were watching closely, and in the late 50s, Dr. Lawrence Kinsell of the University of California at Berkeley was able to demonstrate that if you use polyunsaturated fats, you can indeed lower your cholesterol in your blood. The only problem is at that time, we saw that it lowered cholesterol in the blood, but we didn't know where the cholesterol went to when it went out of the blood. Today we know, and we're very unhappy about it, because it goes in your tissues, your organs, and even into your arteries. That's not the place to get rid of your cholesterol. Well, after the American Heart Association decided to give their first recommendation back in 1961, they simply said, we have a dietary recommendation for the American public. And the dietary re recommendation is simple. It's don't change your diet. All you have to do is change the kind of fat that you use. You use polyunsaturated fats instead of saturated fats. The polyunsaturated fats are those liquid fats like corn oil, safflower oil, and so on. And you use those instead of the animal fats like lard and butter and so on. And that was the whole recommendation. Now, that's been modified through the years where they ask you to cut your cholesterol a little bit. But principally, it's a high-fat, high-cholesterol diet through all these years, stressing polyunsaturated fats. Now, the American, diet, the American Heart Association diet has been tested through the years. 
And they've had many tests uh, in Helsinki, uh, London, uh, Oslo. In fact, the largest one they've had was at the Wadsworth VA Hospital in Los Angeles. And that one was 846 men. It was an eight-year trial, very elaborately set up. Uh, Dr. Seymour Dayton who ran the study. After the end of the period of time, when they counted the deaths, they're amazed to find there's only a 2% difference in deaths, not significantly different. That was a tragedy. But they also found that those on the American Heart Association diet had 50% more cancer. Well, that I can question because I don't think there's enough data to support that. But they did find that those on the American Heart Association diet had three times as many gallstones for them. Well, there's no question about that. They counted them when they took out the gallbladders. So the Heart Association diet didn't really help this man at all. In fact, if you take all the American Heart Association trials all together, you find that for every 100 people that die on the regular American diet, you only s save five lives. 95 people die on the American Heart Association diet. But if you go to the low-fat, low-cholesterol diet of Dr. Morris and Dr. Goffman, only 50 people will die. A drop of 50% compared to 5% on the American Heart Association diet. The 5% drop on the American Heart Association diet is not considered to be statistically significant. That is, it could have happened by chance. Therefore, the critics all say that the American Heart Association diet has failed to demonstrate any change in heart disease deaths. And they're absolutely right. It's too moderate, and in getting major compliance to their diet, they also got minimum effectiveness. Now, the state of Israel, it was found, it was on the American Heart Association diet just by chance. It was self-selected. In fact, they consumed the largest amount of polyunsaturated fats in the entire world. And when the Department of Agriculture discovered this, they were thrilled because here's a million people right on the American Heart Association diet. What a marvelous chance to test them against some country who is on a high saturated fat diet. And where do they find that country but the state of West Germany? The two countries were teamed up in a race to see who had fewer heart disease deaths. It's a three-year study sponsored and paid for by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. After the study was over, the sad news came in that the state of Israel had far more deaths from heart disease than the state of West Germany. How is that possible? Well, of course, the state of Israel consumed more fat than the state of West Germany, and they also had other problems. Dr. Blondheim, who ran the study for the state of Israel, had this to say. He said, I can't understand it, he said, because even our eggs were fried in polyunsaturated fat. Well, he better understand that egg yolks are the most potent source ordinarily eaten of cholesterol. And you can't have egg yolks unless you want to close your arteries. In fact, Dr. Blandheim is a little confused because in a recent study that was published, a recent article, Dr. Blandheim was quoted as saying that the Yemenites, who are desert uh, dwellers outside of Israel, and heart disease is almost unknown among the Yemenites in their native culture, he said they come in and they come in on their primitive diet, which is very low in fat and so on. They come into Israel and we put them on the American Heart Association diet that's designed to stop heart disease, and in 10 years they all develop heart disease. How is that possible? They come in in their inferior diet without heart disease and they get it on our superior diet as the American Heart Association diet. Well, Dr. Blondheim will have to understand that the American Heart Association diet certainly can precipitate and cause heart disease. With the Yemenite diet being so low in fat and cholesterol, uh, you'd have a very low instance of heart disease. So there's a lot of misunderstanding about diets. In fact, the very largest American Heart Association study ever done is the Mr. Fit study, and that's being done right now. Mr. Fit stands for Multiple Risk Factor Intervention Trial. And the idea is that there's more than risk, one risk factor in heart disease. In this case, we're considering three risk factors. We're considering high cholesterol levels, high blood pressure, and smoking. And the three risk factors, the multiple risk factor study, is trying to reduce three risk factors. First, we want to cut smoking down if we can. Two, we want to drop blood pressure, 10% in the bottom number in the diastolic. But the first and most important thing is they want to reduce cholesterol level 10% in six years, because it's a six-year study. It's a very modest goal. 
reducing cholesterol level 10% in six years, when on our diet we can reduce cholesterol level 10% in six days. So that you wonder why so modest the goal, but it's not difficult to see. It's a six-year study, 12,000 men are in this program, 6,000 on the regular American diet, 6,000 on the American Heart Association diet. Let's look at the American Heart Association data after three years, because the study is now in its fourth year. They were amazed to find that after three years, and these are my unofficial uh, sources telling me this, that the cholesterol change of those on the American Heart Association diet compared to the regular diet was only 4% lower. Well, if you're only going to drop 4% in three years, you're never going to make 10% in six years. Well, I think that what happened is that the dietitians running the diet got very concerned, especially when some of the participants in the Mr. Fit study came to our center and they dropped their cholesterol 25% in just three weeks. So they came back and they contaminated their samples. They said, gee, we worked so hard getting our cholesterol to drop 4% in three years. We go to this place in California, we drop it 25% in three weeks. So a lot of people around the Mr. Fit group, a lot of the participants started to adapt my diet. And what the dietitians finally decided to do after three years was to make a dietary recommendation change and they did it by themselves. They wrote it up in their own manual and distributed it under their name, and here's what it said. They said that new information tells us that if you want to be more effective in dropping your cholesterol level, you've got to consume less than 100 milligrams of cholesterol a day. Well, that's a very familiar figure. Where did it come from? I don't quite know, but that's the figure I quote in my book, and I've quoted my book since 1974, and I quote in my latest book. And that's our book recommendation. And I've talked to a number of these dietitians, and I said, where did you get the support data for that? And they said, well, we got out of the medical literature. I said, I don't know of any medical literature that shows any large population on this diet of a hundred, less than 100 milligrams a day. And finally, the dietitian said, well, we looked at your data too. They certainly did, because there's nothing else that would tell them that this is such an effective cholesterol-lowering diet unless they looked at our information. Well, the nice thing is that all 6,000 people on the American Heart Association and the Mr. Fitz study have now been recommended to use our cholesterol recommendations. In fact, when one of our participants wrote the American Heart Association and wrote to Dr. Mary Winston, who was chief of nutrition uh, some months ago, he said, uh, how about this new dietary recommendation that they're using at the Mr. Fitz study? Well, Dr. Winston said, I don't know anything about it. But a couple of months later, when they wrote to Dr. Mary Winston, she says, yes, yes, I know about it now. And there's no question that this new dietary recommendation of less than 100 milligrams a day of cholesterol is a far more effective way to reduce cholesterol level than the present recommendation we're giving them on the American Heart Association diet. Dr. Winston realized, of course, that you've got to drop the cholesterol intake if you're going to lower cholesterol level. Now, why isn't the American Heart Association giving this nice advice to all the people in the country? It's going to take time. The study has another two years to go, and it's going to take a year to evaluate the results. So in about four years from today, it'll come out in the medical literature. Fortunately, you don't have to wait four years for the American Heart Association to tell you to follow my recommendations. You can do it now. Now, there have been other interesting things about how to lower risk factors. If diet fails, which it has with the American Heart Association, the other thing we can do is give you drugs to lower your cholesterol level. And that was tried, and many drugs have been used to lower cholesterol level. Thank you. And uh, because of the worry about drugs, because they do have side effects, the very large coronary drug project was started. 8,300 men were put on several drugs of lower cholesterol level. They were also put on placebo. That is, a number of men were put on just an empty capsule that looked like all the capsules that had the drugs, but this had no drug at all. It was a five-year double-blind study. That means that neither the doctors who gave the capsules to these men or the men themselves knew what was in the capsules. 
All the capsules were coded with special numbers, and nobody knew but the investigators that held the key of the code. Five-year study, the men originally came in with cholesterol levels averaging 250. At the end of the study, they dropped 6%, 235. And they had figured out that if the men had dropped their cholesterol from 250 to 200, which is a 20% drop, about half the deaths could have been avoided. Such a tragedy. A 20% drop in five years, and we can drop your cholesterol 25% in three weeks. Well, the tragedy of the Mr. Fitz study was that the placebo, the empty capsule, did as good a job in preventing deaths and preventing side effects as all the drugs combined. In fact, the placebo was just as good as any of them. None of the drugs helped you if you didn't change your diet. Now, if drugs don't work and diet doesn't work, what do you have left? Well, you have left the illegal bypass surgery, sort of a desperate move to drop cholesterol level. Would you believe that it's being advocated that you slice out a third of your small intestine, your nice 20-foot small intestine, you take seven feet out just to drop your cholesterol level? Well, that's something that the federal government is paying for to test right now. They're actually paying for millions of dollars to have a 1,000 people have their intestines sliced to drop cholesterol level. And when I first found out about this from the National Institutes of Health, I was just shocked. And I saw a recent article in the Los Angeles Times because Dr. David Blankenhorn of University of Southern California is recruiting a third of the patients. And the reporter said to Dr. Blankenhorn, well, if you want to reduce cholesterol level to stop heart disease, why don't you go to the American Heart Association diet? Dr. Blankenhorn said, I know, but uh, that diet will only reduce cholesterol 6 or 8%. We need at least a 20% drop in cholesterol to reduce heart disease and to re show a reversal of artery closure. And, he s and the reporter said, well, do you think this operation of slicing out the intestine was going to do it? He said, oh, yes. He says that will drop at 25 to 35%. And the reporter says, uh, do you see this as a way for all Americans to, uh, in effect, become uh, gutless? And Dr. Blankenhorn said, uh, no, he said, there aren't enough surgeons to go around to slice everyone's intestine. But if it works out, we'll find a nice drug to lower cholesterol level. So even after all this work showing that drugs won't work, the moderate American Heart Association diet don't work, Dr. Blankenhorn still thinks the American people are not smart enough. If they're given a real diet that'll lower the risk factors and lower the cholesterol level, that they'll follow it. So we've got to try and convince the health professionals that the average public is far smarter than they think, that if they're given the right advice and enough information, they'll select a diet to save their lives. How about exercise? Many people feel that if you exercise, you can forget about everything else. Well, there are examples for this. For example, in East Finland, the number one in heart disease deaths in the whole world. And who are these people that are dying there? Well, they're lumberjacks, lean, muscular lumberjacks. They're eating about 5,000 calories a day to keep up their energy, but it's mostly dairy products. Tremendous death rate. They have more widows there in the 30 to 40 year old range than any place in the country any place in the world. And in North Karelia, which is one of the worst death rate areas for heart disease in East Finland, in fact, North Karelia has been number one in Finland in heart disease deaths, they decided to take the matters in their own hands, and they've cut down on their fat and cholesterol, and in four years' time, instead of number one, they became number four. That's what you ought to do. It's just a little community, a little county of 180,000 people, but that's the way to do it. How about marathon runners? Does running save you? Certainly not. Every day you find a story about a marathon runner dropping dead while he's running. I know I remember the case of Goodloe Byron. Uh, he's a Bethesda, Maryland uh, um, congressman, and he had run six marathons in his 40s, and one day he was doing a nice, easy 10-mile run, and he just dropped dead while he's running. They opened him up and looked at his arteries, and they were a massive, filled with plaques. Wonder how he's able to run at all. No, running isn't going to save you. If you're going to be on the American diet and you want to do vigorous exercise, don't bother having yourself examined by a physician. Just see a good lawyer and make sure your will is in order. How is it that the experts are so confused? Recently, there was a large press release by the National <coughs> Academy of Science saying that cholesterol doesn't even count. 
uh, Dr. Olson who wrote the report, and Dr. Olson's convinced that everybody should have their share of eggs and meat and so on. The fact that he uh, is a consultant and gets paid by the very agencies he wants you to eat their products, like the Meat Institute and the Egg Institute, of course, doesn't affect his mind. Uh, he eats his eggs uh, even if they weren't working for them. And he confused a lot of people because he completely ignored the scientific evidence in this country and abroad. He only examined the American Heart Association studies that everybody knows has failed, and he said, well, the American Heart Association studies have failed, therefore, all diets will fail for heart disease. And that's unfortunate. When you have experts like that, that confuse the public. I should say that as far as examples, the best example would be as I mentioned at other times, the Taramara Indians, because there is a group exactly on the diet I prescribe. They have tremendous endurance. They can run 150 miles without stopping. Heart disease is an unknown quantity with the Taramara Indians, and with probably 35 populations around the world that have been studied. So as far as heart disease is concerned, we've learned quite a bit. And I think probably the main thing we've learned about heart disease is that it's preventable, and in many cases, it's reversible. And if we go to the experts, like Dr. Robert Whistler, University of Chicago Medical School, and Dr. William Costelli of the Framingham Study, uh, they're going to convince us that if we can get cholesterol levels lowered so that your cholesterol is below 150 to 160 when you're 50 years old, or I might say below 100 plus your age with a maximum of 160, that your thoughts about heart disease would not have to frighten you because the chance of you getting heart disease in are very, very, very slight. Certainly a fraction of what's happening in our country. You would be well advised to take the words of the experts, the progressive experts, and the results of our kind of studies and the many studies around the world that have been done and to follow it. Now, this dietary approach, as I advocate, is now being accepted by large medical institutions. For example, UCLA has now modeled a program called Cheer After Our Diet. UC Davis is using our diet almost exactly as it is to lower cholesterol levels most effectively. Doctors around the country are using this diet. I would say there might be over 3,000 doctors using this diet now for their patients. And we send them little diet pamphlets to help them prescribe the diet to their patients. So there's no question we're getting acceptance all around the country, in fact, around the world, using this dietary approach. It certainly demonstrates that thousands and thousands of people are interested, if they can only get the information, to change their diet to save their lives. In fact, I think the people are far ahead of the health professionals in adopting these ideas in order to help themselves. And I hope that in the period to come, when the American Heart Association is really forced to recommend to the American people the recommendations they now are recommending in their Mr. Fit study, the largest study they've ever had, by that time, and that's a little late though, that'll help the rest of the country. But as far as you're concerned, you know what to do right now. You've got to get your cholesterol level down below 160, and heart disease then should be something that is just a vague memory. I'd like to give you some insights into the relationships of nutrition to angina. Angina, as many of us realize, is simply an insufficient blood flow through the coronary arteries to the heart. The heart, after all, is a muscle like the muscle in your calf or the muscles in your arm. And in order to be able to function, must have adequate blood flow. Now, you can have a certain amount of blood flow that would be adequate, but if the oxygen quality of the blood is low, it's in effect having not enough blood flow. There's a few ways we can cut oxygen uh, quality of the blood down. One is by smoking, <coughs> because the carbon monoxide in cigarettes uh, chemically make a bond to the red blood cell and paralyze it for 12 hours at a time. So it's very easy to paralyze 5, 10, 15 percent of all the red blood cells in your blood circulation, and this way dropping your oxygen carrying capacity very considerably. So smoking itself can give you angina even if you're sitting in a comfortable chair. Now in the same way that smoking damages your red blood cell, 
high-fat meals. The typical American kind of meals where almost half your total calories in fat creates a similar problem. The fats get into the bloodstream as you digest them and the blood gets so coated with fat particles all over that the fat actually coats the inside of the artery linings, coats all the cells, and the red blood cells you have a fine layer of fat all around them. The fat acts as an adhesive and when two red blood cells hit each other, as they frequently do, they stick together and pretty soon you have a clump of red cells stuck together. Now normally the red blood cells being twice the size of the smallest blood vessels they have to go through, usually bend themselves in half and slither through the small capillaries. But when they're stuck together, they can't bend themselves anymore. It's like a solid cork. It's like a cork in a bottle. It goes to the small capillary, which is, again is only half the size of the red blood cell, and just blocks it and it stays there. Now as the red blood cells are stuck together, those surfaces cannot pick up oxygen. And of course the parts of the body where the circulation is completely cut off because the clumps of cells are not permitting circulation become starved for oxygen, starved for blood. That too can create angina. We know by Dr. Peter Quo's work. Uh, Peter Quo was a Philadelphia cardiologist when he did a study and he took 14 angina patients and he asked them to come to his office and he said, don't have breakfast, I'm going to feed you. And what he did was to tape them up with electrodes from electrocardiographic equipment, monitor their blood to see how much fat was in their blood, and then he fed them a glass of heavy cream. Four to five hours after the glass of heavy cream, he registered 14 angina attacks, and yet they were just comfortable in his office, doing nothing special, just letting the fat get into the blood, make the cells sticking together, block the small vessels, and creating coronary insufficiency. The electrocardiographic results also demonstrated coronary insufficiency, whereas in the beginning, there wasn't any. Now, Dr. Crow wanted to see if it was the amount of fluid that these people had or what it was, so a short time later, he gave the same patients a drink that had no fat at all, but the same amount of fluid and the same amount of calories. Four to five hours after the test, there wasn't a single angina attack, not a single abnormality in the electrocardiogram. We've established through the years that fat is an enemy if you have a circulatory problem. Other <coughs> investigators like Dr. Meyer Friedman at Mount Zion Hospital in San Francisco had invited 41 firemen to come to his clinic. And what he did was to give them a glass of heavy cream to drink. He was surprised to find when he looked in the small vessels around the eye that four to five hours after the drink, when the fat had come into the system, and block small vessels, that he could count 25 blockages in the little area that he was observing with his microscope. About nine hours after the fat had been taken in, the cream had been drunk, the blockages resolved and the fat left the blood. On another day, he took the same firemen and decided to give them polyunsaturated fat, safflower oil, because it was around this time the American Heart Association was saying, change your diet. But the only change you have to make is the kind of fat you use. Use polyunsaturated fats instead of saturated fats like butter and, mar and uh, lard and margarine. Use corn oil, use safflower oil. So Dr. Friedman wanted to see what happens when you give them safflower oil. He made a drink about the same amount of fluid, the same amount of fat as he did the butter fat, the cream drink, gave it to the fireman, and four to five hours after the drink was amazed to find that the amount of blockages were identical as with the butter fat. The fat made the cells stick together and block the small capillaries just as effectively as if it were cream. So it didn't make any difference whether it's saturated or polyunsaturated. The vessel blockage happened just as well. And at that time, Dr. Friedman had a warning in his article that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in which he said, the recommendations should not substitute one fat for another, but should decrease all fats. That was in 1965. How long does it take the American Heart Association to read their own literature? Because just a short time ago, in the bulletin of the New York Academy of Medicine, Dr. Friedman said, and I'll quote him, a meal rich either in animal or vegetable fat can lead to sludging of the blood and block capillaries for most of a 24-hour period where one fatty meal follows another. At this writing, he said, 
I know of no single phenomenon that has been so consistently neglected in the study of heart disease as this one. Later, we may rue this inexcusable oversight. Well, fortunately for you, we're not overlooking this phenomenon. You have the facts, and now you can act upon them. It's a tragedy that the tremendously high-fat diet that Americans eat puts them in a semi-stupor almost all their lives, and you especially know about it after a heavy meal because they fall asleep in their chairs. So angina is a problem that we can help by eliminating smoking, eliminating the fat from the diet, and of course, if we get our cholesterol levels down so that arteries don't close any further, then you will not worsen your problem. Because the various authorities are in agreement now that if cholesterol level is higher than 160 milligrams per cent, arteries will close. Sometimes we're very lucky and we can go to 180, but it's in that range. To be safe, our blood cholesterol should be no more than 100 plus your age with a maximum of 160. If you can get your cholesterol down to that levels, hopefully then you're not only will your arteries stop closing with cholesterol deposits, but there's a chance of reversing the closure and opening the arteries to some extent. There are a number of primate studies, a number of human studies that bear this out. Reversal of artery closure is an accomplished fact in a number of studies where cholesterol has been dropped in the blood and in the diet sufficiently. Now, many people who have angina are concerned about exercise and so on. And I can say frankly that 99% of all those with angina can exercise and exercise well. In fact, as you, those who are at the center remember, we give you a target heart rate and we teach you to go right up to your target heart rate, which is uh, quite a bit of exercise. And upon time uh, in the future, you're able to reevaluate your target heart rate and be able to have a higher level of exercise. So that walking is certainly something that anyone who has angina can do. The whole idea is, first of all, to start out by warming up. That is, walk slowly for five or ten minutes in a warm place. And then continue walking at your normal pace. Now, if it's, the weather's right and you're not cold, you should have no problem. If you start to experience any angina, you immediately slow down to perhaps half the speed. And if your angina goes away, then you go back to the speed that you were originally walking. If it doesn't go away, you'll have to stop until it goes away then. Now, if it persists for more than two or three or four minutes, five minutes after you've stopped, then you may have to resort to some of your medication. But normally, in 95% of the cases, it'll disappear then, and you won't have to worry about medication. It'll pain will go away by itself. In most cases, you'll be able to simply slow down and then go right back to the pace you were. And that way, you'll be able to walk long distances, at least 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes, and eventually develop enough new circulation so that perhaps your angina will never come back and that you need for medication will be far less than it is now or it can be none at all. We've had many participants, many alumni who no longer have medication for angina and many of them have passed normal stress treadmill tests showing that they have now a full level of activity, unlimited activity, even though at one time they did have angina. We have many patients who have had angina that are running, running five, six, seven, eight miles at a run. And I've been doing that for a couple of years. So we know that it can be done. And it's simply up to the listener to decide to do it. Now, as far as heart disease, the, um, the best known authorities like Dr. Robert Whistler of the Chicago Medical School and Dr. William Costelli of the Framingham study, they both tell us that the whole process of atherosclerosis, that is, narrowing and closing of the coronary arteries specifically, is not only preventable, but it's reversible, simply by modifying your diet to bring your cholesterol and fat intake down. Now, many people resort to magic in trying to help their angina, like taking vitamins, vitamin E, and so on and so forth. I can tell you straight out that don't waste your time with vitamins. They're not going to help your angina. If anything, they can worsen you because the body has to take care of this extra, these extra chemicals, process it, and get it out of the system. 
In all of the various double-blind tests that have been done with vitamin E, none of the tests have shown that there's any advantage in taking it over taking nothing. Weight reduction has not helped people with angina. In a study done in a report in the British uh, Heart Journal, uh, people with an average weight of 210 pounds were put on the program, where half of them reduced their weight to normal about 40 pounds. The other half had no weight loss at all. And yet when they were tested on a treadmill a year later, there was no improvement whatsoever in those who had lost weight against those who had not lost weight. Obviously none of it changed their diet. So that weight loss is not an answer. You've got to change your diet if you're going to help yourself with angina. The diet plus the exercise program would be ideal for those who want to return to normal function. Now, angina, of course, is prevalent and many, many people have it. But I would say that the real growing epidemic in our country is high blood pressure, hypertension. The term hypertension is a bad term because many people think it has to do with tension. It's got practically nothing to do with tension. Uh, it's just like heart disease is a bad term because unless you've had a heart attack, there's nothing wrong with your heart. It's just that your coronary vessels have narrowed or are closed, and so your heart muscle is starving for blood. Now, hypertension uh, in 90% of the cases is called essential. There's nothing essential about hypertension. The term simply means that the medical profession says that they don't know what caused it. I think I can tell you what causes essential hypertension. There are two principal reasons for most hypertension. One is increased blood volume, and the other is decreased flow, blood flow. Now, in order to get increased blood volume, it's very easy to do. All you have to do is eat the normal amount of salt the average American eats. The average American eats about a third to a half an ounce of salt a day. Now, this just happens to be about 50 times more than the body needs. And the body is very fussy about its salt to water concentration. If you have more salt than the body needs, the body will hold a certain amount of water to keep the concentration exactly the same. So the average person with the amount of salt they eat could be holding 5, 10, 20 pounds of water just to keep the concentration of salt and water the same. People don't realize what a burden is carrying 20 pounds of water. But the heart knows all about that because it has to push all that extra fluid around. Pushing the extra fluid around takes more work for the heart and I then will increase the pressure because it's harder to push so much fluid through the body on the same amount of pressure. So pressure will go up if you're going to increase fluid. Now the second way you raise blood pressure is decreased flow. If you're on a normal high fat diet that have most Americans are on, you're going to have many, many of your small capillaries 100% blocked, as Dr. Friedman has pointed out because the fat coats the small red blood cells and platelets, they clump and they block small capillaries. So you can have 5, 10, 15 percent of all your small capillaries 100 percent blocked 24 hours a day. Well, if you're going to block your various little channels that your blood flows through, the body has no choice but to increase the pressure through the other open channels in order to give you the blood flow that you have to have every minute. There's no question that if we drop the fat in the diet and change nothing else, blood pressure will drop. Dr. James Iacono, who at that time was head of human research, U.S. Department of Agriculture, demonstrated that. He took healthy men and women, about 50 years old, and placed them on a standardized American diet in Watson's laboratory. The standardized diet was 43% fat, about 10 grams of salt a day, about a third of an ounce of salt, and he watched them very closely. They stabilized their weight. Then he made only one change. He dropped the fat from 43% fat to 25% fat. Now, he kept the salt exactly the same, a third of an ounce a day, and he kept the calories exactly the same. He didn't want any of them to lose weight because I don't uh, think he wanted anyone to say that if their blood pressure dropped, it would because they lost weight. Within 10 days, all their blood pressures dropped 10% both the top number, the systolic, and the bottom number, the diastolic. And not only did their blood pressures drop 10%, but their little platelet cells, the ones having to do with clotting, these cells the, were sticking together to a certain amount in these people, and 50% of the sticking disappeared. The stickiness broke up, and the cells now were freed and were able to 
uh, individually circulate in the bloodstream. Well, this was a sensational discovery for Dr. Iacono because the sticking of platelets is directly correlated to what we call diabetic retinopathy, the damage that diabetics do to their eyes. The more severe the uh, tendency towards blindness for diabetics, the more these platelets stick together. So here Dr. Iacono was able to note a very simple procedure, just lowering fat to 25%, and this could have a great influence in helping diabetics from going blind. Well, he kept them on this diet for 40 days, and during this period, their blood pressure stayed down to 10%, and the platelets also were only sticking half as much. He then returned the fat to the 43%, and everyone's blood pressure went up 10%, and all the platelets stuck together again. It was a marvelous test because it indicates here is a program, a study with no weight loss at all, no change in salt, and yet a 10% drop in blood pressure. Fat is indeed a potent uh, cause of elevated blood pressure. Now, many people are concerned about blood pressure because they think it's going to blow out their arteries, because that's what people usually have strokes from. They have an aneurysm in their arteries in their head where the vessel blows out and they bleed, and that bleeding blocks a major part of their brain from circulation and they then lose that brain function and could be paralyzed or some other problem for the rest of their life. Healthy arteries, first of all, are not damaged at all by high pressure, not an acute high blood pressure. In dogs, experiments have been made bringing their blood pressure up to 6,000 millimeters of pressure without hurting any vessels. Well, the problem is the long, continuous, elevated, chronic high blood pressure over many years that create the problems in humans. Like the Japanese, for example. They're on a very high salt diet, as much as one ounce a day. And the Japanese have probably the highest incidence of hypertension in the world. And incidentally, they have the number one stroke rate in the world, too, uh, mainly from sort of blowing their brains out. Uh, uh, their arteries finally weakening until they burst. So salt is not a good idea, and certainly is a leading cause of high blood pressure. Now drugs do nothing to cure high blood pressure. All drugs do is to paralyze the body's mechanism to raise blood pressure. And <coughs> many patients, while their arteries are continuing to close, in fact some blood pressure drugs accelerate the closing of your arteries, so will accelerate heart disease. <coughs> Uh, the drugs have many side effects, <coughs> and in fact, <coughs> in studies done with the drugs, the one investigator who has had the original study that initiated using drugs and recommending drugs uh, for physicians, for their patients, Dr. Edward Fries of the VA hospital, himself did a study where he took 60 people and took them all off drugs without their knowledge. That is, he gave me an empty capsule that looked just the same as the drug they were taking. So they didn't know when they were being taken off their antihypertensive medication. And in a period of time, almost all their blood pressures came back to the where they were before they were put on medication. Now he watched the worst ones, that is, ones who had the most abnormal blood pressure, and put them back on drugs without their knowledge again, just by putting drugs in the same capsules that they were taking. But a number of them he left off drugs, and he watched them for about eight years. Now those off drugs still continued taking those capsules with no drug in at all. So no one really knew what was going on there, as far as the patient's concerned. After the eight years, he analyzed the death rate in so on. He found that 14 patients died in the eight years. But what was amazing was that 13 of them were on high blood pressure medication right to the day of their death, and their blood pressure was maintained right in the normal range. So the blood pressure drugs certainly didn't protect them because only one died who was off drugs. And this blood, uh, the one person that died off the drugs had elevated blood pressure when he died because his pressure wasn't being controlled. The reason I understand that I would think that the 13 who are on drugs died is because they were the worst cases. That is, they had the highest blood pressures, and therefore they would have had the greatest artery damage. <coughs> and since drugs have a tendency to many times raise cholesterol level and so on, I would guess that the drugs accelerated their death by helping them close their arteries faster. Drugs have other side effects, too. 
uh, for example, uh, a study done in circulation, a publication for cardiologists, indicated that in this study, 50% of the males on high blood pressure medication lost the ability to have erections. They became impotent. Uh, general weakness, uh, uh, sleepiness, uh, other problems uh, with these men. And the problem with the drugs are even more than that, more serious than that. For example, uh, many drugs will force the uric acid level to go up into the gout range, and then you have to take medications to bring the uric acid down to keep you from getting gout. The other hypertensive medications force your glucose elevated until you go into the diabetic range and have to take diabetic medications like insulin and so on. And it's possible in a number of patients to bring them into kidney failure with the hypertensive drugs. So that uh, it's, it's not good uh, as far as the side effects to have someone on drugs for the rest of their lives. However, if there's no other way to do it, I would have to recommend that people with high blood pressure should go on drugs. There is another way to do it, however, and that is in our center's first 900 patients that we've analyzed, and they've been going from the center now since 1977, September, we found that out of these, we had 218 hypertensors that came in on drugs for their, for their hypertension. And yet in four weeks' time, 85% were off their drugs with normal blood pressures, and some had been on drugs for 20 years for their hypertension. So we know that there are other ways to get people's blood pressure normal without having to put them on drugs and not having to face the side effect of drugs. And yet, the medical profession has recently had what we call a consensus. It was the first time that all the medical groups have decided that there should be one common treatment. And the consensus information was released from a Department of Health, Education, and Welfare a bulletin. And here's what it said, quote, for the first time, this country's medical associations and authorities have reached a consensus on an approach to diagnosis and treatment of blood pressure. What was the consensus? It's very simple. Drugs on a daily basis for a lifetime is the only way to manage hypertension. Now, if you read their 25-page instruction sheet of physicians, you will find about four lines that say, if you could ask your patient to lower salt intake and lose some weight, that might be helpful. That's all they said about nutrition. Very little. Now, they don't have much faith in, in nutrition. Now, there are many problems associated with drug therapy. In fact, uh, the biggest problem is, of course, getting a patient who has no symptoms, because hypertensive patients usually have no symptoms, getting this patient to take drugs which gives them symptoms. And that's why authorities like Dr. Norman Kaplan and others have said that the most difficult part of management of a hypertensive patient is to make them take drugs which could make them feel worse. And in a book that he wrote called Clinical Hypertension, the reviewer said this. He said, it's in this area uh, where the physician, the personality of the physician must come into play to convince the patient intellectually and emotionally that they must remain on drug therapy for the rest of their lives. Uh, what's, uh, what the reviewer had in mind is making the physician uh, an ally to the drug industry to convince him that it's a lifetime effort for drugs and there is no other hope for you. There are many problems with the drug therapies I've mentioned. And 30 years ago, Dr. Walter Kempner demonstrated with his rice fruit diet uh, that blood pressure is far more effectively treated with diet than with drugs. He got people's drug pressure, blood pressure down that were thought impossibly brought down by any other ways, and it's still more effective today. Now, Dr. Kempner's diet is considered to be low salt, but people forget that it's very, very low fat. His diet is only 5% total calories and fat, uh, almost one-tenth of what the average American diet is. And I feel that it is fat more than salt that makes Dr. Kempner's diet and our diet, which is also about 5, 6, 7 percent fat, be so effective. The drug companies are pushing their product uh, with intensive campaigns. They have, for example, hypertensive, high blood pressure search Sundays. Seba Pharmaceutical, for example, got 
tied up with the Louisiana Heart Association and did a search campaign, a hypertensive Sunday in New Orleans. They found 30,000 people they were able to take their blood pressures on that Sunday. They got 1,000 volunteers. They equipped them with blood pressure cuffs, car tables, outside of supermarkets, and so on. 30%, about 10,000 people were found to be hypertension, to hypertensive. They were sent to their physicians to have drugs for the rest of their lives. Now, CB already has done this to probably a, a million people. They've had hypertensive search uh, Sundays, and out of the million people, if we go by the same ratio, it's about a third, about 300,000 people sent to their physicians to have drugs for the rest of their lives. I just calculated out what this public service is, because CBA pays all those expenses for getting the volunteers down, getting the high blood pressure cuffs, and so on. And I figured out that there uh, might be several billion dollars worth of drug sales involved. Now, it's just incidental that CEPA happens to be the largest producer of hypertensive drugs in the world. But I think that they're still doing as a public service. They're certainly not interested in the money. Because in an ad CEPA had for one of their drugs, uh, hydrochlorothiazide, they said a note for nursing mothers, if you're on our thiazide drug, don't breastfeed your child. Why is CEBA so concerned about the child? Well, because the note continues to say, because thiazides pass through the breast milk and can make your child sick. Now, there's no hint in there that CEBA says, why don't you change your diet so you won't need our drug? No, it's better than not to nurse your child. They're willing to destroy the child's health just to make their sales in thiazides. I call that a public service. So as far as hypertension care, what we have to look at is drug use as an exceptional use, something where you can't control it any other way. And that probably would come down to about 5% of all the cases that are now being used for drugs. It'd be very nice if 85 or 90% of all people with hypertension never have to use drugs for the rest of their lives, for that matter. And you certainly can do it if you'll keep your fat intake and your salt intake down to the levels that we recommend. Thank you. Exercise is a subject that many people don't quite understand as to what the benefits are compared to the time that they put in to exercise. In fact, many people consider exercise as unnecessary. In fact, uh, I remember Gary Cooper had a statement that when I feel like exercising, I lay down until the feeling goes away. And that's what many people think about exercise. It's something not to be taken too seriously. Just how beneficial is exercise for you? You know that my recommendations are that you do at least two half-hour walks a day. And if you're more vigorous than that, a half-hour run a day is very nice. But certainly you have to do a minimum amount to be able to keep up your cardiovascular endurance. If you take a 20-year-old that's perfectly healthy and put him in the bed for three weeks, what happens to him? And when he gets up, you'll find that about a fourth of his endurance disappears. He can only do about 70% on the treadmill or of what he was able to walk before after the bed rest. Not only that, but his blood value has become a little bit abnormal. His glucose or his blood sugar will go up, and his uric acid will go up somewhat. And in addition to that, he'll lose calcium. When you go to bed, the body gets rid of what it doesn't need, and if you're not using your bones, the body will just get rid of the calcium from your bones and send it out through the urine. Now, fortunately, it's possible to get the bones to get its calcium back. If you do a lot of exercise and a lot of use of the bones, the bones will get stronger. But many people don't do that much, and they do lose a lot of calcium from the bones. In fact, a group of uh, senior citizens, 65 to 70 years old, were tested out as far as their bone density, amount of calcium and bone structure. And this was a program where they only walked an hour a day, four days a week for a year, just four hours a week. And another group that didn't have any organized exercise. At the end of the year, those on the four hours a week of walking were able to maintain their bone structure 
those without an exercise program lost 9% of their total skeletal weight. That's sort of a tragedy to lose that much bone because osteoporosis or weak and porous bones are a principal epidemic in this country. Because you get older, you do less. Now, many people think that the lack of bone density is because you don't take enough calcium and you don't drink enough milk. Uh, this, this is just a fable set out by the National Dairy Council. If you have stroke victims, or one side of the body is paralyzed, or one arm is paralyzed and the other arm is all right, after all, this person is eating whatever they're eating, and the blood, whether you eat calcium or not, gets to both sides of the body. Well, you find in a stroke victim, where one side of the body is not being used, like the arm, that the bone density will disappear in that arm, while in the arm that's being used, you don't have any loss of bone density. In studies on stroke patients over a period of five years, one-fourth of all the calcium and bone in the one hand that was paralyzed disappears. It all goes out through the urine because you're not using those bones. So there's no question that lack of activity will create loss of bone density. There are two other factors in loss of bone density. One is smoking. When you smoke, the calcium comes right out of your bones into the blood. But don't worry about that. It goes right into your big aorta. It sucks it up like a sponge. So if you're a smoker, you can almost be sure you've got a calcified aorta. You weaken your bones and you strengthen your aorta, but not in a way that's good for you because it requires a lot more work in your heart when your big aorta gets calcified. I think probably the most important thing we're concerned with in exercise is that will it create more circulation for you? Will you be able to develop collateral circulation, as we call it, new growth circulation, to give you more blood flow so that when you have narrowed vessels or closed vessels, is there ever any way for you to develop enough blood to overcome the problems that you now have because you've closed your vessels considerably? Well, the news is good. In both animal studies and human studies, you can restore a considerable amount of blood flow even though you've narrowed or blocked substantial main arteries. And in studies in animals, for example, where they tie off their vessels and even tie off their coronary arteries and so on, upon making them do a lot of exercise, they actually grow substantial amount of circulation in the coronary artery system, in the leg system, and in other systems. In fact, in a study of little animals where they tied off completely the femoral arteries in their legs. Now, the femoral arteries are those arteries, those major arteries from your knee to your hip that transport perhaps 95% of all the blood down to the leg. And they just tie these arteries off in an operation, 100% close them. So these little animals just had perhaps 3 or 4% of the normal blood flow to the legs. They're just right on the point of developing gangrene. And yet they made these animals walk on a treadmill. If they didn't walk on a treadmill, they'd fall into a bucket of water. And so the animals tried very hard to walk, even though they could hardly managed because they had almost no blood in their legs. After a period of time, these animals developed enough circulation so they walked three times as far on a treadmill with their femorals tied than they did when their femorals were giving full blood flow, no restriction at all. It's amazing even if they were able to do just as well as they did with open femorals than with closed femorals, but they did three times as much. To give you an idea of the tremendous amount of circulation that can be tied up and developed in the femoral arteries. Now we've had a participant, one of our alumni, has had exactly the same problem as these little animals. We have a participant that by angiogram showed that both his femoral arteries were completely closed. He had so little blood flow he could hardly walk more than a few hundred feet, but every step was in great pain. And he was in danger, of course, of developing gangrene. And he came to our center, and here's a man that had a cholesterol level of over 400. Well, we finally got him down over a period of time to cholesterol level below 200. And it took him a while to gather and walk until he was able to walk without pain. He eventually, instead of walking a block with pain, was able to walk four or five miles without pain. This took him several months. The amazing part about this man, even though he had two closed femorals, he developed enough blood flow in his legs so he was able to run in about two or three years after he started a marathon, 26 miles without stopping. 
and as a normal practice, he runs five to eight miles every day. And when I talked to him just a short time ago, he says, I don't have any pain in one leg at all when I run my five or six or eight mile run, but the other leg, after about a mile, I get a little bit of pain, it lasts for a mile, and then it disappears. So we've seen cases of r circulation reestablishing itself in the worst possible cases. In fact, in the group of young men I told you about, they were 20 years old, when they went to bed for about three weeks, they took a little sample called a biopsy out of the muscle in their leg, in the quadricep muscles, before they went to bed. And they counted about 200 tiny capillaries, the smallest blood vessels, in the size of about the head of a pin. That's one square millimeter. And then they went to bed, and then they got up in three weeks and took another sample of that muscle. It was about the same, about 200 little vessels. They hadn't disappeared. Then they put them on an active exercise program for about six or so weeks. A lot of walking, a little bit of running, and then they measured them again. They were amazed to find that instead of 200 vessels, they now had 225 vessels for the same area. These young men being pushed to get more circulation, even though they had no closed vessels, increased their circulation, increased their little vessels by 13% in just six weeks' time. So even healthy young men can increase their circulation if you push them so the body requires more blood flow. Now, one thing about exercise is not only you're going to feel better, but if you are deficient in circulation somewhere, you're going to be able to establish new circulation. In my Long Beach study that I did with patients at the Long Beach Veteran Hospital back in 1975, we had about 15 or 18 men on my diet, the same as that I recommend uh, at the center, uh, for five months where I fed them for that period of time. And then there were another group of men that ate the regular American diet. After five months, when they all retested on the treadmill, the men incidentally were selected for claudication. They all had insufficient circulation in their legs. And when they started, the average man could only walk 200 feet, and then he had to stop because of pain on a treadmill that went a mile and a half an hour. After the five months were over, those on the regular American diet were able to walk three times as far. Well, that was not bad because that's the average improvement that the average man could make uh, if he exercised a lot without changing his diet. Three times as far. But those on our diet were able to walk 50 times as far. It's an absolute record, and there's nowhere in the world where this has been anywhere approached. Diet and exercise, a proper diet and exercise is going to give you a tremendous amount of capability, whereas if you try to do it by exercise alone, you're just not going to make it. Now, many people think there's a particular diet for those who exercise. Well, there really isn't a particular diet. It's exactly the same diet, but you'll have to be a little careful because many times people go without eating, and you're liable to get what we call hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia means low blood sugar. And I know that many people, after they do a lot of activity, they eat a candy bar to get what they think is quick energy. That's the fastest way to get hypoglycemia, or low blood sugar, is by eating a sugar that goes right into the bloodstream without requiring digestion. Because hypoglycemia means low blood sugar, and how does it happen? If you eat a lot of simple carbohydrates, like sugar, honey, molasses, candies, cookies, and so on and so forth. The body is accustomed to receiving only a couple of calories a minute, and it gets this couple of calories a minute from ordinary food like potatoes and grains that break down very slowly over a period of time, and gives you a couple of calories a minute every hour, 24 hours a day. But if you eat a candy bar or anything of that sort that requires practically no digestion, a soft drink of Coca-Cola, where they have so much sugar in it, it goes right into the bloodstream. Instead of two calories a minute, you can be getting five calories a minute, ten calories a minute. Well, all that glucose, all that sugar going to the blood, if the body can't capture it and use it right away, it could spill out to the kidneys. The body hates to lose a single calorie of anything. It's very stingy. And so it immediately tells the pancreas quickly, get a lot of insulin here to capture that glucose, that sugar, so we don't lose any of it. So the pancreas overreacts, and it puts too much 
insulin into the body, and it puts so much in that it not only gets rid of the sugar that just came in, but it also does away with almost all the sugar you have in your own blood. When your blood sugar drops so low, you get lightheaded. You lose concentration. You could even faint. That's what low blood sugar is. And millions of people have low blood sugar in our country. And what kind of diets are they given? High-protein, low-carbohydrate diets. So the diet that they're given for the low blood sugar will keep them in hypoglycemia for the rest of their lives because they don't get any carbohydrates. And without carbohydrates, you can't get blood sugar. So that the best diet for hypoglycemia is a diet that I recommend. All you have to do is make sure that you eat at least three meals a day, have a couple snacks in between your meals, and any case of hypoglycemia, unless it's very exceptional, should disappear within three or so weeks' time. Now, in addition to hypoglycemia, as a problem for athletes, they drink a lot of beverages because they, of course, sweat and get thirsty. I'd like to warn you against coffee, tea, cocoa, and cola drinks, because all these contain a common class of material called xanthines. The xanthines are a certain kind of material that uh, Dr. Minton of Ohio State University Medical School in Columbus has found very closely related to fibrocystic breast disease in women. In fact, the danger with fibrocystic breast disease is that women that have that problem have four times the risk of having breast cancer than those that don't have it. And what Dr. Minton did, he took his women who were, had fibrocystic breast disease, and he said, get off of the cola drinks, coffee, tea, and cocoa. And he was amazed to find that almost 100% of them lost their cysts, lost their lumps in their breasts when they got off of these drinks. It's amazing what happened. So we certainly want to tell you that to take Dr. Minton's experience and get off of the coffee, tea, cola, and cola, uh, Coke drinks because they have such a strong relationship with fibrocystic breast disease. Now, there's been some talk that the high-carbohydrate natural food diet has what we call phytates in, and these will restrict the absorption of vitamins and minerals because they sort of bind them. And a lot of people have been worried about that. Uh, especially the manufacturers of white bread come out and say, our white bread doesn't have phytates. You better eat that because it's healthier for you. And don't eat that whole grain and that whole wheat bread because that has phytates and that'll bind your minerals and vitamins. Well, I think that's finally been put to rest by Dr. James Anderson, who's chief of endocrinology at University of Kentucky Medical Center. He's using our diet exactly. And he tested his patients to see if indeed these phytates, these chemicals in the complex carbohydrates and food has grown, really restrict the absorption of vitamins and minerals. And he found there was completely no restriction at all. They got all the vitamins and minerals they needed. This is reported out in a recent American Diabetic Association abstract that he submitted. So I don't think you'll have to worry at all. More evidence is coming in all the time. Certainly, native populations that have a high amount of the phytates have no problem in, in their actual <coughs> diet. In fact, a good uh, example would be the Tarahumara Indians. The Tarahumara Indians eat no refined foods at all, and it's a diet almost identical to the diet I recommend. It's uh, corn, peas, squash, native fruits and vegetables, and they have a small amount of animal protein a few times a month. And some of you know about the Taramar Indians, but they're the blood relatives of the Pima Indians in our country. The Pima Indians, and they split off about 400 years ago, the Pimas are on the American kind of diet, except they eat more of it than most Americans. They eat probably 2,000 calories of fat a day. And the Pimas have more arthritis, diabetes, and gallstones than any other group in the country, whereas the Taramaras have none of these diseases. The heart diseases are known and so on. And if you know about the Taramaras, if you're a runner, you know about the Taramaras. Taramaras have a kickball game where they run 150 miles continuously, day and night, for 48 hours. That's real endurance. So if you want to have real endurance, go on the diet the Taramaras are on. That's the diet I'm recommending to you. 
Diabetes is an ancient disease that has been written in the Egyptian hieroglyphics over 3,000 years ago. And in those days, when one of the royalty developed diabetes, the physicians were very smart. They simply put them on the peasant's diet, which is the kind of diet we would recommend to you, of grains, fruits, and vegetables, and the diabetes disappeared. Then they send them back to the royalty again, where they had very rich foods, high in fat, and they, when they got the diabetes again, they came back to the peasants. So for hundreds and hundreds of years, native populations like the Egyptians and the Romans and so on knew how to treat diabetes. But we sort of lost the touch a few hundred years ago. And I'd like to give you some better ideas about modern concepts of treating diabetes and how invalid many of the current concepts are, but they're rapidly, hopefully, fading from view. Diabetics get the worst of all the problems. Of all the gangrenous limbs that go to the hospital to be amputated, 80% belong to diabetics. They have three times the death rate for non-diabetics. The tragedy is there are about 10 million diabetics in the country today, and since they're increasing about 6% a year, in about 10 years there'll be another 10 million. We'll have 20 million diabetics. There's two principal kinds of diabetics, you might say. One would be the adult onset and the other is the juvenile onset. It has very little to do with the age. It simply means that if you're a juvenile onset, then you probably had a rather sudden weight loss uh, within a few weeks to a few months before you were diagnosed. And there would might be 5, 10, 15, 20 pounds. In addition, you may have shown ketones in your urine or in your blood. Uh, these two would probably diagnose you as a juvenile diabetic. On the other hand, if you went to your physician with no symptoms and he discovered that your glucose was in a very high abnormal range, he would say, you know, that you're a diabetic, but you really didn't know it. You had no symptoms. You probably then would be an adult onset diabetic. Now, we have adult onsets that could happen to them when they're eight years old. Many little obese children are, in effect, uh, having adult onset diabetes, and it's very easy for them to get rid of it if they change their diet. On the other hand, you can have someone 60 years old who suddenly will diagnose as a juvenile onset diabetic at age 60. So that age is not necessarily significant in the diagnosis of these two problems. The juvenile is the one that is hard hit because a juvenile usually has to have insulin or they couldn't exist. Adult onsets normally make more insulin than a normal person has, so they obviously don't need it. And yet adult onsets, of course, are put on insulin. I believe that adult onset diabetics, which are 90% of all diabetics, juveniles are only 5 or 10% of all diabetics, adult onsets, I believe that by following our kind of diet, could practically all get off of all the medication and be normal. Now to tell you a little bit more about diabetes, perhaps I should go back to uh, England and Wales during the period from 1900 to present day, because that's where we learned quite a bit. Diabetes death rate in England and Wales is significant because first of all, the women were the ones who were monitored during World War I and World War II, the men went to war and they were somewhat of an unstable population, so we took the women to, mo uh, to monitor. We found that since 1900, the death rate slowly climbed up, but in World War I, suddenly the death rate dropped far below where it was in 1900. How is it possible? Well, we know one thing happened, plenty of stress in World War I, but one thing that did happen is they had severe food rationing, where the amount of fat and cholesterol was cut down considerably in the diet. And right after the war, when food rationing was lifted, death rates for diabetes started to climb again, and they kept climbing steadily until World War II. And right after World War II, the death rate dropped even further down below 1900. It was the first drop in that whole period between the wars. Even though insulin had been started to be used in 1921 and 22, insulin did not slow the death rate for diabetes in England and also in the United States. Insulin has had very little effect on slowing death rate, as we can see by the death rate curves. The wars have had a tremendous effect in dropping death rate. And yet, all that happened during the wars nutritionally is the severe limitation of fat and cholesterol. Well, that gives us sort of a hint, because if we now follow on with 
various studies, we begin to get some better ideas. If we take populations like the Japanese, we can monitor them because they have large families in Japan, and some of these brothers and sisters move to Hawaii, some move to Los Angeles, and they adopt the diets of the new countries. Well, it's amazing because in Japan, the amount of diabetes is very low. When you go to Hawaii, it's three times as much. And the same members of the same families, when they go to Hawaii, will now assume the death rates of the diabetics in Hawaii, even though they came from Japan where the death rates were low. So there's no hereditary protection. If you're going to adopt the diet of your higher fat country, you're going to get their higher fat death rate. And that's what happens all over the world. We see that in South Africa when the natives move to the villages and adopt the diets of uh, the white people there. We see that among the Yemenites in Israel and they move into Israel. Any native population that abandons a low-fat diet and comes from a low death rate in diabetes will go to a high death rate if they adapt a high-fat diet. In fact, we're thinking about heredity. The best thing is to consider Dr. Pike's studies in England. Dr. Pike has the largest registry of identical twins in the world, where one of the twins is diabetic and the other is or is not. I have reported on one study about 100 identical twins, and of the identical twins where one was diabetic, about half of the other twins were not diabetic, even though the time of the interval was over 20 years. Dr. Pike said if after 20 years the other twin doesn't have a tendency towards diabetes, then indeed the diabetic twin must be diabetic, not because of hereditary, but because of environmental factors. And I do believe that the principal environmental factor is the diet. The first experiments with diet were done back years ago. Dr. Sweeney in 1928 took some 20-year-old medical students and he put them on three different programs for just 48 hours. He put them on a very high carbohydrate diet, a very high fat diet, and then a third group, he gave them nothing except water to drink. At the end of 48 hours, he tested them with the glucose tolerance test. Now, you know, that's the test that we use to diagnose diabetes. The test simply consists of giving you about three ounces of glucose, that's a simple sugar like corn syrup, and a glass of water. And we take a blood test before you take the drink, and then every half hour for a couple of hours afterwards. And by seeing what happens in your bloodstream, we can tell you if you test diabetic. It's arbitrary. If your blood sugar upon fasting is higher than 115 milligrams of glucose for roughly three ounces of blood, you're abnormal. If at any time it rises above 170 milligrams percent, during the two-hour period, you're abnormal too. And if after two hours it doesn't return below 115 milligrams of glucose, you're also abnormal. So we have three ways to determine if you're abnormal, and if you are, then we have to classify you as diabetic. Well, Dr. Sweeney tested his young man 48 hours after this diet. The high-carbohydrate diet, which incidentally had honey, sugar, molasses, potatoes, corn, and so on in it, they were perfectly normal, no problems at all. On the high fat diet, which had mayonnaise, eggs, butter, cream, and so on, everyone tested severely diabetic. That was a surprise. How about those having nothing at all? They tested just as severely diabetic as those who are on a very high fat diet. Well, how can that be if all they had was water? Well, when you're on a total fast like that, in the first 12 hours, the body uses up all of its blood glucose. That's the only store you have. And after that, the calories you require come from your fat reserves. So by 48 hours, the blood was so high in fat from your own fat reserves that there was just as much fat in the blood as there was on the high-fat diet. So it doesn't seem to make any difference whether it's your fat or the fat from the food that you eat. If you have high fat in the blood, somehow you will develop an abnormal glucose tolerance test. Now, Dr. Felber decided to see what happens. When you take normal young men who have a normal glucose tolerance test and simply infuse some fat into their blood, equivalent to what they normally would have 12 hours after they get up. Because everybody is on a 12-hour clock. For example, when you wake up in the morning, your temperature is at the lowest. It might be 97, it might be 97.5, 98. 12 hours later, it's a point higher. 
degree higher, maybe a degree and a half higher. And then 12 hours after that, at 6 a.m. in the morning, it's back to the low, and it cycles every 12 hours. Well, the free fatty acids in your body cycle too. These are the fats that keep on exchanging from your fat reserves into the blood. They come from your fat reserves into the blood, go back in the fat reserves, all the time they're cycling. And in the morning, it's the lowest. 12 hours later, it's 30 to 50% higher. So all Dr. Felber did was to put fat into their blood equivalent to where it would have been by nature in late afternoon. He was amazed to find that a little bit of fat was enough to give them a diabetic glucose tolerance test. And he checked out their insulin. He said, well, maybe the fat I put in stopped the pancreas from making insulin. But no, the insulin was even 50% higher than it was when they were tested without the fat. So the body tried to make more insulin to overcome the extra glucose rising, but it couldn't control it. Dr. James Anderson, who was chief of endocrinology at the University of Kentucky Medical School, did a two-week test with his 20-year-old young normal man. And he gave them formula diets. For example, he gave them a diet made of corn oil, 5% corn oil in the diet, 80% carbohydrates, table sugar, and 15% protein, protein which was primarily dry curd cottage cheese. Now when I say 80% carbohydrates of table sugar, I mean the pound of table sugar a day these young men had. He gave them another diet of only 20% carbohydrate and 65% fat. After two weeks time, all those on the 65% fat diet, remember the American diet is 43% fat, on the 65% fat diet, they all tested diabetic. On the 5% fat diet, but a pound of table sugar a day, they all tested perfectly normal. I thought that sugar has something to do with diabetes. Why aren't these young men diabetic then? Well, he decided to carry this further. He took these young men who are on a pound of table sugar a day and continued it for another nine weeks. That's 11 weeks total, almost three months, on a pound of table sugar a day. Yet at the end of that period, the young men tested perfectly normal. No problems at all. That teaches us whether or not sugar is a factor in creating diabetes or fat. Because as Dr. Felber has seen, only two hours of putting fat into the blood, they test diabetic. And Dr. Anders has seen three months of putting people on the pound of table sugar a day, and they're perfectly normal. Well, after a period of time, other investigators tried to understand what was happening one of which was Dr. Hemsworth of England. Dr. Hemsworth of England taking up on these studies, and he did this incidentally in 1935, because the earliest works done on testing carbohydrate intolerance and so on for diabetics was done in the 20s and the 30s. When insulin first came in, they were able to experiment. And Dr. Hemsworth found that if he took young men and put them on a high-fat diet for a week, Every single time he did that, they test diabetic on a glucose tolerance test. And every time he took the same young men and put them on a low-fat diet for a week, without exception, they would test normal. And he decided to test it. He said, you know, it may be that the high fat paralyzes the body's insulin. In those days, they couldn't measure insulin too accurately. So he said, I'm going to inject insulin into them. We won't use the body's insulin. We won't give a glucose tolerance test. What we'll do is I'll simply inject insulin into them out of a syringe like we give to diabetics, and we'll see if that lowers, burns up their glucose for them. And so he put them on a very high fat diet, and he gave them a certain amount of insulin, three units of insulin, which is very insignificant, a very tiny amount. And the three units used up a certain amount of glucose on the high fat diet. Then he put the same men on a low fat diet and gave them the same amount of insulin from the same syringe measured the amount of glucose that it used up, and he was amazed to find that it, it used up 400% more glucose than when their blood had high fat in, than when it had low fat. Dr. Hemsworth was the first man, the first investigator, to really find out what fat does to insulin. In his test, he showed that <coughs> it didn't make any difference <coughs> whether it was <coughs> your insulin or insulin that injects in a syringe. If you have high fat in your blood, the insulin cannot burn up the glucose. In those days, it wasn't understood why fat insensitized insulin. It sort of paralyzed insulin. It wasn't understood at all, but we understand now because recent findings teach us this, that every cell, if you can picture a cell as a little round room, 
And if you can picture in this little round room, there might be a hundred doors all around the boundaries, the circumference of this little room. And these little hundred doors are what we call sites, S-I-T-E-S. They're sort of areas where things cling to. And if you can say that out of these hundred doors, 20 of them belong to insulin. And insulin just sits at the door, and when glucose wants to come into the cell to be used for fuel, the, gluco the insulin opens the door and the glucose comes in. Now that's fine. But what if what happens, a very artificial thing happens, that instead of the insulin guiding the door, that the fat somehow becomes magnetized to the door, and when you get a certain amount of fat in your blood, when it reaches over a certain amount, the fat will preferentially get to those little doors and not let the insulin get to the doors. And the fat doesn't let the doors open when the glucose wants to come in. So all those doors stay closed, and the insulin can't get to it because the fat is blocking the way. When we take the fat out of your diet, the fat disappears from the doors, the insulin comes back and opens the doors and lets the glucose come in. And that's more or less the mechanism. The fat binds to these insulin binding sites in the cell and deprives the insulin <coughs> of being able to do their work. That's why when we take fat out of the diet of adult onset diabetic, in almost most cases, within three or four weeks, we're able to get rid of his extra insulin uh, that he injects through a syringe. And we've had diabetics on 180 units of insulin that we've gotten them off of within three or four weeks, and they have normal blood sugar values. Well, now that we understand a little bit about the role of fat in diabetes, what do we do about it? Well, that's the big problem because the American Diabetic Association dietary recommendations for 50 years have been simply don't use carbohydrates. Limit them. Limit them tremendously. And if you limit carbohydrates, you've got to use something else. And so fats are what we use. The American Diabetic Association diet used to have 55 to 60 percent of its total calories in fat, far more than we're even using for the average American diet. And it's taken a lot of work to get them to change that recommendation. In fact, I personally feel that the recommendations of the American Diabetic Association diet were one of the principal factors that can continued diabetic to continue to have diabetes in our country. It was the principal factor for the continuation of adult onset diabetes in our country, the high fat recommendations. Now, Dr. Anderson, about five years ago, because of his interest in high-carbohydrate diets, uh, and I got together, and I presented my dietary approach to him. And he, although he had never tried a diet like this, uh, of natural foods, high in carbohydrates, he's willing to try the diet if I could raise some funds for him so they can hire a uh, PhD to run his program. And I raised $10,000 for him, and he started his program about five years ago. He was so successful in this program, he's getting exactly the same success as we get at our center in getting diabetics off insulin, and that he's published very widely, and his writings now have influenced the American Diabetic Association for the first time in 50 years to make a major change in their dietetic recommendations. And the major change is that don't be afraid of carbohydrates anymore. New findings have taught us that you can have up to 60% of your total calories in carbohydrates. Now well, that brings fat way down. And many, many uh, physicians that treat diabetics are a little astounded at this, and they might be a little frightened in using these new recommendations because they're so different. But I hope that it catches on, and in time that the American Diabetic Association will recommend the most effective diet that Dr. Anderson has tested, and that is our diet, where carbohydrates are above 70% of total calories. But they've made a good step forward. And it's taken a lot of time to do it. In fact, when Dr. Kelly M. West, who is professor of medicine specializing in diabetes of the University of Oklahoma Medical School, appeared recently before the Senate hearings on nutrition, he said one of the most exciting new researchers in diabetic therapy is the high-carbohydrate, low-fat diet that Dr. Anderson is using. He said if this diet were used universally in our country, two-thirds of all the millions of diabetics would be off all the drugs completely. Well, that's quite a strong statement. It'd be nice to have six or seven million people who are not diabetic on the various drugs, off their drugs completely, no more having to stick themselves with a needle. We've had diabetics who have been on insulin sticking themselves with a needle every day for 20 years, 
off insulin completely now. And there's no reason why the whole country shouldn't have this advantage. Along the way of diabetic therapy, we've had the oral drugs. These are for adult onset diabetics. And there was a little controversy about them because when they were first used in the late 1950s, physicians were a little confused as to whether they use insulin or use the oral drugs like Oranase and so on. And so the United States government decided to do a special study to see if one were better than the other or just what to do. And so they started the University Group Diabetic Program Study. It was an excellent study, over a thousand people on the study. Uh, Twelve hospitals in the United States entered it. They had 50 full-time scientists. It was an eight-year test period. And the excellent part about the study is those on the oral drugs or on diet alone were what we call double-blind. That is, neither the patient or the physician knew who was getting the gelatin capsule that either had the drug in or that had nothing in. And so it was considered a very fair test. Now, in addition to that, some diabetics were on insulin too, and to see whether insulin might be better or worse than the oral drugs. Well, at the end of the finding, at the end of eight years, everybody thought the drug uh, test was excellent. They thought that the eight years had done very well, that the laboratories did very accurate blood work, the following the diabetics were excellent, and everything was fine except when the results came out, because here's what the results said. The results said that if you were on Oranase, there was a 250% greater death rate than if you were on no drug at all. If you were on the other class of oral drugs called DBI, the fenformins, you had 250% greater death rate than no drug at all. If you were on insulin, you did no better than if you were on no drug at all. In fact, the conclusion of the study was if you had never seen a doctor and never been diagnosed as diabetic, you've been better off on your own. That was quite a conclusion. And the FDA had no choice under that circumstance to ban the oral drugs because you can't have drugs creating heart disease in diabetics. And they were all set to do that. They're writing up the documents to ban the drugs when 40 of the nation's leading diabetic specialists led by the Joslin Clinic's medical director. Incidentally, Joslin Clinic, one of the largest medical clinics in the world, specialized in diabetes, went to the FDA and they said, if in effect, if you don't rescind your recommendations to cancel off the oral drugs, you can better find someone else to treat your diabetics. Well, the FDA decided to back down. And they said, all right, we won't ban them, but we'll put an insert, we'll put a warning on like we do on cigarettes, saying that if you use these things, you're liable to die of heart disease before you'll die of diabetes. And that's where, the, that's where the compromise was. And if you look at your oral drugs today and look at the insert, that's what you'll find. The same kind of warnings you have on cigarettes. Now, I was very surprised when I saw the editorial appear in the Journal of the American Medical Association about the study, the University Group Diabetic Program study. Because I normally assume that the American Medical Association is very conservative and leans backwards in the wrong direction. But I'd like to read you what the editor said. Quote, It should not be overlooked that the very best control of blood sugar by experts did not significantly benefit this group of diabetic patients. One might even raise the question of whether physicians should expend time and money to diagnose adult onset diabetes if its medical management leads to no significant benefit. If traditional and highly regarded therapy for adult onset diabetes has no scientific basis and results in no benefit to the patient, it will not be the first cherished therapy to be abandoned. One only has to reflect on the current attitude towards bed rest for the treatment of tuberculosis and to recall how many millions of dollars staff effort and patient years were wasted on bed rest therapy before comparative clinical trials showed bed rest to be of no significant benefit. What a statement. If oral drugs are no good, let's get rid of them. We don't have to have any therapies that don't do us any good. Well, unfortunately, the American Medical Association journals still carry the advertising and full-page color ads of the oral diabetic drugs. Although this was in 1970, 
Right up to date, they're still carrying full-page ads, so it's obvious to me that the advertising manager and the editorial writers don't talk to each other, or else they wouldn't be carrying those ads. Well, after a period of time, the real problems of the oral drugs came out in other countries. The second line of oral drugs, the DBI, the Fenformins, were banned, after all, in this country in 1977, uh, seven years after the original findings, because of the excess deaths uh, these drugs caused to patients. But they had to be banned in other countries first before we decided to do them here. So it's sort of a tragedy that the United States has to wait until little countries like Norway uh, ban the drug first. In fact, in 1974, uh, the drugs that were banned reached almost 5 million prescriptions a year. It's a tragedy that we permit that to happen. Uh, in a country of our scientific responsibility. Now, many people say, well, if the American diet is so bad and creates all these problems, why aren't we all diabetic? I like to tell you that the average American is diabetic. It depends on when you give him his test. A study was done of young men, 14 to, I'm sorry, 17 to 42 years old, and they were all given the glucose tolerance test at 7 o'clock in the morning, and they all tested normal. But then, on another day, they got up, had their breakfast at 7 a.m., and then they weren't given any food for 12 hours, because the rule is you've got to fast 12 hours before a glucose tolerance test. They went to bed at 4 p.m., 7 p.m. they got up and they were given the glucose tolerance test. Now, if you remember that the free fatty acids in the bloodstream change every 12 hours. In the morning, when you wake up, they're the lowest. 12 hours later, they're the highest. They're 30 to 50 percent higher. And when the glucose tolerance test was taken in the evening, they all tested diabetic. How was that? The rise in free fatty acids, that little bit of extra fat was enough to put them in the diabetic state. That little bit of extra fat, because they had already so much fat in their blood, it only take a little bit, took a little bit more to push them into the diabetic range. Indeed, everyone in this country on the American diet is diabetic if you'll take their glucose tolerance test at 7 p.m. Thank you. You may wonder why it is that so few physicians are using this knowledge if indeed it is in the medical journals. And perhaps we can go to Dr. Kelly and West again of the University of Oklahoma Medical School and quote from an article he wrote, sort of an apology, sort of a confession of his own experience with uh, a high carbohydrate, low fat diet and this might be what you might find in thousands of other physicians' experience. It was called Diabetic Therapy, an Analysis of Failure, and it was in the in, in, uh, internal medical publication called Annals of Internal Medicine. And here's what he said. He said, I was treating a diabetic with severe hypertension in 1949. He said the rice diet of Dr. Walter Kempner had three times as much carbohydrate in as the diet the diabetic was on, and yet he found that the increase of carbohydrates required no increase in insulin. He said, like many other physicians who had this experience, I was reluctant to either fully accept the implications or to follow up the findings adequately. Now, the reason for his confusion was from the time that insulin was first used in our country, the way a physician worked it out, they'd feed the diabetics a certain amount of carbohydrates, and then they give them a certain amount of insulin. And they consider one balance the other, and so they had to hold that carbohydrates just right, because the idea was that insulin taking diabetic didn't have any of their own insulin. And if you double the amount of carbohydrates, then you'd have to double the amount of insulin. Well, Dr. West was quite surprised when he tripled the carbohydrates and required no more insulin. He said, however, in 1960 again, I did study another severely diabetic patient, and after a suitable time, I doubled their carbohydrates. Again, there was no change in insulin requirement. In the process of preparing a publication of this discovery, I was surprised to find that very similar experiments had been done before 1935 by Hemsworth, with the same results. Over and over again, this phenomenon had been rediscovered and subsequently forgotten or disregarded. What a confession for a man to make, who is an international authority in diabetes, to say that he himself 
and discovered the idea that high carbohydrate diets are better for, car for diabetics than the conventional high fat diet and yet he sort of pushed it aside when he first discovered it and now he's going to write it up and tell the world about it he was embarrassed to find it was done in 1935 and yet he continues yet most western physicians dietitians, and their patients still believe that limiting dietary carbohydrates is the main reason of diet therapy but history has shown that it's extremely difficult for physicians dietitians, and patients to give up the notion that carbohydrates are bad for people with too much sugar in their blood although as dr west has rediscovered the principle of returning most diabetics to normal Dr. Anderson has confirmed it in his recently published studies. The American Diabetic Association finally, in December of 79, made their first good commitment. It's going to take a little time before the rest of the country catches up. But you're far ahead in that you know what to do right now. Cancer is a dreaded disease in our countries and other countries around the world because it seems to be so mysterious. And more than that, the consequence of cancer seem to be almost universally fatal. And the death, of course, in cancer is something that nobody wishes to uh, experience. So that the investigation what causes cancer has been going at a rather furious pace for many years. Now the first concept was that viruses somehow cause cancer as a major source because we know what happens in animals. But the United States National Cancer Institute has spent 50 or 100 million dollars a year for 20 years and has never gotten a clue on the viral cause of cancer. And I believe that the research is going to find that if viruses indeed are responsible for any of human cancer, it's going to be so small to be of little consequence. Because now we realize that the major cause of cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer, and even lung cancer, are dietary caused or dietary controlled. Of course, we know that the principal stimulus to lung cancer is cigarettes in 90% of the cases. So it is a different kind of investigation that National Cancer Institute is looking at now. Remember, they're the federal agency that gets $1 billion a year of your tax money to try and find out what to do with cancer. You might say that the trends were, that have been developing finally let themselves be known when last October, that was October 1979, Dr. Arthur Upton, who was director at that time of the National Cancer Institute, <coughs> made a public statement. And what he said was, heretofore, when people ask us what diet to recommend to avoid cancer, we couldn't tell them. We didn't know enough to make a dietary recommendation. For all the years we've been in business, we haven't been able to make one dietary recommendation. However, now, October 79, we're making our first dietary recommendation. And it was interesting as to what Dr. Upton said. Because first of all, he said, you've got to cut down eating so many polyunsaturated fats. Well, that was curious because that's what the American Heart Association has been telling us to eat all these years. Why is the Dr. Upton says you've got to stop eating those polyunsaturates? Well, it's easy enough. Dr. Upton said that the polyunsaturated fats in animal studies have been shown to substantially increase colon or bowel cancer. Therefore, we can't recommend it. How about total fats? That's something else. Dr. Upton said you've got to cut down all fats from your diet because the evidence is so strong now that total fats are directly correlated to breast cancer and also prostate cancer. In countries, where the highest amount of fat is consumed per person, you have the highest amount of breast cancer in the world. In countries on the lowest amount of fat in the world, you have the lowest amount of breast cancer in the world. It's just what we call a straight line relationship. And Dr. Upton closed by saying, my recommendation is to increase your intake of whole grains, fruits, and vegetables. Well, that should sound familiar to you, because that's our recommendation. Considering this the very first recommendation for cancer, I think we have to look back at it and see the basis of Dr. Upton's recommendations. Well, first of all, as far as colon cancer, colon cancer is number two in our country, 50 or so thousand deaths a year, and the investigations in colon cancer have gone back away. Dr. Dennis Burkett of England has had some thoughts on it, and Dr. Ernst Winder, 
the president of the American Health Foundation New York, has done a lot of work on it, and I can put you up to date on what the current concepts are. On the normal high-fat diet that the average American eats, it takes a certain amount of bile to help digest that fat. In fact, the amount of bile that the uh, average American makes to digest the amount of fat he eats is anywhere up to 10 times more bile than you require with the diet that I recommend. Well, this tremendous amount of bile sets up an environment in the intestinal tract, the large intestine, for a certain kind of bacteria to grow very well the anaerobic bacteria, because these bile-eating uh, bacteria actually love to live in this atmosphere. They take the bile and they eat it, and their excretion products, their bowel movement, is the breakdown products of bile. One of the breakdown products is called deoxycholic acid, which we know is, is carcinogenic or co-carcinogenic, and also a certain kind of hormone that is absorbed back into the blood and sort of stimulates the sex target organs. Now, on the high-fat diet that makes this environment uh, possible in order to uh, uh, grow these bacteria, the tragedy is that only in those countries that are on high-fat diets do you find these kind of anaerobic bacteria. And only in these countries that have a high amount of anaerobic bacteria and that the, their breakdown products of bile called deoxycholic acid exist, you find bowel cancer. In fact, you don't find bowel cancer unless you have a high amount of this cancer-producing substance produced by the bacteria in your large intestine. Now, you may be curious as to how bacteria, these little one-cell animals, so tiny you can't see them without a microscope, can create this problem. It'd be easier to understand when you know how many bacteria you have in your last four feet of tubing, your large intestine. You have more bacteria in your last four feet of tubing than there are people in the world. There's four or five billion people in the world, but you have more bacteria than that. And they're all living very peacefully in your large intestine, enjoying your bile as it comes down, and living well off the fat of your land. They don't pay any rent. They do you nothing but a disservice if they're anaerobic bacteria. In fact, you have so much bacteria in your bowel that if you sample your bowel movement for 24 hours, one-fourth to one-third of the total weight of your bowel movement would be in your own bacteria. You produce so much bacteria that every single day, a fourth to a third of your bowel movement is in your own bacteria. They multiply tremendously fast. One of these little bacterium, because they multiply about every 20 minutes, in eight hours can produce two million bacteria. So you can see where you can have plenty of them to spare every day. Now, in addition to the problem of the deoxycholic acid, which incidentally, the good bacteria that you would have if you were on the low-fat diet, because on that diet, anaerobic bacteria are so small in the intestinal tract that they hardly count. The major bacteria on the low-fat diet is called aerobic bacteria. They live with oxygen, and they do not have the power to eat bile, so they can't make the carcinogenic byproduct, deoxycholic acid. So the big thought now in colon cancer is to go back to low-fat diets, and that's one thing the Dr. Upton would like to see us do. Now, years ago, probably 15 years ago, Dr. Jeremiah Stanler, who at that time was president of the Chicago Board of Health, did a study with about 900 men working for the People's Gas Company, and these were all smokers. And he was trying to see the relationships of the length of time they were smoking and the amount of cigarettes they were smoking to lung cancer. And it was very difficult for him to find a relationship because he found some men that smoked a long time with no lung cancer, men who smoked a much shorter time with considerable lung cancer, and couldn't figure out why there was no relationship. He tried other factors like whether married or not, whether they were active or not, worked in the office or worked with the gas fumes and so on, and couldn't find a relationship until he took their blood levels. And then he found his first relationship. And he found out <coughs> that there was a straight line relationship between their cholesterol level <coughs> and their lung cancer rates. <coughs> in fact, if their cholesterol level is less than 225 milligrams per cent, there were only five lung cancer cases per thousand. If the cholesterol level was 250, 
There were 18 lung cancer cases per thousand. If the cholesterol level was 275 or more, there were 37 lung cancer deaths per thousand. Cholesterol 275 or more, 37 deaths, compared to cholesterol 225 or less, only five deaths, 37 to five, based on cholesterol level. In those days, we couldn't understand at all what does cholesterol level have to do with lung cancer, but we've learned since what the relationships are. And in the studies that many of scientists have made, like Dr. Carroll of Canada, so on, and little animals, he finds if you take an animal and feed him a diet of no cholesterol whatsoever, and you transplant a tumor on the animal, the tumor grows to a certain size. But if you add 1% cholesterol to the diet, the tumor grows much larger, 2% much larger, 3% much larger. In other words, you can almost determine the size of that cancerous tumor on that animal by the amount of cholesterol you feed the animal. I couldn't understand at all what the cholesterol has to do with the growth of that malignant tumor. Other scientists have tried to see what the relationship was. In fact, one physician uh, who reported his study in the New England Journal of Medicine reported three cases of prostate cancer, proven prostate cancer by biopsy in three men. And he arranged for them to lower their cholesterol level very considerably in a hurry. And in every case, the prostate cancer disappeared by biopsy. So it's proven that in three cases, you got rid of cancer by lowering cholesterol level considerably and rapidly. So cholesterol level obviously is rather important, and it was just a very short time ago when we discovered what cholesterol has to do with cancers generally. And the discovery was that high cholesterol levels paralyze the big white blood cell that eats cancer cells, the big macrophage. It makes it so it just cannot eat cancer cells or eat bacteria, eat viruses. And I think one of the best studies that illustrated this was just done a recently short time ago, and it was reported out in Nature, which is a scientific publication in December 1978. And what they did was take two groups of animals, and they gave them both identically the same diet. In fact, it was a synthetic diet, so there would be absolutely no difference from day to day. Natural foods vary somewhat in their composition, and so that you may say, well, the reasons the animals got better or worse is because there was a variation in the vitamin content and the carbohydrate content and the fiber and so on. But with synthetic diets, they're manufactured exactly the same every day. The diet they use is called Vibonex. Vibonex is a synthetic liquid drink, and the formula is 90% glucose. That's the carbohydrate. Glucose is a simple sugar uh, that uh, is the same as corn syrup. And 8.5% protein in the form of all synthetic amino acids. Remember that protein is made of amino acids. And then about 1% fat to give us the basic fat that the animals require and humans require called linoleic acid. It also had whatever vitamins and minerals the body naturally needs. Now this diet has been proven for a number of years. Children, for example, have been on this diet totally for two and a half years, and yet on that diet they've grown six and eight inches. So that we know it, it can contains all the things necessary for life. Well, these animals were put on Vibonex. Now, the difference was that one group of animals had their Vibonex spiked with cholesterol. They gave them the equivalent of cholesterol that a human would have if they ate two eggs a day, 600 milligrams of cholesterol. And so these little animals had that difference. One set, Vibonex plus cholesterol, the other, Vibonex without cholesterol. Now all the animals were given a chemical through a stomach tube right into their stomachs that always creates bowel or colon cancer. Dimethylhydrazine, very potent chemical. After a year, let me tell you what happened. Of all the animals that were on the cholesterol part of the diet, 100% of them developed bowel or colon cancer. 90% already died of the colon cancer. 10% were still alive, but they were dying of the colon cancer. Well, that wiped out that population pretty well, but we expected it. We expected they would all die of colon cancer because that normally is what happens with hydrazine drugs. How about the other population without the cholesterol? That's a real surprise. 20% of them died within a year of colon cancer. The other 80% were alive and kicking with no signs of cancer whatsoever after a year. How is that possible? 
But what happened is that with no cholesterol at all in their food, their macrophages, their white blood cells, were so active that they were able to eat the cancer cells as soon as they were formed. And while the chemical was going through the body creating cancer cells, in 20% of the cases, the production of cancer cells was so great it overwhelmed the ability of the white blood cells to fight it, and they died. But in the other 80%, the white blood cells were able to eat more cancer cells than were able to damage the white blood cells. And when the chemical passed out of the body and no more cancer cells were formed, the body remained perfectly healthy. In fact, the investigators say this. They say that our observations corroborate the concept that specifically suggests that dietary cholesterol is a factor determining the rate of development of experimental colon cancer. If this applies to man as the metabolic experience and evidence would suggest, then human colon cancer may be a preventable disease. Isn't that marvelous? If we limit the cholesterol, we can make your white blood cells much more active, and perhaps colon cancer then could be something only in history books. Now we understand something about Dr. Jeremiah Stamler's study with lung cancer, because with the high rate of cholesterol level, that's where they had all their high rates of lung cancer. Now we understand that the high rate of cholesterol level paralyzed the ability of the white blood cell to eat the cancer cell formed by the cigarettes. Now we're not telling you to have a low cholesterol level so you can smoke and not have lung cancer because you get other problems. You'll have heart disease. Smoking's not good for any reason. But we certainly see the advantage of dropping your cholesterol. Now Dr. Pauling tells us a lot about vitamin C helping cancer. Yet in his own laboratory, studies done by Dr. Arthur Robinson d demonstrated this. With hairless mice, and he had about 900 hairless mice in this study, now, hairless mice is, uh, are convenient because if you give them ultraviolet treatment, radiation, they develop skin cancers. And the average on the average diet given to these little animals that have a little bit of cholesterol in, a little bit of fish meal, a little bit of liver meal, about 50 mice get 50 skin cancers. And when he gave them vitamin C in any quantity from zero up to probably 50,000 milligrams a day equivalent to humans, in every case their skin cancers increased. And when he gave them vitamin C equivalent to what Dr. Pauline takes himself, 10,000 milligrams a day, their skin cancers doubled. Well that was interesting. But when he gave them a different diet that had no cholesterol in whatsoever, instead of 50 cancers for 50 mice, it dropped down to 13 cancers for 50 mice, almost down to nothing. He didn't know at that time why dropping the cholesterol out would almost stop the cancer growth, but we understand now what does it. It permitted the white blood cells to eat the cancer cells and do the best for the body. I would say that the best cancer diet, prevention diet one could have, is to limit your cholesterol intake. Now the problem with cholesterol and with fat does other things too. Because in the case of breast cancer, the estrogen part of what these anaerobic bacteria do to you uh, is just as damaging as the deoxycholic acid that comes out of their little uh, bodies when they eat bile. Because the estrogen that comes out is absorbed back in the bloodstream, it creates a real problem. Now how important is it to worry about a little bit of extra estrogen that goes into the body? Let me tell you how sensitive the body is to estrogen not made by your own sex organs. A little three and a half year old girl was using some of her mother's estrogen containing face cream. It was around the house, just smearing it all over her body, having great fun. And the mother thought that was sort of a babysitter and didn't pay much attention. Two months after she started using this estrogen containing face cream, the little girl's breasts started to grow. Well, that frightened the mother, brought it to a physician, examined the little girl, and found out that her uterus was appearance, had the appearance was equivalent to that of an adult female menstruating uh, uterus at three and a half years old. Well, how is it possible that she could have developed that fast? Because when they tried to figure out how much estrogen was absorbed through this little girl's skin, it was so tiny they could hardly believe it. It didn't seem like it could mean anything. Estrogens are very potent when they're not made by the body to force the body's sex organs to grow. Well, how about the Planned Parenthood studies? 
Planned Parenthood has reported 100,000 women who before they took oral contraceptives, and these are hormone estrogens that I use to control menstrual cycles for birth control. These women report as not having any cysts, uh, cervical cysts uh, in the uterus before they started. And yet in six months, 25% of them had cysts. In two years, 80% had cysts. And now we know that cysts are usually a pre-sign of malignancies. And so certainly they're not good to have. But that gives you an idea of the tremendous effect that these oral hormone estrogens have upon women. Well, how about Premarin? Premarin is that postmenopausal estrogen uh, hormone that many women take after menopause. And the very large kinds of studies have indicated to us that if you're on Premarin one or two years, there's a 400% greater instance of uterine cancer, endometrial cancer. If you're on Premarin seven years or more, there's a 1,400% greater increase of uterine cancer. 14 women will develop the cancer in the uterus, endometrial cancer, compared to one who will not be on hormones. So we begin to see that its hormones could really be a problem when they're not made by the body. And that probably explains the earlier onset of menarche. Menarche is the first menstruation of a female. And it used to be that a female would grow up and become physically mature, 17, 18 years old, and then become sexually mature and have her first menstruation at 17, 18, 19 years old. Well, how is it that women today, children, are menstruating at 10, 11, 12 years old? How is it possible? Has heredity of man changed so that the whole menstrual cycle is way off that much? Well, this has only happened in the last 75, 100 years when whole nations have decided to go on a high-fat diet where before it was only for rich people and royalty. Well, with a high-fat diet, from the time you're a year old, you have anaerobic bacteria eating all the bile and making deoxycholic acid that eventually could create the colon cancer and also creating the hormones, the sex-like hormones that go back into the blood and force growth on the ovaries, breasts, and uterus. And that's why many authorities think that we now have a much earlier first menstruation because of this tremendous pressure of growth by the hormones from your own bacteria. And the pressure from your own bacteria of forcing these sex hormones into the blood, many physicians, investigators feel are primarily responsible for the breast cancer that we see. This tremendous pressure on growth by these hormones, sex hormones from your own bacteria create excess development of the breasts, ovaries, and uterus, and forcing rapid growth, which could be the precursor for breast cancer. Because we know that there are certain things we can test, for example, the prolactin level in the blood. That's the level that rises when a woman is pregnant and she is about to uh, develop milk from the breast for the infant and so on, so the, that hormone put out by the pituitary gland rises. But we, after uh, uh, lactation, after breastfeeding and so on, it goes back to normal. In the populations where breast cancer is very low or almost unknown, prolactin level normally is reasonably low in women. In our country, it's always high in women. And if you take women in our country, and Dr. Ernst Winder has done this, and he's had a study with our own population here, uh, where they come in on the first day and we take blood values, and we take it four weeks later. Dr. Winder has found if you take American women on the normal high-fat diet and they have high prolactin levels, you put them on the low-fat, low-cholesterol diet, and in a very short time, the prolactin levels drop down to that of Japanese women. That is, since Japanese women only have 10% of the rate of breast cancer as U.S. women, in effect, you've dropped their breast cancer risk 90% by changing their diet. So we've got a lot of things to say about the diet change in relation to cancer. Not only colon cancer, not only lung cancer, which we always thought was strictly caused by cigarettes, and now we see how important it is to drop cholesterol level, but also in breast cancer. And the tragedy of breast cancer it might be reflected in the statement that Dr. Ernst Winder made before the Senate hearings on nutrition, when he said, in this country, if we could drop the fat and cholesterol in the diet down to levels such as our diet recommends, three principal cancers could disappear in this country colon cancer, prostate cancer, and breast cancer. And breast cancer is the number one cause of death in women 35 to 55 years old. It's such a tragedy 
that we have to wait for these deaths and the suffering to happen before we make dietary changes. But we don't have to worry longer because we know now what to do, and there's nothing to stop us from making these changes, and we ought to do them today. The first 900 patients that came to the center uh, were from about uh, July of 1975 to September of 1977. And their results have been evaluated by the Loma Linda the School of Public Health, their statistical uh, survey department, Dr. David Abbey uh, doing the direction. And some very interesting data has come out of that, and I'd like to give you some idea of what happens to people who come to our center in the four-week period that they're here. First of all, I should tell you that the diet that we use meets all the RDA specifications. That is, we meet all the federal specifications for protein, fats, carbohydrates, minerals, and vitamins, so that there is no question with the health authorities about the uh, composition of our diet, but more than meeting just the specifications, what does it do for your health? Well, first I should say that the average person coming in, if there would be an average age, might be between 50 and 70 years old. So they're somewhere centered around the 60-year-old age. And the average person coming in, uh, if we look at their diseases, uh, two-thirds of them have what we call atherosclerotic heart disease. Uh, Fifty percent of them have angina. Half of them have a stress treadmill test that's not good. About uh, 28 or 9 percent have more than 20 percent over their desired weight, and that puts them into the obese class. About a third had a heart attack before they came. Uh, out of the 900 people, uh, 77 had coronary bypass surgery, and about 65 or 70 were recommended or scheduled to have coronary bypass surgery. Now, as far as cholesterol level is concerned, the average cholesterol level of the population was about 235 milligrams per cent. And when they left, their cholesterol level dropped to 175 as an average. Even the highest risk ones uh, that were above 320 milligrams of cholesterol, whose average was 380 milligrams of cholesterol, dropped to 243 milligrams of cholesterol. In fact, I would think that about 90% when they left the center had cholesterol levels below 200 milligrams per cent. So that there has been a considerable change. The average change in just three weeks time has been 26% drop in cholesterol level. Now, getting our major population under 200 milligrams, uh, I think was very helpful because the Framingham study tells us that if cholesterol level is 260 or more, there's a 400% greater incidence in heart disease deaths or, or events than if your cholesterol is below 220. So 260 is a very bad number, and yet many physicians and health authorities would consider that in the range of normal. So I'm happy to have about 90% of our people below 200, which I think takes them out of the high-risk area. <laughs> now, many people come in on drugs to lower their cholesterol level, and the principal drug that's used in our study is atrimid S, or clofibrate. Clofibrate has now been somewhat discredited as a drug, but still it's being used quite a bit. I would estimate that probably 400,000 people are on atrimid S in the country today. Now. Atrimid S can lower cholesterol probably 15, 20 percent. And if you take people off atrimid S, the cholesterol rebounds and jumps up 5, 10, 15 percent. So we had people come in with atrimid S, and their average cholesterol level was 265 milligrams per cent. We took them off of the drug on day one, and I'm sure that it rebounded up, but yet when they left, their cholesterol was only 207. So we were able to drop their cholesterol level an average of 22 percent even after we took them off their medication. In fact, when they left, almost two-thirds had cholesterol levels less than 200 milligrams per cent. Now, as far as triglycerides, triglyceride is not considered the 
potent risk factor for heart disease cholesterol is, but we certainly want to keep triglycerides down. Now, triglycerides are that particular kind of fat in the blood. The average triglyceride was 174 milligrams per cent coming in. And when people left, it dropped down to 130 as an average. We had an average drop of about 25%. Now, the highest levels, people with triglycerides over 500, we had drops of 70%. So the diet is very effective in reducing high triglycerides. And yet, many health authorities have been to the opinion for years that high-carbohydrate diets such as ours would raise triglycerides. And because of their articles and their lectures and so on, physicians have been frightened about the concept of a high carbohydrate diet. They all thought it was going to be a catastrophe for the patient, raising his triglycerides up to unacceptable levels. But that misunderstanding was because health professionals have not understood that there's a difference between carbohydrates, that simple carbohydrates like sugar, honey, molasses indeed will raise triglycerides. But complex carbohydrates, food has grown that's been unrefined like potatoes, beans, and peas, whole grains, and so on, lower triglycerides, and that has been their mistake, and that's why on our 80% carbohydrate diet, when we have triglycerides over 500, they drop 70% in just three weeks' time. So that I would say that when people left our center, 95% had levels below 170 milligrams per cent, which is the American high, uh, when they left. Now, Atrimides... Uh, is quite effective at reducing cholesterol levels, perhaps 15 or 20 percent. But one thing it can do, and that is reduce triglycerides up to 40 percent. So it's a very effective triglyceride-lowering drug. And we had a number of participants that came in on Atrimides with high triglyceride levels. Now, the average triglyceride of those coming in on Atrimides was 201, and yet when they left, their triglyceride level drop 21% to 158. Now you may wonder about that because when you take people off atrimides, triglycerides rebound and elevate uh, equivalent to some fraction of what dropped in the first place. So I think it's quite remarkable that we've been able to absorb that elevation and still have a drop almost equivalent to as if they had not been on the drug at all. For those on atrimides, about 85% had triglycerides less than 170 when they left our place. Now we have measured the total number of fats in people's blood. We call it the total lipids. And people come with an average of 750 milligrams per cent of total lipids. And when they leave, they're about 564. What we mainly do is take most of them out of the high risk range. How about gout? Elevation of uric acid is considered something that just practically uh, can't be handled with a dietary approach. Most physicians feel there's no hope except for medical treatment, drug treatment. We disagree, and I think that the data certainly shows that. We have 37 people come in diagnosed with gout on medication. By the end of the three to four week period, 29 out of the 37 were off the medications with uric acid levels less than seven milligrams per cent. 72% off their medications. Their uric acid is being controlled very nicely by the diet instead of the drug. Now, as far as other clinical risk factors like smoking and weight and so on, we've done well with these. Our records seem to indicate that 86% were not smoking compared to those that came in that were smoking. Now, we don't have as yet follow-up figures to see how many continued not to smoke. But from our data, I would say that most of them are still not smoking, so that the once they've gotten off the smoking and stayed on the diet, they seem to stop smoking rather permanently. As far as weight reduction, for those who wanted to lose as much weight as they could, they lost an average of a half a pound a day, about 13 and a half pounds for the 26 days. Our present data is a little better than that, people that want to lose maximum weight have lost about 16 or 17 pounds on average in the 26 days. Now, hypertension is something I think that's been very neglected in 
uh, considering nutrition as a therapy. Uh, physicians, when they think about nutrition as a therapy for hypertension, they'll think about lowering salt, perhaps, or losing weight. But they don't think beyond that. They don't think there's any other importance beyond that. It's my impression that the amount of fat in the diet is at least as important as the amount of salt in the diet. And we're trying to study that further. But at least our results in hypertension, I think, are far better than any other nutritional therapy that's been reported in the medical literature. For example, we consider hypertensive as those who had at least a one-year history of hypertension and that were on antihypertensive medications on admission. And what we've done, instead of taking the blood pressures on the first day and the last day and comparing them, uh, we've decided to be more conservative. And so our first initial, what we call baseline blood pressure, was an average of the second, third, and fourth, and fifth days. Many people by the third and fourth and fifth days lost their elevated blood pressure or off medication already. So that the results are not going to show up as dramatic as it would have been if they'd been on the first and last day. But taking the baseline as the second, third, fourth, and fifth day, and then the final blood pressure as the 22nd, 23rd, 24th day, we still had this record. Of all those that came in on blood pressure medication, and they had been on blood pressure medication, many of them for up to 20 years, 85% were off their blood pressure medication with normal blood pressure. Now that's a very high average. And when you consider that the recommendation for hypertensive patients is drug therapy on a daily basis for the rest of their life, you can see where there's a potential to getting millions of people off medication for the rest of their life and having normal blood pressures. We had 218 people coming in with blood pressure medication. 136 were off with normal blood pressures. Perhaps it might be easier to understand it if we go back to Dr. James Iacono's work he was Chief of Human Research at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Dr. Iacono did a study where he took normal men and women and put them on the typical American diet of 43% fat, 10 grams of salt, that's a third of an ounce of salt a day, and measured various parameters, checked their blood pressures closely and other things, and then only made one change. He dropped the fat from 43% fat to 25% fat kept the salt the same, kept the calories the same, he didn't want them to lose any weight. And within 10 days time, everyone's blood pressure, both the top and bottom numbers, dropped 10%. Well, this was very good because a 10% drop could take abnormal people and make them normal. And one fascinating discovery he made was that the platelets, the little cells that control clotting, the platelets in the normal person are stuck together in fair quantities. And he found that the amount of platelet aggregation and the amount of small platelets sticking together decreased 50% after being 10 days on this lower fat diet. He kept them on this program for 40 days. Their blood pressure stayed down. The platelets stayed down low as far as sticking together. And then he brought them back up to their original fat diet. That was a 43%. Remember all this time, no one gained or lost any weight. The salt was exactly the same, so that did not affect their blood pressure. And yet, after just changing the diet back to 43%, all the blood pressures elevated back to where they were. They gained 10%, and the platelets all stuck together just the way they were. So Dr. Iacono certainly demonstrated that fat in his diet was 25% fat. Ours is 8% fat. Perhaps that's why we're more effective than his was. But I think that his diet is a help to explain uh, that we do have some confirmation in our concept that fat is a major uh, constituent in the understanding of uh, drop of blood pressure. Now, as far as diabetics, we've been very successful with adult onset diabetics. And since adult onset diabetics comprise 90% of the diabetic population, they're an important group. And we found that of all the diabetics who came into us on insulin, adult onsets, 50% no longer required insulin within the three or four week period. If we look at their cholesterol levels, they were somewhat higher than the non-diabetic population, have an average of 277 milligrams percent cholesterol. Perhaps that's one indication as to why diabetics have so much more heart disease. The diet that they're on 
creates a much higher cholesterol level because they're recommended a rather high fat, high cholesterol diet to avoid carbohydrates. And that's reflected in the average non-diabetic had a cholesterol 235 and the average diabetic 277. Well, after the 26-day period, their average cholesterol level dropped to 191, a drop of almost one-third. And as far as triglycerides, the average triglyceride coming in was about 227, and that dropped to 158, another average of about one-third. So diabetics drop their cholesterol and triglycerides about 50% more than non-diabetics on our dietary program. In fact, one diabetic had a triglyceride level of 2,770, and this man was on Atramides. We took him off Atramides, and yet he dropped his triglyceride down to 180 in just three weeks' time. So the high carbohydrate diet, as we have it, of natural foods, unrefined foods, is very effective in dropping triglyceride levels. Now, Dr. James Anderson, who's chief of endocrinology at the University of Kentucky Medical Center, has been using this dietary approach that we originally taught him five years ago, and he's been using it for his diabetics, and he's now published rather widely and documented the same results we have, that most adult onset diabetics no longer require insulin within a matter of a few weeks on this kind of diet. And we hope that this is going to convince health professionals that if you want to help degenerative diseases, uh, these 900 former participants are a good demonstration of what can happen in just a three to four week period. Thank you. This talk is a summary talk that gives an overview <coughs> to the four weeks of lectures that cover the nutritional relationships to degenerative diseases. The degenerative diseases are defined as those diseases that are unnatural to man, that never happens to primates in the wild, and that rarely happen to those in the undeveloped nations that don't have the benefits <coughs> of the high fat, high cholesterol diet that we have in the developed nations. Now many causes for these degenerative diseases, and just to name them so you'll be familiar with them, these degenerative diseases are called heart disease, diabetes, arthritis, cancer in many forms, gallstones, or high blood pressure, glaucoma, cataract, loss of hearing. These are all the degenerative diseases, diseases that are unknown to primates and to man in his natural state. Now many people have looked for causes for these diseases. They look for viruses, look for toxins, pesticides, stress, heredity. However, we're going to find, and we're finding every day in scientific experiments, that the causes of these degenerative diseases and these incidents are the principal cause of death in the developed nations that the cause of these diseases are from the ordinary foods that we eat. They're the ordinary foods that we're taught to love by our parents, and they're the foods that are considered indispensable to a good nutritional diet by the nutritionists that advise people in our country and countries like ours. Ordinary foods in excess can become poisonous to the body. Water, iron, these are all substances we consider absolutely indispensable. Iron is part of the red blood cell. Without the red blood cell, you would be dead. And yet the iron comprises 5% of the total weight of a red blood cell. Yet in Africa, in Bantu country, 10 million Bantus use iron pots to cook their food. And the iron rusts a little bit. And the little bit of rust then gets into their food. And in a period of time, the iron overloads the liver. And the principal cause of death then is iron overloading of the liver. The iron just fills the liver to such an extent it's just like an alcoholic who has cirrhosis of the liver and dies from that cause. Iron overloading the liver. So too much iron and too much of other things can create poisonings to the body. 
the principal toxic factors in the developed nation's diet that creates their degenerative diseases are simply the fats, the cholesterol, and in a lesser way, the refined foods. We have an additional insult in developed nations, and that is the smoking habit. But that's an aside. So you have to ask then, what diet should one be on? And how do you determine the best diet for man? What is a natural diet for man? What's a diet he should be on? If you want to ask what the natural diet for chimpanzees might be, it's very simple. You go into the wilds of Africa, you find chimpanzees that have never been disturbed by man, and observe what they eat, and you'll know what the natural diet is. But you can't find a group of men that have not been affected by civilization. There is no natural diet for man any more that you can find, so you'll have to guess what it could have been. And our guess is that the natural diet of man had to be a diet where refined foods are not included. And by refined foods we mean, and these are the, many of the artificial foods that are not found in nature, the foods that are derived and manufactured. For example, one manufactured food is margarine. Margarine is considered rather an important food in the food supply, yet margarine is a manufactured food made by chemical processes out of various fats and oils. It's called a hydrogenated, hydrogenated fat made by chemical methods. Now, butter itself is a manufactured food. Without man taking the milk of a, an animal, separating the fat out, processing the fat in a certain way to create the butter, you couldn't have it. Oils, vegetable oils, are considered natural foods, but they're not. Without man taking the nut and seed, the corn and so on from which oil is made and process them by very special ways, you couldn't have oil. For example, it takes 14 ears of corn to make one tablespoon of corn oil. When you have to treat the corn, you've got to put it in lye, sodium hydroxide. Some people call it Drainex, Purex, that is Drainex for your toilets. That lye then traces down the corn kernel structure and eventually oil comes out so that these are unnatural ways to produce foods. Cheeses are man's invention. The dairy products, it's unnatural, for example. There isn't a group in the world that has its milk after its wean. Man is an exception. He gets it from other animals and uses their milk as part of a drink. And we have unnatural animals. These are the feedlot animals. These are the animals raised under artificial conditions. There are chickens that are raised that never see the ground. They're in cages all through their lifetime. Animals are fed with hormones to make them grow faster, make them grow heavier. Beef animals have intense marbling on their skin, in their muscles, between their muscle fibers. In fact, a beef lot animal, feedlot animal, can have 50% of its total carcass in fat whereas a range-fed animal only has 9%. So you already have 500% more fat in an artificially grown animal than a natural animal. It may be that's why our ancestors could eat the natural animals, perhaps in larger quantities than we can today without having disastrous effects. When you look at foods, people have mistaken ideas because of the pressures of the wrong kind of information, the so-called nutritionists that run our society and determine our food intake. Potatoes are considered fat, yet potatoes have 1% of their total calories in fat. Bananas are considered fattening, yet they only contain 2% of their total calories in fat. Cheese is considered a high-protein food, yet it contains 70% of its total calories in fat. Nuts are considered a high-protein food, yet they're 75% of the total calories in fat. A good fillet is considered a choice piece of protein. You get an excellent fillet, it can be 85% total calories in fat, 12% protein. A slice of bread can have more protein than a good fillet. So we have mistaken ideas about what foods are composed of. And if you eat foods that are refined, like sugar or fat, neither of which have 
calories, I mean anything but calories, neither of which have vitamins, minerals, dietary fiber, they're just straight calories. That's the way to gain weight because sugar and fat can be eaten in great quantities without really being, uh, feeling that you have satisfied your hunger. And it's only in countries that eat we find foods where there's such a thing as overweight. What happens when you violate nature's laws and eat the refined foods? We have that in Dr. Swank's works, Dr. Crow's works, Dr. Friedman's works. Dr. Swank, for example, in his first work on determining what happens in the body when you have cream, high fat in the, in the uh, meal, took little hamsters. And the reason he selected them is because they have large cheek pouches. He pulled open the cheek pouch, clamped it tight, and with a microscope looked at the fine blood vessels that he could see through the transparent skin or membrane of the inside of the mouth. And all the vessels were free-flowing. All the little blood vessels, you can see the little cells going through. Yet when he gave them a glass of heavy cream, within an hour and a half to two hours, the little cells started to stick together and form great clumps blocking the vessels. In five or six hours, probably 25% of all the vessels were blocked in these little hamsters. At the same time, he measured the amount of oxygen in their blood and in their tissues. One third less oxygen is what he measured. He decided not to give them anything more to eat for 72 hours to see when the oxygen level would restore the normal. And it took 72 hours and they still were 5% less oxygen when they started. Well, he couldn't keep them without food any longer. But in the American diet, where one fat meal follows another every six hours, everybody has blocked vessels all the time. When Dr. Quo, Peter Quo, a cardiologist in Philadelphia at that time, decided to see if Swank's experiments work on his angina patients, he invited 14 angina patients to his office, took some blood samples, the blood was reasonably clear, taped them to electrocardiographic equipment, no coronary insufficiency, and then gave him a glass of heavy cream. And it only took four to five hours when the fat and the cream poured into the bloodstream to block enough vessels so that he registered 14 cases of angina. The electrocardiogram confirmed the angina. The blood samples had five times as much fat as when he started. And when Dr. Williams did his work, he was able to confirm that the small vessels of the eyes that were completely open before the cream drink after the cream drink, many vessels were closed, just like in the hamster study. And when Dr. Crow did this test again, a short time later with the same angina patients, he gave them another drink. This time, there was no fat in the drink, just protein and carbohydrates, but the same amount of calories and the same amount of bulk. And this time, five hours after the test, the blood had no additional fat in it, the electrocardiograms were all completely normal, and there wasn't a single angina attack. When Dr. Meyer Friedman of the Mount Zion Hospital in San Francisco, he wrote the book on type A and type B personalities. He believes in the stress theory to some extent. But he was concerned about the American Heart Association recommendations that it's all right to eat your natural diet as you eat in this country, but just change the kind of fat that you eat. Use polyunsaturates instead of saturated fats. He knew that saturated fat created blockages of the, of the vessels in the body but he never tested polyunsaturated fats. So he got together about 40 firemen from San Francisco and after an overnight fast, photographed the fine vessels in their eyes and noted they're all wide open. And if you look at his article in the Journal of the American Medical Association, you'll be able to see the vessels all open. And then he gave them a glass of heavy cream. Five hours after the cream drink, you could probably see 25 blockages in the eyes of these firemen. And you can see those photographs in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Uh, later on, when he took the same firemen and this time gave them a drink of polyunsaturated fat, which is safflower oil, a very popular polyunsaturated fat, five hours after the drink, the blockages were just as severe and just as many as with the butter fat. The difference was that with the butter fat drink, nine hours after the test, the butter fat had gotten out of the system. But with the safflower oil, nine hours after the test, the polyunsaturated fat had not yet started to leave the system.
We don't know when it got out of the system. He stopped his test in nine hours. Dr. Friedman was very concerned and in his summary of his article said he warns against the idea of substituting polyunsaturates for saturates, especially when both block just as effectively the small vessels in the body. He urged the reduction of all fats. That was 1965. We wonder when the American Heart Association is going to read their own material. It's only been 13 years. If you look at the latest cookbook the American Heart Association has put out just last year, and you look through the recipes, you'll have to wash your hands afterwards because they're filled with corn oil. Every recipe just about has corn oil in it. The American Heart Association doesn't seem to agree with Dr. Friedman. Well, how important is diet in coronary heart disease? And first, I should say that heart disease is a bad term because in most cases, unless you've had a heart attack, there's nothing wrong with your heart. Your heart's as good as it was when you were a teenager. The problem is not heart disease, it's artery disease. The little vessels, the coronary vessels that feed your heart are narrowed, and they're narrowed so much that you begin to have symptoms. The heart muscle is struggling to keep alive, not enough blood flow, which means not enough oxygen, and that's what heart disease is, closure of the arteries that feed the heart like any other muscle would have. So that artery disease is a real problem. And when we talk about diet and heart disease, how important is it? We can only look at the Framingham study. The Framingham study has been going on for almost 30 years now. 5,200 people have been monitored every two years with extensive examinations, and all the scientists did was to watch them live, watch them die, watch them get their heart attacks, watch them get diabetes, and so on. They offer them no advice. They just monitor them. And what we find in the Framingham study, if your cholesterol level is 260 or higher, you have 400% greater incidence of coronary events and deaths than if it's 220 or less. That doesn't take a great difference in cholesterol level to create a tremendous excess in coronary deaths. We find this so with many of the studies. But these are studies where we're observing. It'd be interesting to go right to angiographic studies, like the Cleveland Clinic studies. Cleveland Clinic, one of the largest surgical institutions in the country, has been doing angiographic studies, coronary angiograms, x-rays of the inside of the coronary arteries for many, many years. They've done thousands of these. And they have been able, because of their vast experience, make correlations between what they see in the x-ray of the inside of the arteries and other factors. And they feel that cholesterol level seems to be the principal predictive factor for closing your arteries. For example, if your cholesterol level is under 200, they find that only one out of five of the people who come through their center have significantly closed coronary arteries. But if the cholesterol level is 360 or more, 91% have significant closure. And they find that in every step, as cholesterol level rises, the arteries are more closed. More people have closed arteries. Cleveland Clinic decided that they had so much confidence in their work, they did what we call a double-blind study. That means the original physicians that looked at the data didn't know who the patients were, and the patients didn't know who were doing their tests and so on. Sixty men came into Cleveland Clinic, and they had their age, cholesterol levels, and triglyceride levels taken. A group of physicians that never had to see the patients took these three numbers, cholesterol level, age, and triglycerides. The age was important because that tells us how long the cholesterol has been at that level, piling up in the body. And they made a prediction based on all their experience as to which of these 60 are going to have significantly closed coronary arteries. The men then went to the radiologist. The angiograms were taken, and then they tabulated the closure of the arteries against the original predictions. And out of the original 60 predictions, 59 were absolutely correct. One mistake out of 60. There's no better predictive test in the world, 98% predictive accuracy. And all they have to know is what your cholesterol level is and your triglyceride level and your age. So if anyone tells you that cholesterol level is not a good factor in predicting closure of the arteries, refer them to the Cleveland Clinic study. Now there are many diets around the world. There are hundreds of different diets. Many diets are associated with artery closure. Many diets are not. But there are principally only two kinds of diets in our world. 
There's the high-fat diet of the developed nations, and then there's a very low-fat diet of the undeveloped nations. The high-fat diet has 40 to 45 percent of its total calories in fat, 500 to 1,000 milligrams of cholesterol, which is like eating two or three eggs a day. And the countries in the developing nations have about 10 or 15 percent total calories in fat in their diet, and less than 100 milligrams of cholesterol, which is about eating a pound or pound and a half of animal protein a week. Our diet here is monitored and modeled after the undeveloped nations where heart disease is rarely found and all the other degenerative diseases are rarely found. And some people say, well, maybe your diet is deficient. Maybe that's why it should not be used. Well, I'd like to tell you that the diet that we use meets all the federal RDA requirements, the required daily allowances in all factors, protein, minerals, vitamins, and so on with plenty of room to spare, so we have no concern there. So if the diet, as we were advocating, turns out to be a solution in all these diseases, why isn't it used? Well, probably one reason it isn't used is because the American Heart Association that sets the style for diets in our country for heart disease has decided 15 or more years ago that they want maximum compliance. They know that cholesterol level in excess is bad in the blood. Nobody questions anymore that high cholesterol levels will lead to closure of your arteries. The only question is, how do you lower cholesterol levels successfully? In the 1950s, the diet studies show that if you lower cholesterol level by cutting it out of the diet, you did slow down closure of the arteries, you saved people's lives. And the same studies show that any other way to do it just didn't work. But the American Heart Association happened to see the work of a particular investigator, Dr. Kinsella Berkeley, who noted that polyunsaturated fats lowers the cholesterol in the blood. And they said, that's a terrific idea. We won't let anyone have to change their diet and get a low-fat, low-cholesterol diet. We'll let them use exactly what they're eating all the time, change the kind of fat. And that's what they did in their 1961 recommendation, which was their first recommendations, don't change anything, just change the kind of fat you're having. They thought they'd get the maximum compliance that way, and they certainly did. Maximum compliance, minimum effectiveness. Because we've now had a number of American Heart Association diet trials, Oslo, London, and Wadsworth VA Hospital. The Oslo 11-year study with 400 men, London 6-year study, 400 men, Wadsworth 8-year study, 846 men, Half the men on the American Heart Association diet, half on the standard American kind of diet. And yet the difference between both groups was no more than 5% death rate. Not a significant difference. It could happen by chance. Yet on the low-fat, low-cholesterol diet that were tried out in the 1950s, there was a 50% difference in death rate. Twice as many deaths on the standard American diet than the low-fat, low-cholesterol diet. So the diet approach by the American Heart Association hasn't worked in the many large-scale programs. And the latest fiasco, the Mr. Fit study, Mr. Fit means multiple risk factor intervention trial, 12,000 men are on a greatly elaborated American Heart Association trial. 6,000 men on their new and improved diet, which is like the old one, 6,000 men on the regular American diet. The study is going to cost you at least $100 million, the six-year study. It's going on now for two years already, and they haven't made their goals yet, but here are their goals. Here are their six-year goals. In six years, they hope to achieve a 10% reduction of cholesterol level. Now, we achieve a 10% reduction of cholesterol level in six days, not six years. And let me tell you the virtue of reducing cholesterol 10% in six years. If your cholesterol is 300, and you reduce it 10% to 270, the Framingham study tells us that you still have 400% greater risk of heart death than if you're down to 220. So what's the point of bringing it down to 270? Yet that'll satisfy the American Heart Association and the National Institute of Health that's doing the study. The study obviously is going to fail because it's another one of these studies where they're trying to use a dietary program that is no change from what you're normally eating just give you a change in the kind of fat. How about drugs? The Big Coronary Drug Project, which is a five-year double-blind study, 8,300 men 
They used the best drugs they had. They used niacin, the vitamin. They used atrimid S. They used estrogens. They used thyroid. And they used placebo. Placebo is that empty capsule with no drug effect. The end of the five-year study, it was a marvelous study, cost you over $40 million, but it was the best dollar you ever spent. Because at the end of the study, there was only one capsule that proved to be the most effective, the least amount of side effects, the least amount of problems, and that was placebo. So it cost you $41 million to find out that there isn't a drug that we have that can help your heart disease. Even though all the other drugs lowered cholesterol level, they didn't reduce the death rate. And we all know about surgery, coronary bypass surgery, very popular, probably 100,000 cases next year will be operated on. But we also know that 20% of all bypasses close in the first 12 months. So you're not going to get very far with conventional medical care on coronary heart disease. Unless you go right to the cause, which is the diet, the high cholesterol, high fat American diet, there is no hope to make any progress. Now, how about the other degenerative diseases? And I should mention that before we go into the others, that we do know there is hope for changing the situation. We do know about the human studies and the primate studies that show if you lower the fat and cholesterol sufficiently, you can have reversal of artery closure. There's four human studies so far reported in the last two years, and many, many primate studies, Dr. Whistler, University of Chicago Medical School, Dr. Mark Armstrong, University of Iowa Medical School. And the reversal of artery closure all has been accomplished by taking the cholesterol and fat out of the diet. The cholesterol is a principal factor. The fat is a secondary factor. The problem of diet with other factors such as sight and hearing. Hearing, we know, is related to the amount of oxygen that reaches the hearing organ. And if you're a smoker, you can detect in a few weeks a loss of high-frequency hearing. If you stop smoking, you can gain a certain amount of your high-frequency hearing. On the other hand, if you're on a high-fat, high-cholesterol diet and you close up the vessel that feeds the ear, you gradually lose your high-frequency tones. And it's so predictable that in our country, we can predict, an expert can, your age within five years by taking the hearing test and seeing how much of your high-frequency tones have been lost. So hearing is not an inevitable loss. It has to occur with aging. We know in countries on low-fat, low-cholesterol diets that their hearing lasts 40 years longer than they do in our country without loss. So we know how to handle that. And we know there are many cases where some hearing is restored when the diet is changed. How about glaucoma? Glaucoma is a disease, a problem only of Western countries. In countries on low-fat, low-cholesterol diets, glaucoma is never found. It's rarely found, unless it's a very acute disease state. But glaucoma is normally never found. That's a problem with high-fat American diets, too. So our principal problems of loss of sight, glaucoma, cataract, sudden blindness, these are all dietary related. In fact, the diabetic problem, we call it diabetic retinopathy, the disease of the retina, if you're diabetic, is, is responsible for the major amount of blindness in our country. I believe 17% of all new blindnesses are from diabetics. So we certainly have to give some thought to the problem of sight. Even though we feel that the hearing loss and others are related to age, we begin to realize that that's not really true. Gallstone problems are considered something you joke about in parlor uh, social evenings. But gallstones are no fun if you have them. They're probably the most intense kind of pain you can have. And they consider, they're considered relatively minor, but there's 300,000 operations a year to take your gallbladder out. And 6,000 people die from these operations. Yet we find that gallstones are almost completely avoidable by changing diet. The gallstone starts because cholesterol crystallizes in the gallbladder. The bile in your gallbladder gets to have a cholesterol level of six to 900 if your cholesterol level in your blood is 250 or so. Cholesterol in the gallbladder is three times as high as it is in the blood. When it gets to be six to 900, it's so concentrated, it almost has to crystallize. And once you form one crystal, 
Another will form, and the two crystals stick together. They'll join with a third, and now you have the making of a small gallstone. Because the gallstones in the American countries are cholesterol gallstones, and they just roll together like a snowball, and that's the way you grow them. In tests on humans, you find that if you take the cholesterol out of the diet, the crystals in the gallbladder dissolve and disappear. And if you restore the cholesterol to the diet, it just takes two or three weeks before the crystals come back. So gallstones have been a bit of mystery for many years. It's no longer a mystery. Because gallstones can be avoided. They never have to happen. And although we don't consider it a matter of life and death, it's certainly not, in, not the kind of thing we would like to have. Arthritis is a nuisance. It doesn't kill anybody to speak about, but it certainly makes you unhappy for many years. And we know there's different kinds of arthritis. There's gouty arthritis, when you have too much uric acid in your blood. And we know that too much uric acid comes from eating animal products. It's the only way just about you can get it. And if you have too much uric acid, it can turn into crystals. And the crystals can be eaten then by your white blood cells. The white blood cells die in the process because they can't digest the uric acid crystal. And when they die in the process, the little stomachs of the white blood cells explode. All the powerful digestive juices come out of these little stomachs right into your joint spaces, and they just irritate your joints, digest your joints, corrode your joint spacings, and the pain is, of course, tremendous. Gouty arthritis is practically 100% reversible when you lower the uric acid level in your blood by lowering the animal protein content of your diet. Rheumatoid arthritis is a little different. But all of the arthritis that are commonly known, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, are all problems where the digestive juices of your white blood cells, your own white blood cells, get into the joint spaces and start to digest your joint linings. It's a tragedy that we create a condition in your body that destroys your own white blood cell, which is your first line of defense. And by their destruction, the juices come out, the little digestive juices come out and destroy your own joint tissue. That's real suicide. The way it happens with rheumatoid arthritis is that the low oxygen levels that we find in the joint spaces, because on the American diets, low oxygen levels are created, as you know, by high fat diet, the red blood cells stick together so they can't pick up oxygen, or by smoking. But either way you do it, if the oxygen levels get low enough, these white blood cells have their little stomachs enlarged and enlarged until they burst like a balloon. Their digestive juices spill out, get into your joint space, cause you the rheumatoid arthritis. Osteoarthritis is very similar. The little white blood cells burst again because the oxygen gets low, and when they burst and the digestive juices get out, the little cartilage cells, the ones that make your cartilage in your joints, that's your joint lining, the cartilage cells sort of go crazy and they produce instead of nice flexible cartilage to line your joints, they produce a stone-like, bone-like cartilage. And only when the juices, digestive juices, go away, when you don't create new deaths of white blood cells, does your osteoarthritis stop happening. All these things happening because of your own cells reacting to lowered oxygen levels. Diabetes is a disease that goes back thousands of years. It's sort of a tragedy because it's so destructive to the body. Of every gangrenous limbs that, comes, that come to the hospital to be amputated, 80% belong to diabetics. Diabetics have three times as many deaths from heart disease as non-diabetics. They have about three quarters of all the strokes. They have their number one in blindness. So it's really a tragedy to be a long-term diabetic. And yet, when we look over the history of diabetes, we found that as long as 3,000 years ago, the Egyptians knew exactly what to do with diabetes. They knew exactly what diet to put you on. They didn't understand why it worked, but it certainly did. And everything was going well until a couple hundred years ago when the Surgeon General of England decided that since the diabetics spilt so much sugar out of the urine, the body couldn't handle carbohydrates, and so he took all the carbohydrates out of the diet. And that was probably the first high-fat, high-protein diet, and that's the way it's been ever since. 
And that really increased our incidence of diabetes because that's the kind of diet that causes diabetes. And although people thought that when insulin was first developed, that, that was the end of diabetes because that's going to cure it all, we discover now that over 90% of all diabetics have more insulin than they need in the body. They have much more than normal people have, two and three times as much. So we find that diabetes is not a problem of insufficient insulin. But then we had to find out, if you've got so much insulin, why are you diabetic? Why doesn't your insulin digest your sugar? Why does the sugar rise so high in the blood, unhampered by anything? It isn't digested. It rises so high, it spills out through the kidneys. Why does that happen? Because the insulin is insensitized. The insulin, we find, is protecting the sugar with a fat layer. When your fat rises high in your blood, it's like a barrier between the glucose, your sugar in your blood, and the insulin. And the insulin simply cannot burn up the glucose when there's too much fat in the blood. And many people have thought that diabetes is hereditary. But this whole idea has just been dispelled when we go into the studies because Dr. Pike of England probably has the largest group of identical twin diabetics in the world in his registry. And he has followed probably 300 sets of identical twins. And he finds, after tracing many of these twins, that some twins, after they get their diabetes, the other twin is not diabetic for as much as 30 years that he's followed them. He said if there can be such a great difference in time between the time one gets diabetes and one doesn't, it cannot be a disease by heredity, or else they'd both get it within a reasonable time. And so he has been the first man to offer evidence that diabetes is not a hereditary disease. There may be some reasons to try and believe it, but if you can't have both identical twins have the diabetes, it cannot be hereditary. And we find out what is the principal reason for diabetes because in experiments that we've done, done in the early 1920s, done with Dr. Rabinowitz of Canada, we know that as you lower the fat, most diabetics then have their insulin become sensitive enough so they're no longer diabetic. And three or four years ago when we started to try our diet on various patients who had diabetes, our record was that 50% of all diabetics and insulin would get off insulin within four weeks. We introduced our diet to Dr. James Anderson of University of Kentucky Medical Center three years ago, and he gets the same results as we do. He now has had 50 diabetics through his program, and his diabetics are getting off insulin at the same rate. So that we realize that diabetes is not the problem people have thought. And when Dr. Kelly M. West, who was a professor of medicine at the University of Oklahoma Medical School, said last year before the Senate hearings, that if this high carbohydrate diet were used, two thirds of all diabetics would be off all the drugs, insulin, and so on in a short time. That diabetes as a disease would disappear from our country. Dr. West is a man that's been a specialist in diabetes for many, many years, and he's a conservative physician. Well, we've had many tests for trying to help diabetics. The big university group diabetic program where they tested the oral drugs and discovered that the oral drugs for diabetes increased the death rate from heart disease by 250% than those who did not take any drugs. And yet, when the New Jersey State of Board of Health questioned the cardiologists in New Jersey, they found that 85% of them were still using these drugs for even their heart patients who had diabetes. So you wonder what these double-blind studies teach physicians when they still continue using the drugs that are apparently creating a greater incidence of heart disease. The best and the only solution for diabetes is that you must get to the diet that creates it and control it by a proper diet. High blood pressure is one of the most widely spread diseases in our country. It's hard to believe that about 60 million people have high blood pressure. That's considering that there's only about 120 million adults in our country. One out of every two adults has high blood pressure. You have 100 people in the room, you have 50 people then who have high blood pressure. 
It hardly seems possible that such a natural, national epidemic. Physicians used to think that high blood pressure was primarily a problem with too much salt in the diet. But when Dr. James I. Conner of the U.S. Department of Agriculture did his study, he selected men and women who were on a normal American diet, 43% total calories and fat, normal amount of cholesterol, and the normal amount of salt, which was 10 grams of salt a day, about a third of an ounce of salt a day. And he decided not to change their salt, give them exactly the amount of salt they'd been eating, only to change their fat. He brought their fat from 43% down to 25%. And he was very careful not to change your calories. He didn't want anyone to lose weight because the first thing a physician says is lose weight, cut down salt, your high blood pressure will go away. 10 days after they're on the diet and all they did was reduce the fat from 43% to 25%, everyone's blood pressure dropped 10%. That means if your top number was 160, you'd go down to 144, practically in a normal range, from an abnormal range. And if your top number was 100, that's certainly not acceptable, it would go down to 90 in your bottom number, which could be acceptable. So the difference between normal and abnormal, in just 10 days, Dr. Icon was able to do by not touching salt at all. No one lost weight. They all had the normal amount of salt. He kept them on that for 40 days, and the blood pressure stayed down. And one of the interesting things about the study is that he noticed that the platelets, the little cells that create clotting in the body, the sticking together, the platelets, reduced 50% when he cut the fat down just from 43% to 25%. And that made him very happy because the new evidence had just come out that diabetic retinopathy, that's the problem that diabetics have where they go blind, where the retina bleeds and so on. Diabetic retinopathy, the severity, is correlated to the amount of platelets sticking together, platelet aggregation. So if he could reduce platelet aggregation by 50%, he could probably reduce the damage to diabetics' eyes. He considered that more important than the lowering of the blood pressure. Now, of course, he only went down to 25%. You can imagine how low you can reduce the platelets sticking together down at an 8% fat diet. Well, the diabetic specialists didn't recommend, of course, reducing fat. They just gave people aspirin and other drugs to try and reduce platelet stickiness. Diet, I guess, is not an acceptable program I'm on physicians yet. When Dr. Iacono increased the fats in the diet, all the blood pressures went back to where they were. It was one of the best studies showing that salt is a much lesser factor than fat in high blood pressure. There has been a consensus in treating high blood pressure. The National Institute of Health, the American Heart Association, American Public Health Institute, everybody has agreed that there's one way to treat high blood pressure and that is drug therapy for the rest of your life. Stepped up drug therapy, you start with a single drug. If that doesn't work, there are two drugs, then you go to three drugs, then you go to four drugs, then you go to potassium supplements. It's all worked out. Every physician now gets a copy on how to treat high blood pressure according to the consensus. Yet, how much how much is talked about in the consensus booklet about diet and so on. They do say that you could ask your patient to cut down his salt intake and he could lose weight. Otherwise, nothing is talked about diet. The idea is drug therapy. Now, how effective is drug therapy? First of all, drug therapy for hypertension does not cure hypertension. It doesn't affect the disease in any way. It just paralyzes the body's ability to raise pressure. So one thing that happens is that as you paralyze the body's ability to raise pressure, your blood flow drops. And people have to have a certain minimum amount of blood flow to have normal function. So one of the side effects of hypertension drugs, as they lower blood pressure and lower blood flow, is sexual impotency. In a study done on men taking the drugs for two years, 50% lost their sexual potency. Because without blood flow, you don't have erections. How about uric acid level? The hypertensive drugs artificially forced uric acid levels up. Another study, 50% of the men had uric acid levels raised into the gout range. And so they had to then take drugs to lower uric acid level. Well, they took drugs to lower uric acid level, and the principal drugs are xyloprim, benamid, and they created certain kinds of crystals that dig into the muscles 
and tear the little muscle fibers. Unfortunately, there's no drug to take against that. So that we can't cure drugs with drugs. The side effects are many. The other problems from hypertensive drugs, it can force you into diabetes. The drugs can force you, on occasion, into kidney failure. Now, all these drugs would be acceptable if there was no other way to go. But yet our data and our first 900 patients indicate that of all the hypertensives that have come in, and there's over 200 that were diagnosed hypertensive by their physicians, that have been hypertensive for at least a year on medication, they came in with medication, in the four weeks' time, 85% were off their medication with normal blood pressures. Now, even if the 85% wouldn't hold, what if it's only 50%? What if it's only 25%? 25% out of 60 million means that 15 million people would never have to be on drug medication for the rest of their lives if they change their diet. So there certainly is a choice for hypertension. Now, one of the dreaded diseases, probably the most dreaded diseases, is cancer. And there are many kinds of cancers. There might be 75 kinds of cancers. But the principal cancers that kill us in these countries are lung cancer, which is number one, probably 70,000 people a year. But lung cancer is something that's sort of a predestined suicide. It's a form of suicide that you do voluntarily. So we don't take that too seriously. But we have colon cancer. That's about 40,000 deaths a year or so. We have breast cancer. These are the important cause of cancer. And altogether, cancer probably kills 300,000 people a year, about 16% of all deaths. It used to be thought that cancers were caused by viruses. And because of that, our government has spent for research probably 50 to $100 million a year for 20 years looking for the virus that causes these cancers. They've never found it. And now we're finding out that they may never find it because we're finding the cause of these cancers seem to be foods that you eat. Colon cancer, for example, we find that in a high-fat diet, that a certain kind of bacteria grow in your large intestine. In your last four feet of tubing, we call it your large intestine, you have bacteria, little one-cell animals that grow. They've been there all your life. And on the high-fat diet, a certain kind grow. They're called anaerobic bacteria. They live without oxygen. They're nasty bacteria because when they eat your bile that comes out of your intestinal tract, they convert it, their excretion products to a cancer-producing substance called deoxycholic acid. They also convert it to estrogens, like female hormones. And Dr. Dennis Burkett, one of the investigators in colon cancer, feels very strongly that the site where all of this deoxycholic acid, this poisonous excretion products from your bacteria and eat your bile, that the excretion products are right at the points where colon cancer is formed. That's where the colon cancer is formed. In countries that are on low-fat, low-cholesterol diets, these bacteria cannot live in your colon. It's not a favorable atmosphere. Instead, you have a different kind of bacteria that are favorable for you. They're called aerobic. They live with oxygen. And they cannot excrete this deoxycholic acid. They can't make it from bile. And they don't get the estrogens out as the other ones do. And therefore, colon cancer is rarely found, if ever. Dr. Burkett said that in the hospital he served in Africa for 25 years, thousands of black people, he never saw one case of colon cancer. His first case of colon cancer came from a white man who had recently come back from England. So colon cancer turns out to be not a virus, not a pesticide, but just from your ordinary high-fat diet. And then we have lung cancer, of course. Now, lung cancer, we realize, has to be initiated by cigarettes or could be initiated by asbestos powder. It could be initiated by other dust. But cigarettes are a principal cause of lung cancer. But the surprising part, part that we find is that if you're not on a high cholesterol diet, your incidence of lung cancer may not be very much. 
because we find in just the last short period of time that cholesterol has something to do with lung cancer, and that's a brand new finding. Because 10 or so years ago, when Dr. Jeremiah Stamler of the Chicago Board of Health tested his people from the People's Gas Company, he found that he couldn't figure out a relationship between the amount of cigarettes people smoked and lung cancer. But he did find a relationship between their cholesterol and lung cancer. If their cholesterol level was 275 or more, there were seven or eight times as many cases of lung cancer than if the cholesterol level was 220 or less. What does cholesterol level have to do with lung cancer? He didn't know, and neither did anyone else know. But there were 900 people in the study. It was a good scientific study, and there's no question that the lung cancer incidence was absolutely related and correlated to cholesterol level. If the cholesterol level went down below 150, you wouldn't find any lung cancer. Well, we learned about a year or two ago as to why this happened. Because we find that high cholesterol blood paralyzes the white blood cell that eats cancer cells, the big macrophage, that big cell that could be almost 50 times larger than a, white, than a red blood cell. It's an immense cell. It goes around through the tissues, in and out of the blood vessels, looking for things to eat that don't belong there, and it eats cancer cells. And that's why we realize now that high cholesterol blood, if it paralyzes these, that all you need is high cholesterol blood when you have cancer cells starting in the lung and it just runs rampant and you'll develop lung cancer. If you don't have high cholesterol levels, apparently then the incidence of lung cancer is far, far less. And now we can understand more that in countries like Vilcabamba, Ecuador and Soviet Georgia, where we see people 95 years old smoking, we can realize they must have low cholesterol levels or they wouldn't be alive. We find out other things about cancer. For example, we find that the problem of breast cancer, which is a leading cause of death for women 35 to 55 years old. Why is the breast cancer so prevalent and only on countries on the Western diet? And on countries on the low-fat, low-cholesterol diet, breast cancer is practically unknown. Is it something hereditary only due to people who live in our kinds of countries? No, because we know that if Japanese women have a very low rate of breast cancer and move to Hawaii or the United States, the same sisters in the same family will develop breast cancer, whereas the other sisters in Japan are perfectly all right. Through a long series of investigations, we seem to find a relationship between the fat in the diet and breast cancer. And now one of the suspected causes are these anaerobic bacteria, the ones that only can grow on a high-fat diet because they give off an estrogen. And the estrogens reabsorb back in your body. Normally we wouldn't worry about it because so what if you reabsorb some estrogen back in your body? Let me tell you the effect of estrogens in the body that the body doesn't make. A three and a half year old girl used her mother's estrogen face cream, rubbed it all over her body for a couple months. And the reason they discovered she was doing it is because her breast started to grow. They took her to a physician and he examined her and found that her uterus looked like a normal adult female menstruating uterus at three and a half years old. And yet she absorbed just a tiny amount of estrogen, one twentieth of the minimum low amount that you normally would have to have. How about the Planned Parenthood statistics? Women taking oral contraceptives and other estrogen, if they take it for six months, those who started were completely cyst-free in, in the uterus, after six months, 25% of the women now have cysts in their uterus. After two years, 80% have cysts in their uterus from the oral contraceptives estrogens. And we know that if you have uterine cysts, there's a 260% greater incidence of breast cancer. So we certainly can see that there's an influence on the oral contraceptives and breast cancer. Women that took diethylstibisterol for controlling miscarriages after a period of years, we find their breast cancer rate has increased over those who did not take it. Estrogens are a problem. And how about Premarin? Premarin is the estrogen taken to keep women young forever. If you're taking Premarin for two years or more, you get 400% greater incidence of cancer of the uterus. If you take it for seven years or more, the incidence is 14 to 1. 1,400% more cancer of the uterus if you're taking Premarin than if you've never taken it. Estrogens stimulate the sex organs. They stimulate the uterus, the breasts, the ovaries, and that's why it's thought 
that estrogens are a potent force. And we know that by the age of menstruation. Why is it that girls now have their first menstruation at 10, 11, 12 years old, when for millions of years, developing the human race, the menstruation always happens 16, 17, 18, 19 years old? Why suddenly 10, 11 years old? Has man's heredity changed in the last 50, 75 years? No, it's because large groups have suddenly taken up the high fat, high cholesterol diet in the last 50, 75 years. They call that an elevation of your standard of living. Now we realize that in these populations, that the high fat diet that creates the anaerobic bacteria, that create the estrogens that go right back through the bowel into the system from the time they're a year old, these estrogens from the time they're a year old stimulate the ovaries, the uterus, and the breast so much that they start to menstruate when they're 10, 11 years old. This tremendous stimulation by the estrogens all your life, our many investigators feel, stimulates the breast cancer and the ovaries, ovarian cancer and uterine cancer. Because in countries on low-fat diets with the right kind of bacteria, these cancers don't exist. So we begin to see a tremendous amount of problems due to diet that heretofore were related, thought to be related to other things. Even the polyunsaturated fats, we know they increase gallstone formation three times as many. But the idea that they increase cancer rate is a brand new finding. We find out on in animals, the polyunsaturated fats will double the instance of colon cancer than any other kind of fat, lard and so on. So that not only does it do a disservice for us for creating more gallstones, blocking the vessels in the eyes and the rest of the body, it's even related in cancer. Perhaps the finding of the Wadsworth VA study with the 846 men that there were 50% more cancer deaths among the polyunsaturated American Heart Association group than the other group might not be a, an accidental finding. Perhaps it has some element of truth in it. Because certainly we find it with animal studies. When you look at all these diseases, you th see them as unrelated. But I like to tell you that they're all related. And we've coined a term called lipotoxemia. Lipo means lipid, means fat. Toxemia means poisoning of the blood, a fat poisoning of the blood. For example, if you have arsenic poisoning, if it's a habit in our country to sprinkle some white arsenic powder in your salad every night because it tastes sweet, you're going to develop loosening of the teeth and falling hair. So you go to your dentist and say, I've got loosening of the teeth. Nobody worries about the arsenic that you're eating. And so the dentist makes elaborate structures to keep your teeth from falling apart. He strings them together with pieces of wire, clamps them to your gums, does all kinds of things, and you think that's fine. You go to your barber for a wig, for a hair transplant. Nobody's concerned that the problem is not to your barber, it's not to your dentist. It's arsenic poisoning. You stop eating your arsenic, suddenly your teeth tighten, your hair grows back. That's what these diseases are. Lipotoxemia, poisoning of the blood from fat and cholesterol. And the side effects, the symptoms are artery closure, diabetes, gallstones, cataract, glaucoma, high blood pressure, arthritis, the many diseases as we call the degenerate diseases. That's why these diseases are not natural to man. They're an environmental poisoning. They're poisoning from what you put in your own mouth by foods that are unnatural to man. And that's why one diet can reverse and prevent these many, many diseases. You wonder how is it possible one diet can do it all? because these are all symptoms of a single kind of poisoning, an environmental poisoning. We call it lipotoxemia, and we hope that when you go back, you'll be able to carry the message that a simple dietary approach can handle disease on natural demand. And what is that dietary approach? Simply we recommend whole grains, oats, wheat, corn, rice, and so on, brown rice. We recommend fruits and vegetables, we recommend beans or peas for variety, tubers, potatoes, and so on. And we also recommend that you don't have over a pound and a half of animal protein a week at any time for growing children, for young adults. That's your limit. For those who have severe artery closure, as you know, we don't recommend animal protein for a six-month or 12-month period except in very tiny quantities, a few ounces a week. So the diet then turns out to be relatively simple. 
and we feel it's a diet that at least would make you have the opportunity that, that when you die, you're going to die of old age rather than degenerative diseases. Thank you. Arthritis is one of the most painful kinds of degenerative diseases that we have in our country. In fact, I think that the most amount of Social Security benefits are being paid out prematurely for people with arthritis. Very painful, and once you have it, it just continues to get worse. There's three principal kinds of arthritis that many of us know about. One is gouty arthritis. Now, gouty arthritis is something that simply comes from eating too much animal protein or too many organ meats. And it's a problem that happens when the uric acid level rises in your blood. And these come from those kinds of substances. Now, the problem with uric acid, it's perfectly normal constituent in the blood, but if it rises too high, the blood can't keep it in solution, and it forms crystals, uric acid crystals. Uric acid crystals are completely unnatural in the body's scheme of things. And when uric acid crystals form, the first thing that happens is that your white blood cells, seeing these strange crystals, know they're not supposed to be there, and so they eat them. The white blood cells are trained to eat anything foreign in the blood. If you have bacteria, you have viruses, cancer cells, defective red blood cells, the white blood cells will eat them to make the blood nice and clean. And so it does with uric acid crystals. Now normally, these little red white blood cells have little stomachs in them called lysosomes. These stomachs are powerful in digestive juices. The digestive juices are even more powerful than your stomach acid where you digest your food. Your stomach can't digest, for example, fat, but these little stomachs in the white blood cells can digest just about everything. And they eat the uric acid crystal and it gets in their little stomachs, but unfortunately never in nature's experience was it ever intended for a white blood cell to eat a uric acid crystal. The crystal with those little sharp points punctures the little stomachs because they're just indigestible, and the digestive juices from the little stomachs pour out in the cell. The cell then is digested by its own juices, and the digestive juices spill out into the joint spaces. When it spills out in the joint spaces, the juices now start to attack the joint itself, and that's your attack of gout. When you have attack by your own little digestive juices in the white blood cells, come out because you're destroying the white blood cells, that's the attack on your <coughs> joint spaces. This happens so fast that it only takes less than an hour from the time a white blood cell eats uric acid crystal until the white blood cell is destroyed <clears throat> and all the juices then are poured out, attacking the joints in the body itself. So it's, <clears throat> it's very simple to handle that problem. Simply cut your uric acid level down by stop eating the tremendous amounts of animal protein that can raise your uric acid level. Uric acid is simply a byproduct of eating protein. It's a protein breakdown product. A couple of years ago, 100 years ago in England, gout was absolutely epidemic among those that can afford it. That's because if you look at their menus, you can see they used to have six kinds of animal protein for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In the morning, they have bluebird pie or blackberry pie, uh, blackbird pie, that is, and uh, different kinds of meats and fishes. Uh, that's all they used to eat if you're rich enough to afford it until gout was really epidemic. We know how to get rid of gout. How about rheumatoid arthritis? This is a real crippler and a real problem. And rheumatoid arthritis is related to the same kind of system, the white blood cell. Now, it used to be thought that rheumatoid arthritis was an infectious problem. Somehow happened due to infection. And the reason for that is that when a young child used to get rheumatoid fever, rheumatic fever, they used to have a temporary arthritis that developed and lasted for a period of months. And it was thought that, therefore, infection must be the factor in rheumatoid arthritis. And many people used to have their teeth pulled out so that they would avoid the possibility of having an infected tooth. 
20, 30, 40 years ago, I can't tell you how many people had every tooth pulled out of their mouth to avoid arthritis, wearing false plates, completely without any reason, because it was all so unnecessary. They used to have their tonsils taken out, anything to avoid affections to avoid arthritis. It never made any difference. The problem in rheumatoid arthritis is, again, related to the white blood cell, because if the white blood cell has inadequate oxygen and in rheumatoid joints, the oxygen level is very low, the little stomachs in the white blood cell, the lysosomes, can swell up, swell up to so much so they can burst. And when they burst, again, the juices go into the cell, dissolve the cell, destroy the cell, and the juices now, after they dissolve the cell, they get out into the joint areas and attack the joints. And when they attack the joints, they start to nibble, those juices start to dissolve on your own joint lining, on your synovial lining. When other white blood cells around see your synovial lining being attacked, they assume it's bad tissue and they start to eat it too. So you can have attack on your own synovial lining by your own white blood cells if it doesn't look well. The only hope there is to stop the very low oxygen level. That happens because you have two things happen to you. First, you're on a high fat diet. A high-fat diet causes your red blood cells and other little cells to clump, so they can't get through small capillaries, and the clumping itself causes the oxygen not to be able to be picked up by the sides of the red blood cells that are stuck together. The other thing that happens is they clump together, the capillaries are blocked, and so the blood flow is cut down, and the oxygen carrying capacity of the, blood, of the tissues is lessened. Smoking, of course, would help cut down the oxygen capacity of the red blood cell, since the carbon monoxide of the smoke paralyzes the red blood cell for a period of time. All these help do it. And when they block the small vessels, what happens is that the body, under the pressure of the heart pumping blood, goes against the blockage, and when it can't get through, it pushes the blood right through the sides of the capillary walls. And this floods the tissues, causing what we call edema, flooding of the tissues with fluid. And the edema makes it difficult for the oxygen to transfer to the various cells and makes it difficult for the oxygen to be given to the white blood cells where they need it. So that anyone that has rheumatoid arthritis is going to have a certain amount of fluid in the tissues. In fact, we know by experiments that if you increase the fluid in the tissues, that people will have a greater instance of arthritis than if you have less fluid in the tissues. For example, in cases of women who have taken the German measles vaccine, because German measles, if you have it during pregnancy, can cause malformation of the child. If you give German measles vaccine to a young girl, five, six, ten years old, they might have one out of 200 cases where they'll have a temporary outbreak of arthritis. And that's because the uh, virus uh, in the vaccine uh, is a little bit indigestible with your white blood cell, and you can lose a few white blood cells, and when you do, the juices of the stomach get out and cause this temporary arthritis by inflaming the joints. But you get someone who is older, 15, 20 years old, instead of one out of 200, because as you get older and you continue eating the normal fat meals in our country, you always have more and more blocked vessels and more edema. A 15 or 20 year old female could have, instead of one out of 200 arthritis, can have one out of 50, one out of 25. By the time you get to be 25 or 30 and you're a female in this country, if you take the German measles vaccine, one out of four will get a temporary arthritis because by the time you're 25 or 30, you have so much fat in your blood that you have quite a bit of edema. And this is very interesting. If you take the German measles vaccine right before menstruation when you have a premenstrual edema instead of one out of four having arthritis one out of two will have a temporary arthritis to show you the power of the extra edema the extra fluid stopping and blocking the transfer of oxygen edema is very important to development of arthritis uh, as when you already have a fat, high fat blood level and edema from that, and then if you have extra edema from injury or from natural means like 
uh, premenstrual edema or taking uh, birth control pills. They create edema. Women with birth control pills always have more arthritis than those who don't take it. If you have an injury like women used to scrub floors on their knees, and remember the term housemaid knee? That's no joke. But that's from a, the trauma from being on your knees on a hard surface floor. It creates an edema from the injury, and that's where they used to get some arthritis. People that use air hammers to break up concrete, they always usually have some arthritis in their hands because the trauma of the air hammer creates an edema of inflammation in their hands, and that's where the arthritis will start. So if you have an injury and where you get edema, plus a lot of blockage from your high-fat diet, you're on your way to rheumatoid arthritis. Osteoarthritis is a little bit different, but it still involves a white blood cell. And studies have indicated that when a white blood cell is destroyed because of the lack of oxygen where these lysosomes, the little stomachs, uh, blow up and all their digestive juices come out, if these digestive juices come into contact with the cartilage cell, that's the cells that grow this nice, firm, tough tissue uh, on your joints. If they come in contact with the cartilage cell, these stomach juices from these little white blood cells will cause the cartilage cells to make a bad kind of cartilage, a bony kind of cartilage. And they'll actually make a bony kind of cartilage that we call osteoporosis. I'm sorry, uh, osteoarthritis. The osteo, of course, is a bone kind of arthritis where instead of a nice flexible lining around your bones, it's a bone-like made by your own cartilage cells. So again, the problem is the fat in the diet and the possible edema with other things joining in. The treatment for arthritis is medieval. What do they do when you have arthritis? Well, the first thing they might do is give you cortisone. What does cortisone do? Cortisone sort of paralyzes your white blood cells so they can't work. Well, when that happens, they also can't eat bacteria and viruses to get rid of infections. So if you're on cortisone, if someone sneezes 50 feet away, you're going to catch cold. It's the fastest way to get infections if you're on cortisone. And cortisone has a lot of other problems. But by tying up your white blood cells so they're inactivated, then they won't be able to spill their little stomach juices all over your joints, and you'll feel a little better. There's another way to help your arthritis called lymphocyte depletion. That's another medieval idea with scientific overtones. They go into your lymph vessel, the big thoracic vessel, and they take the white blood cells out by the hundreds of millions. They drain them out and they separate the white blood cells out and send back the fluid in the body. So in the first 24 hours, you can have a couple maybe 25 to 50 billion white blood cells thrown out into the garbage can. And after 30 days of this, you're down to about 4 billion a day going out. How does all this help you? Why, sure, you don't have enough white blood cells now to die because you don't have enough oxygen in your blood and create all this stomach juice that comes out of the little bodies. That's a fine way to help you. And then, of course, you can always give someone gold salts. How do gold salts work? Well, gold being abnormal in the body, the little white blood cells eat these, it stores in their stomachs, but it's indigestible, and it fills their stomachs and there's nothing they can do, they're out of commission then. So this helps the white blood cells get out of commission. In every way, it's to put the white blood cells out of commission, destroy their activity. In the same way, cytotoxic cells, cell-killing drugs, are used to control the problem. People take drugs like chlorambucil that are used to destroy white blood cells. And that's a good idea, of course, because the more white blood cells you destroy, the less you feel the pain of arthritis. But that has a side effect because many people that have taken these cell-killing drugs over a period of years suddenly develop an acute leukemia, which is a bad price to pay for a relief from arthritis that doesn't solve the problem. The only relief, the only hope you have for arthritis is to, one, go on a decent diet. Go on a diet, such as I recommend to you, of low fat and low cholesterol, and your uric acid will drop. That'll take care of gouty arthritis. You'll have a max amount of oxygen in your tissues. That'll take care of the rheumatoid and osteo. And I'd like to just give you an idea. An article that was reported, a study that was reported in the 1890 Journal of the Australian Medical Society. When people out there got arthritis, they go to a particular hotel and they'd wait there until a whale was caught. 
and the whale was caught, and then they would be brought out to the whale works. And the whale would be given a single slice, just like you open up a hot dog bun, a long slice through the body. The whale would be open. The people would come in and sit in that whale up to their waist. Then the whale would be closed, and they would sit in that steam bath in that whale to help their arthritis. At least that did no harm. Arthritis is bad enough, but how about gallstones? I don't think anyone who's ever described the pain of gallstones can say that, honestly can say, that it's not the worst pain one could almost experience. Now, gallstones are a real problem, and yet it's very prevalent in the United States today. I think that probably 10 to 20 million people have gallstones, whether they are symptomatic or not. It's a major industry in our country. Would you believe that a half a million people are operated on each year to have their gallbladders out? And it's no fun either, because out of the half a million operations, 10,000 people die as a result of the operations. So gallstones is something we have to look upon very seriously. How do gallstones start in the first place? Well, first, I have to acquaint you with bile, because that's at the bottom of this. Remember that the liver makes bile, which is a digestive substance that helps digest fat, and that people that eat a lot of fat produce a lot of bile. Now, bile is made up of three principal substances. It's made up, first of all, of cholesterol, and then it's made of bile acids, and then it's made of a particular kind of fat called a phospholipid, sort of a slippery kind of fat that helps, helps keep the bile and the cholesterol in solution with the bile acids. Now, if you have too much cholesterol in the bile, the bile acids and the phospholipids can't keep it in solution. It's like putting too much salt in water. When you put too much salt in water, you have a certain amount of salt that stays at the bottom of the cup and won't dissolve. And it's the same way with bile. If you have too much cholesterol, the cholesterol will dissolve to a certain extent, and then the rest that can't dissolve lays there in the form of crystals. And once you have cholesterol crystals, like little needles, laying in the bile, you know it's going to be not very long before the crystals stick together, and it's like a snowball, start to form a little bile gallstone, a little cholesterol gallstone. Now, in populations where cholesterol gallstones are never found, and in animal studies, if you took a measure of the amount of cholesterol in the bile, you'd find it'd be about 300 or 350 at a maximum, milligrams percent cholesterol. Remember, in your blood, we like to have your cholesterol less than 160. Well, in your bile, we like to have it less than 300 to 350. How much do you think it is in the Americans? The average cholesterol level in the bile of Americans are 6 to 900. Can you imagine having a 900 cholesterol in your bile? No wonder the cholesterol comes out in solution and forms stones. In animal studies, Animals, of course, never have gallstones in their natural diet, but if you give them high cholesterol diets, like Dr. Taylor has done of Northwestern University, uh, they form gallstones just like people do. And what he did also was to give them a very large amount of lecithin, because some people say, well, lecithin helps dissolve cholesterol problems. He gave them a large amount of lecithin that had no effect whatsoever in the gallstones, but when he cut down the cholesterol from the diet, the gallstones dissolved. In human studies, we find very much the same sort of idea. Uh, human studies, uh, Pima Indians have a lot of experiments done with them because they have more gallstones than anyone in this country. In fact, if you're a Pima female, 25 years or older, three out of four already have gallstones. I think that taking out the gallbladders must be the largest industry in the Phoenix, Arizona area where the Pimas are. It's an epidemic there. And in studies on the Pimas, when they go to have their gallbladders out, one study let them be off all cholesterol for a short period of time, two or three weeks. Now, before they took them off cholesterol, they took samples of the bile, and they found there were many cholesterol crystals floating around. They took them off cholesterol completely for two or three weeks, and all the cholesterol crystals then were dissolved. They couldn't find any. <laughs> Now they put them back on two or three eggs a day for three weeks. <clears throat> and that was enough in two or three weeks to have all the cholesterol crystals come back. So that it's very clear to see, if we want to dissolve the cholesterol gallstones, we better cut down the amount of cholesterol. And we've had some patients by x-ray 
of their gallbladders and of their gallstones show that our kind of diet and low cholesterol can actually dissolve gallstones. But if you go to Mayo Clinic, you'll have a different approach. There they give you bile acids. They say, after all, the reason you have cholesterol gallstones is because you have too much cholesterol for the amount of bile acid you have. So what's the solution? To cut down cholesterol? Oh, no, we won't want you to change your American diet. The solution is to give you more bile acids. And if the body won't make them, we'll feed them to you. And that's what they did at Mayo Clinic. They fed people bile acids a couple of times a day. And that did, over a period of a couple years, dissolve the smaller gallstones. But the moment they stopped taking the bile acids, the gallstones grew right back because they didn't change their diet. They've been trying this approach now for about a dozen years. <clears throat> and finally, they're starting to realize that diet is more important than feeding you bile acids. Kidney stones are a very painful problem that happens in many people. And in our country, kidney stones primarily happen because your uric acid level gets too high. And many physicians have tried reducing uric acid level, and they do it by using drugs to reduce uric acid level. And this cuts out the formation of stones almost at once and does it for as long a period as the drug to lower uric acid level continue to be taken. There's a much more practical way to do it, and that is on this kind of diet, uric acid levels normally go down to levels that would not cause kidney stones. We've had a number of stone formers that came into our program that no longer form stones. It's your best bet. Get your uric acid down by natural means. So we find that gallstones, as painful as they are and as bad as they are, are completely avoidable. These cholesterol gallstones that we have in our country never should be. It only comes from eating too much cholesterol and having too high cholesterol in your gallbladder. But unfortunately, in countries like the United States and other countries on the high-fat diets, hearing gradually deteriorates all through your lifetime so that by the time you get to a, an age 40, 50, 60 years old, where now you've made enough money and you've secured enough in life so you can enjoy all the things you wanted to and you've always enjoyed good, li uh, good music, you can forget it because you've lost your ability to, hire, to hear the high frequency tones. It doesn't have to happen to you. And let's talk a little bit about hearing. First of all, is it something that must happen with age? Well, in our country, it does happen with age. You gradually lose your hearing. But in other countries around the world, it doesn't happen. For example, a study was done with those who attended a Wisconsin State Fair. Well, that's the dairy capital, and we know they have plenty of fats and cholesterol in their food. And they were matched with a group in Africa, the Mabian tribe. Now, the Mabians are on a diet very similar to one that I recommend. And when they were matched with them, they found that a 70-year-old Mabian had as good hearing as a 20-year-old Wisconsinite. And by the time a Wisconsinite got to be 30 or 35, his hearing was so bad already that there wasn't a Mabian old enough to be able to have hearing that bad. In Wisconsin, for, exa for example, when you get to be 40, 50, years, 60 years old, your hearing is so bad that you require a sound 100,000 times louder than you would for a Mabian to hear the same frequency. Hearing drops very fast on the American kind of diet. And it's not only our country. Any large city that has the high-fat diet is the same. Studies have been done around the world in the large cities, and they find that almost all the large cities have the same kind of pattern of hearing loss. Now, in Finland, they did a study versus the population of Yugoslavia. Finland was picked out because East Finland has the highest cardiovascular death rate in the world, so we know that their vessels close pretty fast. And in East Finland, where the study was done, the average level of a, an adult is somewhere around 290 cholesterol, awfully high. Now, in Yugoslavia, the average adult level is about 180. And when studies were done of young people in these two countries, 10 to 19 years old, already you can see that in Finland, the young people are starting to lose their hearing in the 16 and 18,000 cycles per second frequency. But by the time they got to be 20 years old, those in Finland 
had an enormous loss of high frequency hearing. That is around the 18,000, 16,000, and they're already starting to lose 14,000 cycles per second. Whereas those in Yugoslavia were hardly losing any hearing at all. So even in young people, we can see it starting from the time they're 10 years old. Now they did a study uh, in the in, uh, area of uh, Finland and Scandinavian countries in mental hospitals. They took two mental hospitals that had exactly the same kind of hearing response in the 40 to 50 year old age group. And they took one hospital and they put them on a diet where they only had half as much cholesterol and about 15 to 20 percent less fat. And it only took three years for the difference in hearing to show up. The hospital on less fat and cholesterol had improved 10 years in hearing, or you might say that the hospital with a normal diet had gotten 10 years worse. In, in any case, they were 10 years apart. The hospital with the normal amount of cholesterol and fat had hearing that you would expect of someone 10 years older compared to the group in the lower fat and cholesterol hospital. Yet their hearing was identical when they started. So we know in actual tests that if you lower your fat and cholesterol, you can keep your hearing from deteriorating. It's very important to get blood flow to the hearing organ. And the principal reason why your hearing starts to go is because you diminish your blood flow. The little artery that feeds the hearing organ starts to get narrower and narrower and diminishes blood flow. To show you how sensitive the hearing is, we can test it in smokers. In a large study in the Topeka VA Hospital, Topeka, Kansas, where they classed 120 smokers against 129 uh, non-smokers, in every case the smokers had worse hearing at the same age group, both total hearing loss plus in the high frequency ranges. In fact, I can almost tell you that if you're a smoker, and you stop smoking in two weeks' time, you'll be able to hear high-frequency tones 2,000 cycles a second better than you can hear today at the same uh, decibel range. In fact, in a test to show that the loss of hearing is principally due to blood flow or oxygen factor, uh, about 14 people, of which half of them were completely deaf, were put in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. Now that's a chamber where they force oxygen in such pressure, it goes right into your tissues, even though you don't have the blood flow for it. And it's amazing that half of these people that were deaf had their hearing restored for the short time while they had the oxygen in their tissues. It's amazing what oxygen can do even though you haven't heard for a long time. Now if you'd like to have oxygen at the highest level possible, then you have to go on the diet that I recommend because it certainly gives you the highest oxygen carrying capacity for your red blood cells and you got to be careful that you don't get near smokers because if you're near a smoker you can breathe in 50 percent of the carbon dioxide that they breathe in your best bet for having your hearing maintain in good shape for the rest of your life is to stay on a low fat low cholesterol diet and stay away from smokers sight is one of our most precious senses you can ask anyone who's blind and they'll tell you about that. But would you believe that 50% of all blindness comes from circulatory problems? Uh, and the problems come from plaques breaking off. These uh, cholesterol boils in your arteries, they break off and they block off certain segments of the circulation of the eye. In fact, if you're an ophthalmologist, uh, an eye physician, and you look into the eye, you can actually see the little cholesterol crystals breaking off and shining like a diamond right in the circulation in the eye. When that happens, you know that the person, if they don't change their way of life, is in for real trouble. In fact, on a study just ex on determining life expectancy on people with these little crystals flashing in their eye versus those who didn't have any, in a 10-year period, those who did not have any crystals flash in their eyes, 70% were still alive. This was in a 50-year-old age group. But those with crystals flash in their eye, instead of 70% still alive, only 30% were alive. It's bad news when you have these little cholesterol crystals breaking off because that's what causes strokes. Now, if the little crystals break off and they block off just a portion of the eye circulation, you lose the sight in the area where it's blocked off. And that gives you partial blindness. And we picked that up in what we call a visual field test. Uh, now, if you have a large enough plaque break off or a cholesterol group of crystals, 
to block the whole little vessel, the central retinal artery, bringing blood into the eye, now you have total blindness, and there's no pain at all. Suddenly you see, and suddenly you don't see. That's when a plaque breaks off and completely blocks the blood flow. And that's a tragedy. Many people suddenly have sudden blindness, and it's because a cholesterol particle broke off and blocked circulation. Now the first signs of this you can pick up by looking at your friends, and you'll notice right around the iris of the eye is a little semicircle. It's a grayish whitish circle. And we call that arcus senilis. That means arc of age. But now we're seeing it in 20-year-olds, so we know it doesn't have anything to do with aging. You may not see it as a complete circle. You'll see it as a part of a circle, a little grayish whitish circle that seems to follow the iris. Sometimes you have to lift the lid to see it. It's only on top. Sometimes it's at the bottom, sometimes in the side. Now this grayish whitish circle is an invasion of fat and cholesterol. When the body has so much fat and cholesterol in it, there's hardly any room left for it, it invades into the cornea of the eye. The cornea is a part of your eye you can put your finger on and touch. It's a clear area that protects your eye. It invades in there and it looks like it's right over your iris. Now animal studies have indicated to us that when you have that in your eye, that grayish whitish little circle is filled with cholesterol. In fact, when you have that in your eye, you've got as probably 40 times more cholesterol around your cornea and around your iris than you would have if you did not have it. One out of 40, and when you're 40 years old, that is one out of three, over 40 years old, have arcus senilis in their eyes. After I'm through with the lecture, you can look in your eyes and see if you have it too. If you're over 40, you've got a one out of three chance to get it. In animal studies, when we develop arcus in animals by feeding them high cholesterol diets, the tragedy is that not only do they have a lot of cholesterol in their eyes, but they have it in their arteries. Argus in the eye means high cholesterol in your arteries. In one study on rabbits, when they had high arcus in their eyes, they also had 10 times more cholesterol than the normal rabbits had in their big aorta artery. And they also developed a lot of plaques. So an arcus is something you wouldn't want to have, and hopefully you can stop the progression if you do have it, and it hopefully can be reversed if you stop eating cholesterol. Now in studies where people have had arcus, uh, in Scotland, for example, they did a study and found that those who developed arcus earlier had heart attacks as much as 10 years earlier. In fact, those with heart attacks in their 20s and 30s and 40s had many more arcuses than those who did not have heart attacks. So arcus, obviously, the high cholesterol in the eye means high cholesterol in your arteries, which can give you a heart attack sooner. The tragedy, of course, with high cholesterol is not only for sudden blindness, but is also for inability to be able to see clearly. And one of the problems with partial destruction of sight is what we call glaucoma. Glaucoma is a term that indicates increased pressure in the eyeball. We call that intraocular pressure. Normally the pressure in your eyeball is no higher than about 22 or 24 millimeters. That's the same way we express blood pressure in your, in your whole blood system. If you have a blood pressure, say, of 120, that describes the same kind of pressure as in your eyeball of 22 or 24. Now that's as high as we like to see it. We normally like to see pressures in your eyeball less than 20. Now the pressure in your eyeball sort of keeps your eye in shape because the eye is like a hollow ball and the only thing that supports it is the whole inside part is made of sort of a uh, jelly. It's called the vitreous body. And the vitreous body is, fills up all the space inside the eye, and that's what maintains its shape. Now, the lens sort of presses against that vitreous body, that bowl of jelly, and that's where the pressure comes from. And the reason the lens is pressing against it is because there is fluid between the lens and the cornea. That's the part you can touch with your finger. Between the part you can touch with your finger, the cornea, and the lens that you can see, there's just fluid between, like a little river. And it's in that little river where the whole problem of glaucoma starts. Now the vitreous body, the big bowl of jello that fills up your whole eyeball, is pressing very gently against your retina. Because if we take your eye and look at it, it's almost like a tire. It's made of three layers. 
It's like a how if you think of a hollow ball, the inside of that ball is the retina. That's the part you see with. And the middle part <coughs> of this three-layered uh, part that forms your eye is called the choroid. That's a part that has tiny little blood vessels that feed the retina. And then the last layer is the outside covering of the eye called the sclera. That means the hard part, the part that protects all the rest. So if you can picture this hollow ball made of these three layers with the retina on the inside, and then filling up the hollow ball is this bowl of jelly, the vitreous body that keeps the whole ball from collapsing, keeps its shape. And then the lens right in front is pressing against the whole thing, sort of pressing a little bit of pressure that sort of keeps it inflated, like you keep a balloon blown up. Now the problem is if you press too hard, you'll flatten all these little blood vessels that feed the retina. And if you flatten those blood vessels, it shuts off the blood flow and you're instantly blind, you can't see. So too much pressure is not good <coughs> because those little <coughs> blood vessels in the vessels feeding the retina have a, a pressure of not a great deal more than the pressure of the bowl of jelly against the blood vessels. These, those blood vessels have to have a little bit more pressure than the jelly pushing against them, or else the jelly pushing against them could flatten them out and close them. So the blood pressure in the eye is sort of critical. What affects the blood pressure in the eye? The pressure of this lens against the whole bowl of jelly. Well, the lens has no blood vessels of its own. And so in order for it to get oxygen and to be cleaned out of all the waste products and everything and to get its minerals and vitamins, it has to have a separate way to handle it. And the way that happens is that that middle layer, that choroid I told you about, leaks some nice clear fluid from the blood that's filled with oxygen, filled with glucose and all the vitamins and so on the body the lens needs. And it sort of gently flows into the lens just like a river overflows the land. And it flows into the lens, and at the same time it flows giving all this nourishing material, it washes out all the waste products from the lens. The lens is almost like an onion, it's in layers. And all these layers have to be cleaned out all the time and given new food and new oxygen. Well, that works fine. Now the waste products, this little river of waste products that come out, flow into the place between the lens and the cornea. Remember, the cornea is a part you can put your finger on, that clear layer of your eye you can touch. There's a little river that goes on between the cornea and the <coughs> lens, and the river gradually flows out to a drain pipe called the Canal of Schlem. Now everything is okay, and in every canal, every little drain pipe has its little filter. Remember in your sink, in your kitchen sink, you have a filter so the drain pipe doesn't get clogged? Well, that little drain pipe, uh, the filter is called the trabecular mesh. Now, if the filter gets clogged, we can stop the flow going out. And if the flow doesn't go out for some reason through this little canal, the little drain pipe, the pressure builds up in the eye because the fluid keeps coming in feeding the eye whether the fluid goes out or not. And if something keeps the fluid from going out, and the pressure builds up, pushes against the lens, and you now have increased pressure in the eyeball, and it presses so hard it can flatten all your little blood vessels feeding the retina, and you can go blind, or you can go partially blind. Now what creates these problems? Well, first of all, cortisone makes your tissue swell, and this little filter I told you about, it looks like a little meshwork, it looks like a screen on your window, a tiny little holes <coughs> and not to let any large particles through. Two young ladies were wearing contact lenses and they abused their eyes a little bit and irritated their eyes, so they went to their eye doctor and they said, well, I better give you some cortisone drops to rele relieve the inflammation. Gave them the cortisone drops and the cortisone went right through the cornea, right into that little filter that little trabecular mesh that keeps the large particles from getting down the drain pipe. And the little mesh work swelled because cortisone makes tissue swell, it makes them hold water. And when the little filter swelled, all the little holes became so tiny because the tissue swelled and made the holes get smaller that almost no fluid can go through. These two 18-year-old girls developed in glaucoma. Too much pressure in the eyeball because their drain pipe now was narrowed down from the filter being swelled. Now how does it happen in people that don't take cortisone? How does it happen that pressures rise and create the glaucoma condition? 
Well, one way I think it happens is that the body itself can make more cortisone than it should because the body and the adrenal gland makes cortisone. And the reason the body makes more cortisone than it should is if you have too many fats in the diet because too many fats cause a sort of chain reaction that forces the body to make too much cortisone. And if you do that, you can make your little filter, your trabecular mesh, swell and close its little holes so the drain pipe can't get enough fluid flowing out and that'll raise the pressure in your eyeball. And when that happens, you're gonna have to take drops. You know those drops people take when they have glaucoma? They're called meiotics. And what the drops do is force the little drain pipe to let more fluid go through, to lower the pressure. Now, sometimes drops don't work, so what then do doctors do? Well, they go into that drain pipe, and they go into that little trabecular mesh, the filter, and they slice big slices in it. So if the little holes aren't big enough, they put big slices, so now fluid can go through. What if that doesn't work? Well, then they go into the drain pipe where they chisel, and they chisel a big hole, and they stretch the opening to get more stuff to go through. What if that doesn't work? Well, then they have the last thing that does work, of course. They go in your cornea. That's the part you can touch, and they drill a hole right into the chamber between the lens and the cornea so the fluid can drip right out, right into your tear ducts. It just looks like you're crying all the time. And now any amount of fluid can get out. Does that work? Well, it works fine as far as dropping the pressure, but what happens to your per eye? Well, when you lose all that fluid, and you lose fluid when you have the eye drops, too. Now, so much of this nourishing fluid leaves the area that there's not enough for your lens. It drains out so fast your lens can't get enough of the waste products cleaned out, and it can't get enough of this nice, fresh oxygen and food in the blood. So your lens suffers terribly. For those who take drops, the sad news is that they have four times as many cataracts as those who don't take drops because the lens suffers by having all this nice fluid drain out faster than it needs to, and so the lens doesn't get all of its waste products cleared away. How about when they do the operation? When they do the operation, it's a tragedy. Instead of four times as many cataracts, you'll have 10, 15 times as many cataracts with the operation because so much fluid is lost there that the per lens just gets clogged up with all its waste products and becomes cloudy and then you can't see. So unfortunately, the only treatments we have increases the amount of cataracts. So you're paying a price. You're paying a price to lower the pressure in your eyeball because you want to stay in your regular American diet and you're paying a price of developing cataracts. There are populations around the world that are on the kind of low fat, low cholesterol diet I recommend I'd like to tell you that glaucoma and cataract are never found. Yet in our country, once you're 60 or 70 years old, 5 to 10% of the whole population has glaucoma, too much pressure in their eyeballs. It's very nice to know that the very same diet that's good for heart disease, breast cancer, colon cancer, arthritis, diabetes, gives you an extra bonus. It's also good for saving your sight. To summarize the information that I've given to you, I like to say that the American diet, which is something we're brought up on and something we're taught to love, our mother said is the best thing for us. The food manufacturers tell us we have to eat it. Just how good is it for us? Well, the American diet is 43% fat, 22% sugar, Two-thirds of our calories are completely wasted in fat and sugar. Very little in the way of foods as grown that have all their complements of vitamins and minerals. The American diet is high in salt, 50 times what the body needs. That floods our tissues with water, creating edema, creating the prerequisites for arthritis, high blood pressure, and their many problems. A tremendous amount of chemicals in prepared foods. Over 3,000 chemicals added to our food. Since 1945, over a 1,000% increase in just food colorings alone. Prepared foods are a disaster. You've got to start getting your foods right as grown. Beans and peas, you can get them dried as grown. Potatoes, get them as is. The whole grains, without being destroyed by the food manufacturers, where they refine and take out the vitamins and minerals and so on. The other thing, of course, you have to be careful of is the high cholesterol in the American diet. 
The body simply cannot handle the flow to fat and cholesterol the American diet offers. It destroys the body's functions by creating the cholesterol boils that we know as heart disease by closing off the fine vessels, the coronary vessels that feed the heart and all the other vessels in the body. And that's why we have senility many times at an early age, 40, 50 years old, already people are losing their uh, their brain capacity, they're having difficulty in concentrating and memory and so on. And then the high protein diet that's pushed in our country. First of all, because animal protein has no dietary fiber, you're doomed to constipation because without dietary fiber you can't have normal movements. Uh, the diet is so low in bulk that Americans have just very tiny, hard stools. Whereas in other countries, constipation is unknown. Constipation, of course, gives you other problems like hemorrhoids, and the kind of diet encourages the colon cancer problem, diverticulosis, the colon diseases, ulcerative colitis, spastic colon, all these things so completely unnecessary. The diet that I recommend to you, the low-fat, uh, high-complex carbohydrate diet, almost 80% in carbohydrates, is the very best thing for you in a way of energy. You get the max amount of endurance. Just remember those Taramara Indians running 150 miles. When you get up to 150 miles and you feel you'd like to have some extra advice, let me know and we'll get you up to 175 miles. But there's no question that the diet not only protects you and prevents you from having heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, arthritis. We're understanding the role of diet to colon, prostate, and breast cancer. We even realize that even lung cancer, which we thought was a smoker's problem, turns out to be greatly influenced by the cholesterol in your diet. We begin to see that there are so many benefits to this kind of program, this dietary program, that if you want to leave fear away of the degenerate diseases, and more than that, if you really want to enjoy food the way nature intended it, you don't have any alternative. You really should get on this kind of diet and stay in this diet for the rest of your life. It frees you of the fears of degenerative diseases. Remember that degenerative diseases, diseases that come as you get older and so-called degenerate, are completely unnecessary. They're never found with primates. They're only found with people that are on the high-fat, high-cholesterol diet. And there's a nice thing about this diet, too. If you're a family of four, you'll save $1,500 a year in your food costs. I think that's the only disadvantage I can think of because it's going to affect the food industries. It'll cut their profits, but it'll increase your health.